Section zero of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Warren Cotty. The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by martin hume preface either by chance or by the peculiar working of our constitution the queen consorts of england have as a rule been nationally important only in proportion to the influence exerted by the political tendencies which prompted their respective marriages england has had no catherine or marie de medici no elizabeth farnese no catherine of russia no caroline of naples no maria luisa of spain who either through the minority of their sons or the weakness of their husbands dominated the countries of their adoption the consorts of english kings having been in the great majority of cases simply domestic helpmates of their husbands and children with comparatively small political power or ambition for themselves only those whose elevation responded to tendencies of a nationally enduring character or who represented temporarily the active forces in a great national struggle can claim to be powerful political factors in the history of our country the six consorts of henry the eighth whose successive rise and fall synchronized with the beginning and progress of the reformation in england are perhaps those whose fleeting prominence was most pregnant of good or evil for the nation and for civilization at large because they personified causes infinitely more important than themselves the careers of these unhappy women have almost invariably been considered nevertheless from a purely personal point of view it is true that many historians of the reformation have dwelt upon the rivalry between catherine of aragon and anne boleyn and their strenuous efforts to gain their respective ends but even in their case their action has usually been regarded as individual in impulse instead of being as i believe it was prompted or thwarted by political forces and considerations of which the queens themselves were only partially conscious the lives of henry's consorts have been related as if each of the six was an isolated phenomenon that had by chance attracted the desire of a lascivious despot and in her turn had been deposed when his eye had fallen equally fortuitously upon another woman who pleased his errant fancy better this view i believe to be a superficial and misleading one i regard henry himself not as the far-seeing statesman he is so often depicted for us sternly resolved from the first to free his country from the yoke of rome and pressing forward through a lifetime with his eyes firmly fixed upon the goal of england's religious freedom but rather as a weak vain boastful man the plaything of his passions which were artfully made use of by rival parties to forward religious and political ends in the struggle of giants that ended in the reformation no influence that could be exercised over the king was neglected by those who sought to lead him and least of all that which appealed to his uxoriousness and i hope to show in the text of this book how each of his wives in turn was but an instrument of politicians intended to sway the king on one side or the other regarded from this point of view the lives of these six unhappy queens assume an importance in national history which cannot be accorded to them 
if they are considered in the usual light as the victims of a strong lustful tyrant each one standing apart and in her turn simply the darling solace of his hours of dalliance doubtless the latter point of view provides to the historian a wider scope for the description of picturesque ceremonial and gorgeous millinery as well as for pathetic passages dealing with the personal sufferings of the queens in their distress but i can only hope that the absence of much of this sentimental and feminine interest from my pages will be compensated by the wider aspect in which the public and political significance of henry's wives is presented that a clearer understanding than usual may thus be gained of the tortuous process by which the reformation in england was effected and that the figure of the king in the picture may stand in a juster proportion to his environment than is often the case martin hume london october 1905 end of section 0 preface section 1 of the wives of henry the 8th and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 1488 to 1501 introductory why catherine came to england political matrimony part one the history of modern europe takes its start from an event which must have appeared insignificant to a generation that had witnessed the violent end of the english dominion in france had been dinned by the clash of the wars of the roses and watched with breathless fear the savage hosts of islam striking at the heart of christendom over the still smoking ruins of the byzantine empire late one night in the beginning of october fourteen sixty nine a cavalcade of men in the guise of traders halted beneath the walls of the ancient city of burgo di osma in old castile they had travelled for many days by little used paths through the mountains of soria from the aragonese frontier town of terezona and impatient to gain the safe shelter of the fortress of osma they banged at the gates demanding admittance the country was in anarchy leagues of churchmen and nobles warred against each other and preyed upon society at large an impotent king deposed with ignominy by one faction had been as ignominiously set up again by another and royal pretenders to the succession were the puppets of rival parties whose object was to monopolize for themselves all the fruits of royalty whilst the monarch fed upon the husks so when the newcomers called peremptorily for admittance within the gates of osma the guards upon the city walls taking them for enemies or freebooters greeted them with a shower of missiles from the catapults one murderous stone whizzed within a few inches of the head of a tall fair-haired lad of good mien and handsome visage who dressed as a servant accompanied the cavalcade if the projectile had effectively hit instead of missed the stripling the whole history of the world from that hour to this would have been changed for this youth was prince ferdinand the heir of aragon who was being conveyed secretly by a faction of castilian nobles to marry the princess isabel who had been set forward as a pretender to her brother's throne to the exclusion of the king's doubtful daughter the hapless beltranea a hurried cry of explanation went up from the travellers a shouted password 
the flashing of torches upon the walls the joyful recognition of those within and the gates swung open the drawbridge dropped and thenceforward prince ferdinand was safe surrounded by the men-at-arms of isabel's faction within a week the eighteen years old bridegroom greeted his bride and before the end of the month ferdinand and isabel were married at valladolid to most observers it may have seemed a small thing that a petty prince in the extreme corner of europe had married the girl pretender to the distracted and divided realm of castile but there was one cunning wicked old man in barcelona who was fully conscious of the importance of the match that he had planned and he john the second of aragon had found an apt pupil in his son ferdinand crafty beyond his years to some extent isabel must have seen it too for she was already a dreamer of great dreams which she meant to come true and the strength of aragon behind her claim would ensure her the sovereignty that was to be the first step in their realization this is not the place to tell how the nobles of castile found to their dismay that in ferdinand and isabel they had raised a king stork instead of a king log to the throne and how the queen strong as a man subtle as a woman crushed and chicaned her realms into order and obedience the aims of ferdinand and his father in effecting the union of aragon and castile by marriage went far beyond the peninsula in which they lived for ages aragon had found its ambitions checked by the consolidation of france the vision of a great romance empire stretching from valencia to genoa and governed from barcelona or saragossa had been dissipated when st louis wrung from james the conqueror in the thirteenth century his recognition of french suzerainty over provence but aragonese eyes still looked towards the east and saw a frenchman ever in their way the christian outpost in the mediterranean sicily already belonged to aragon so did the balearic isles but an aragonese dynasty held naples only in alternation and constant rivalry with the french house of anjou and as the strength of the french monarchy grew it stretched forth its hands nearer and ever nearer to the weak and divided principalities of italy with covetous intent unless aragon could check the french expansion across the alps its own power in the mediterranean would be dwarfed its vast hopes must be abandoned and it must settle down to the inglorious life of a petty state hemmed in on all sides by more powerful neighbors but although too weak to vanquish france alone a king of aragon who could dispose of the resources of greater castile might hope in spite of french opposition to dominate a united italy and thence look towards the illimitable east this was the aspiration that ferdinand inherited and to which the efforts of his long and strenuous life were all directed the conquest of granada the unification of spain the greed the cruelty the lying the treachery the political marriages of all his children and the fires of the inquisition were all means to the end for which he fought but fate was unkind to him the discovery of america diverted castilian energy from aragonese objects and death stepped in and made grim sport of all his marriage jugglery before he died 
beaten and broken-hearted he knew that the little realm of his fathers instead of using the strength of others for its aims would itself be used for objects which concerned it not but though he failed his plan was a masterly one treaties he knew were rarely binding for the age was faithless and he himself never kept an oath an hour longer than suited him but mutual interests by kinship might hold sovereigns together against a common opponent so one after the other from their earliest youth the children of ferdinand and isabel were made political counters in their father's great marriage league the eldest daughter isabel was married to the heir of portugal and every haven into which french galleys might shelter in their passage from the mediterranean to the bay of biscay was at ferdinand's bidding the only son john was married to the daughter of maximilian king of the romans and from fourteen ninety three emperor whose interest also it was to check the french advance towards north italy and his own dominions the second daughter juana was married to the emperor's son philip sovereign in right of his mother of the rich inheritance of burgundy flanders holland and the franche comte and heir to austria and the empire who from flanders might be trusted to watch the french on their northern and eastern borders and the youngest of ferdinand's daughters catherine was destined almost from her birth to secure the alliance of england the rival of france in the channel and the opponent of its aggrandizement towards the north ferdinand of aragon and henry tudor henry the seventh were well matched both were clever unscrupulous and greedy each knew that the other would cheat him if he could and tried to get the better of every deal utterly regardless not only of truth and honesty but of common decency but though ferdinand usually beat henry at his shuffling game fate finally beat ferdinand and a powerful modern england is the clearly traceable consequence how the great result was brought about is one of the principal objects of this book to tell that ferdinand had everything to gain by thus surrounding france by possible rivals in his own interests is obvious for if his plans had not miscarried he could have diverted france whenever it suited him and his way towards the east would have been clear but at first sight the interests of henry the seventh in placing himself into a position of antagonism towards france for the benefit of the king of spain is not so evident the explanation must be found in the fact that he held the throne of england by very uncertain tenure and sought to disarm those who would be most able and likely to injure him the royal house of castile had been closely allied to the plantagenets and both edward the fourth and his brother richard had been suitors for the hand of isabel the dowager duchess of burgundy moreover was margaret plantagenet their sister who sheltered and cherished in flanders the english adherents of her house and henry tudor half a frenchman by birth and sympathies was looked at askance by the powerful group of spain the empire and burgundy when first he usurped the english throne he knew that he had little or nothing to fear from france and one of his earliest acts was in fourteen eighty seven to bid for the friendship of ferdinand by means of an offer of alliance and the marriage of his son arthur prince of wales then a year old 
with the infanta catherine who was a few months older ferdinand at the time was trying to bring about a match between his eldest daughter isabel and the young king of france charles the eighth and was not very eager for a new english alliance which might alarm the french before the end of the year however it was evident that there was no chance of the spanish infanta's marriage with charles the eighth coming to anything and ferdinand's plan for a great coalition against france was finally adopted in the first days of fourteen eighty eight ferdinand's two ambassadors arrived in london to negotiate the english match and the long duel of diplomacy between the kings of england and spain began of one of the envoys it behooves us to say something because of the influence his personal character exercised upon subsequent events rodrigo de puebla was one of the most extraordinary diplomatists that can be imagined and could only have been possible under such monarchs as henry and ferdinand willing as both of them were to employ the basest instruments in their underhand policy puebla was a doctor of laws and a provincial mayor when he attracted the attention of ferdinand and his first diplomatic mission of importance was that to england he was a poor vain greedy man utterly corrupt and henry the seventh was able to dominate him from the first in the course of time he became more of an intimate english minister than a foreign ambassador though he represented at henry's court not only castile and aragon but also the pope and the empire he constantly sat in the english council and was almost the only man admitted to henry's personal confidence that such an instrument would be trusted entirely by the wary ferdinand was not to be expected and though puebla remained in england as ambassador to the end of his life he was to his bitter jealousy always associated with others when important negotiations had to be conducted isabel wrote to him often sometimes threatening him with punishment if he failed in carrying out his instructions satisfactorily sometimes flattering him and promising him rewards which he never got he was recognized by ferdinand as an invaluable means of gaining knowledge of henry's real intentions and by henry as a tool for betraying ferdinand it is hardly necessary to say that he alternately sold both and was never fully paid by either henry offered him an english bishopric which his own sovereigns would not allow him to accept and a wealthy wife in england was denied him for a similar reason for ferdinand on principle kept his agents poor on a wretched pittance allowed him by henry puebla lived thus in london until he died almost simultaneously with his royal friend when not sponging at the tables of the king or english nobles he lived in a house of ill fame in london paying only two pence a day for his board and cheating the other inmates in the interests of the proprietor for the balance he was in short a braggart a liar a flatterer and a spy who served two rogues roguishly and was fittingly rewarded by the scorn of honest men this was the ambassador who with a colleague called juan de sepulveda was occupied through the spring of fourteen eighty eight in negotiating the marriage of the two babies arthur prince of wales and the infanta catherine they found henry as puebla says singing te deum laudamus about the alliance and marriage but when the parties came to close quarters matters went less smoothly what henry had to gain by the alliance 
was the disarming of possible enemies of his own unstable throne whilst ferdinand needed england's active or passive support in a war against france for the purpose of extorting the restoration to aragon of the territory of russia and Cerdanya, and of preventing the threatened absorption of the duchy of brittany into the french monarchy the contest was keen and crafty first the english commissioners demanded with the infanta a dowry so large as quite to shock puebla it being as he said five times as much as had been mentioned by english agents in spain puebla and supalveda offered a quarter of the sum demanded and hinted with pretended jocosity that it was a great condescension on the part of the sovereigns of spain to allow their daughter to marry at all into such a parvenu family as the tudors after infinite haggling both as to the amount and the form of the dowry it was agreed by the ambassadors that two hundred thousand gold crowns of four s two d each should be paid in cash with the bride on her marriage but the marriage was the least part of ferdinand's object if indeed he then intended which is doubtful that it should take place at all what he wanted was the assurance of henry's help against france and of all things peace was the first need for the english king when the demand was made therefore that england should go to war with france whenever ferdinand chose to do so and should not make peace without its ally baited though the demand was with the hollow suggestion of recovering for england the territories of normandy and guienna henry's duplicity was brought into play he dared not consent to such terms but he wanted the benevolent regards of ferdinand's coalition so his ministers flattered the spanish king and vaguely promised quote, mounts and marvels unquote, in the way of warlike aid as soon as the marriage treaty was signed and sealed even puebla wanted something more definite than this and the english commissioners the bishop of exeter and giles daubeny quote, took a missile in their hands and swore in the most solemn way before the crucifix that it is the will of the king of england first to conclude the alliance and the marriage and afterwards to make war upon the king of france according to the bidding of the catholic kings unquote. nor was this all for when puebla and his colleagues later in the day saw the king himself henry smiled at and flattered the envoys and flourishing his bonnet and bowing low each time the names of ferdinand and isabel passed his lips confirmed the oath of his ministers quote, which he said we must accept for plain truth unmingled with double dealing or falsehood unquote. ferdinand's ambassadors were fairly dazzled they were taken to see the infant bridegroom and puebla grew quite poetical in describing his bodily perfections both dressed and in puribus naturalibus and the beauty and magnificence of the child's mother were equally extolled the object of all henry's amiability and indeed of puebla's dithyrambics also was to cajole ferdinand into sending his baby daughter catherine into england at once on the marriage treaty alone with such a hostage in his hands henry knew that he might safely break his oath about going to war with france to please the spanish king but ferdinand was not a man easy to cajole and when hapless simple supelvida reached spain with the draft treaty he found himself in the presence of two very angry sovereigns indeed two hundred thousand crowns dowry indeed one hundred was the most they would give 
and that must be in spanish gold or the king of england would be sure to cheat them over the exchange and they must have three years in which to pay the amount for which moreover no security should be given but their own signatures the cost of the bride's trousseau and jewels also must be deducted from the amount of the dowry on the other hand the infanta's dowry and income from england must be fully guaranteed by land rents and above all the king of england must bind himself at the same time secretly if he likes but by formal treaty to go to war with france to recover for ferdinand russia and Cerdanya. though henry would not go quite so far as this he conceded much for the sake of the alliances so necessary to him the dowry from spain was kept at two hundred thousand crowns and england was pledged to war with france whenever ferdinand should find himself in the same position with much discussion and sharp practice on both sides the treaties in this sense were signed in march fourteen eighty nine and the four years old infanta catherine became princess of wales it is quite clear throughout this early negotiation that the marriage should give to the powerful coalition of which ferdinand was the head a family interest in the maintenance of the tudor dynasty was henry's object to be gained on terms as easy as practicable to himself whereas with ferdinand the marriage was but the bait to secure the armed cooperation of england against france and probably at the time neither of the kings had any intention of fulfilling that part of the bargain which did not specially interest him as will be seen however the force of circumstances and the keenness of the contracting parties led eventually to a better fulfillment of the treaty than was probably intended end of section one section two of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fourteen eighty eight to fifteen o one introductory why catherine came to england political matrimony part two for the next two years the political intrigues of europe centered around the marriage of the young duchess of brittany though russia and Cerdanya mattered nothing to henry the seventh the disposal of the rich duchy opposite his shores was of importance to him france spain england and the empire were all trying to outbid one another for the marriage of the duchess and as charles the eighth of france was the most dangerous suitor henry was induced to send his troops across the channel to brittany to join those of spain and the empire though neither of the latter troops came from the first all the allies were false to each other and hastened to make separate terms with france ferdinand and maximilian endeavoring above all to leave henry at war when at the end of fourteen ninety one charles the eighth carried off the matrimonial prize of the duchess of brittany and peace ensued none of the allies had gained anything by their tergiversation reasons were soon found by ferdinand for regarding the marriage treaty between arthur and catherine as in abeyance and once more pressure was put upon henry to buy its fulfilment by another warlike coalition the king of england stood out for a time especially against an alliance with the king of the romans who had acted so badly about brittany but at length the english contingent was led against boulogne by the king himself as part of the allied action agreed upon this time however it was henry who 
to prevent the betrayal he foresaw scored off his allies and without striking a blow he suddenly made a separate peace with france november fourteen ninety two but yet he was the only party who had not gained what he had bid for russia and Cerdagna were restored to ferdinand in consequence of henry's threat against boulogne france had been kept in check during the time that all the resources of spain were strained in the supreme effort to capture the last moorish foothold in the peninsula the peerless granada the king of france had married the duchess of brittany and had thus consolidated and strengthened his realm whilst henry to his chagrin found that not only had he not regained normandy and guienna but that in the new treaty of peace between spain and france quote, ferdinand and isabel engaged their loyal word and faith as christians not to conclude or permit any marriage of their children with any member of the royal family of england and they bind themselves to assist the king of france against all his enemies and particularly against the english End quote. this was henry's first experience of ferdinand's diplomacy and he found himself outwitted at every point catherine all unconscious as she conned her childish lessons at granada ceased for a time to be called princess of wales with the astute king of england thus cozened by ferdinand it is not wonderful that the vain and foolish young king of france should also have found himself no match for his new spanish ally trusting upon his alliance charles the eighth determined to strike for the possession of the kingdom of naples which he claimed as representing the house of anjou naples at the time was ruled by a close kinsman of ferdinand and it is not conceivable that the latter ever intended to allow the french to expel him for the purpose of ruling there themselves but he smiled not unkindly at first upon charles's italian adventure for he knew the french king was rash and incompetent and that the march of a french army through italy would arouse the hatred and fear of the italian princes and make them easy tools in his hands the king of naples moreover was extremely unpopular and of illegitimate descent and ferdinand doubtless saw that if the french seized naples he could not only effect a powerful coalition to expel them but in the scramble might keep naples for himself and this is exactly what happened the first cry against the french was raised by the pope alexander the sixth a spanish borgia by the time charles the eighth of france was crowned king of naples may fourteen ninety five all italy was ablaze against the intruders and ferdinand formed the holy league of rome spain austria venice and milan to crush his enemies then as usual he found it desirable to secure the benevolence of henry the seventh of england again henry was delighted for perkin warbeck had been received by maximilian and his flemish kinsmen as the rightful king of england and the yorkist nobles still found aid and sympathy in the dominions of burgundy but henry had already been tricked once by the allies and was far more difficult to deal with than before he found himself indeed for the first time in the position which under his successors enabled england to rise to the world power she attained namely that of the balancing factor between france and spain 
this was the first result of ferdinand's coalition against france for the purpose of forwarding aragonese aims and it remained the central point of european politics for the next hundred years henry was not the man to overlook his new advantage with both of the great european powers bidding for his alliance and this time he drove a hard bargain with ferdinand there was still much haggling about the spanish dowry for catherine but henry stood firm at the two hundred thousand gold crowns though a quarter of the amount was to take the form of jewels belonging the bride one stipulation was that the new marriage was to be kept a profound secret in order that the king of scots might not be alarmed for ferdinand was trying to draw even him away from france by hints of marriage with an infanta by the new treaty which was signed in october fourteen ninety seven the formal marriage of arthur and catherine per verba di presenti was to be celebrated when arthur had completed his fourteenth year and the bride's dowry in england was to consist of a third of the revenues of wales cornwall and chester with an increase of the income when she became queen but it was not all plain sailing yet ferdinand considered that henry had tricked him about the amount and form of the dowry but the fear that the king of france might induce the english to enter into a new alliance with him kept ferdinand ostensibly friendly in the summer of fourteen ninety eight two special spanish ambassadors arrived in london and saw the king for the purpose of confirming him in the alliance with their sovereigns and if we are to believe puebla's account of the interview both henry and his queen carried their expressions of veneration for ferdinand and isabel almost to a blasphemous extent henry indeed is said to have had a quarrel with his wife because she would not give him one of the letters from the spanish sovereigns always to carry about with him elizabeth saying that she wished to send her letter to the prince of wales but for all henry's blandishments and friendliness his constant requests that catherine should be sent to england met with never-failing excuses and procrastination it is evident indeed throughout that although the infanta was used as the attraction that was to keep henry and england in the spanish instead of the french interest there was much reluctance on the part of her parents and particularly of queen isabel to trust her child to whom she was much attached to the keeping of a stranger whose only object in desiring her presence was she knew a political one some anxiety was shown by henry and his wife on the other hand that the young princess should be trained in a way that would fit her for the future position in england the princess margaret of austria daughter of maximilian who had just married ferdinand's heir prince john was in spain and puebla reports that the king and queen of england were anxious that catherine should take the opportunity of speaking french with her in order to learn the language Quote, this is necessary because the english ladies do not understand latin and much less spanish the king and queen also wish that the princess should accustom herself to drink wine the water of england is not drinkable and even if it were the climate would not allow the drinking of it End quote. the necessary papal bulls for the marriage of the prince and princess arrived in fourteen ninety eight and henry pressed continually for the coming of the bride but ferdinand and isabel were in no hurry Quote, the manner in which the marriage is to be performed and the princess sent to england must all be settled first End quote. you must negotiate these points they wrote to puebla but make no haste 
spanish envoys of better character and greater impartiality than puebla urged that catherine should be sent quote, before she had become too much attached to spanish life and institutions end quote. though the writer of this admits the grave inconvenience of subjecting so young a girl to the disadvantages of life in henry's court young arthur himself even was prompted to use his influence to persuade his new wife to join him writing to his quote, most entirely beloved spouse end quote, from ludlow in october fourteen ninety nine dwelling upon his earnest desire to see her as the delay in her coming is very grievous to him and he begs it may be hastened the final disappearance of perkin warbeck in fourteen ninety nine greatly changed the position of henry and made him a more desirable connection and the death without issue of ferdinand's only son and heir about the same time also made it necessary for the spanish king to draw his alliances closer in view of the nearness to the succession of his second daughter juana who had married maximilian's son the archduke philip sovereign of flanders who as well as his spanish wife were deeply distrusted by both ferdinand and isabel in fifteen hundred therefore the spanish sovereigns became more acquiescent about their daughter's coming to england by don juan manuel their most skilful diplomatist they sent a message to henry in january fifteen hundred saying that they had determined to send catherine in the following spring without waiting until arthur had completed his fourteenth year the sums they were told that had already been spent in preparations for her reception in england were enormous and when in march there was still no sign of the bride's coming henry the seventh began to get restive he and his country he said would suffer great loss if the arrival of the princess were delayed but just then ferdinand found that the treaty was not so favorable for him as he had expected and the whole of the conditions particularly as to the payment of the dowry and the valuation of the bride's jewels had once more to be laboriously discussed another spanish ambassador being sent to request fresh concessions in vain puebla told his master that when once the princess arrived all england would be at his bidding assured him of henry's good faith and his own ability as a diplomatist ferdinand always found some fresh subject to be wrangled over the style to be given to the king of england the number of servants to come in the train of catherine henry desiring that they should be few and ferdinand many and one of the demands of the english king was quote, that the ladies who came from spain with the princess should all be beautiful or at least none of them should be ugly End quote. in the summer of fifteen hundred there was a sudden panic in ferdinand's court that henry had broken off the match he had gone to calais to meet for the first time the young archduke philip ferdinand's son-in-law and it was rumored that the distrusted fleming had persuaded henry to marry the prince of wales to his sister the archduchess margaret the recently widowed daughter-in-law of ferdinand it was not true though it made ferdinand very cordial for a time and soon the relations between england and spain resumed their usual course of smooth-tongued distrust and tergiversation still another ambassador was sent to england and reported that people were saying they believed the princess would never come though great preparations for her reception continued to be made and the english nobles were already arranging jousts and tournaments for her entertainment 
ferdinand on the other hand continued to send reassuring messages he was he said probably with truth now more desirous than ever that the marriage should take place when the bridegroom had completed his fourteenth year but it was necessary that the marriage should be performed again by proxy in spain before the bride embarked then there was a delay in obtaining the ships necessary for the passage and the spanish sovereigns changed their minds again and preferred that the second marriage after arthur had attained his fifteenth year should be performed in england the stormy weather of august was then an excuse for another delay on the voyage and a fresh quibble was raised about the value of the princess's jewels being considered as part of the first installment of the dowry in december fifteen hundred the marriage was once more performed at ludlow arthur being again present and pledging himself as before to puebla whilst delaying the voyage of catherine as much as possible now probably in consequence of her youth her parents took the greatest of care to convince henry of the indissoluble character of the marriage as it stood knowing the king of england's weakness isabel wrote in march fifteen o one deprecating the great expense he was incurring in the preparations she did not wish she said for her daughter to cause a loss to england either in money or any other way but to be a source of happiness to every one when all was ready for the embarkation at Coruña in april fifteen o one an excuse for further delay was found in a rebellion of the moors of ronda which prevented ferdinand from escorting his daughter to the port then both isabel and catherine had a fit of ague which delayed the departure for another week or two but at last the parting could be postponed no longer and for the last time on earth isabel the catholic embraced her favorite daughter catherine in the fairy palace of the alhambra which forever will be linked with the memories of her heroism the queen was still weak with fever and could not accompany her daughter on the way but she stood stately in her sternly suppressed grief sustained by the exalted religious mysticism which in her descendants degenerated to neurotic mania grief unutterable had stricken the queen her only son was dead and her eldest daughter and her infant heir had also gone to untimely graves the hopes founded upon the marriages of their children had all turned to ashes and the king and queen saw with gloomy foreboding that their daughter juana and her foreign husband would rule in spain as well as in flanders and the empire to spain's irreparable disaster and worst of all juana had dared to dally with the hated thing heresy in the contest of divided interest which they foresaw it was of the utmost importance now to the catholic kings that england at least should be firmly attached to them and they dared no longer delay the sacrifice of catherine to the political needs of their country catherine young as she was understood that she was being sent to a far country amongst strangers as much an ambassador as a bride but she from her birth had been brought up in the atmosphere of ecstatic devotion that surrounded her heroic mother and the din of battle against the enemies of the christian god had rarely been silent in her childish ears so with shining eyes and a look of proud martyrdom catherine bade the queen a last farewell turned her back upon lovely granada and through the torrid summer of fifteen o one slowly traversed 
the desolate bridal roads of la mancha and arid castile to the green valleys of galicia where in the harbor of coruna her little fleet lay at anchor awaiting her from the twenty first of may when she last looked upon the alhambra it took her nearly two months of hard travel to reach coruna and it was almost a month more before all was ready for the embarkation with the great train of courtiers and servants that accompanied her on the seventeenth august fifteen o one the flotilla sailed from coruna only to be stricken the next day by a furious northeasterly gale and scattered the princess's ship in dire danger being driven into the little port of laredo in the north of spain there catherine was seriously ill and another long delay occurred the apprehension that some untoward accident had happened to the princess at sea causing great anxiety to the king of england who sent his best seamen to seek tidings of the bride the season was late and when on the twenty sixth september fifteen o one catherine again left laredo for england even her stout heart failed at the prospect before her a dangerous hurricane from the south accompanied her across the channel and drove the ships finally into the safety of plymouth harbor on saturday the second october fifteen o one the princess was but little expected at plymouth as southampton or bristol had been recommended as the best ports for her arrival and great preparations had been made for her reception at both those ports but the plymouth folk were nothing backward in their loyal welcome of the new princess of wales for one of the courtiers who accompanied her wrote to queen isabel that quote, she could not have been received with greater rejoicings if she had been the saviour of the world End quote as she went in solemn procession through the streets to the church of plymouth to give thanks for her safety from the perils past with foreign speech sounding in her ears and surrounded by a curious crowd of fair folk so different from the swarthy subjects of her mother that she had left behind at Granada, the girl of sixteen might well be appalled at the magnitude of the task before her she knew that henceforward she had by diplomacy and woman's wit to keep the might and wealth of england and its king on the side of her father against france to prevent any coalition between her new father-in-law and her brother-in-law philip in flanders in which spain was not included and finally to give an heir to the english throne who in time to come should be aragonese in blood and sympathy thenceforward catherine must belong to england in appearance if her mission was to succeed and though spain was always in her heart as the exotic pomegranate of granada was on her shield england in future was the name she conjured by and all england loved her from the hour she first set foot on english soil to the day of the final consummation of her martyrdom end of section two section three of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 1501 through 1509 catherine's widowhood and why she stayed in england part one the arrival of catherine in england as his son's affianced wife meant very much for henry the seventh and his house he had already by a master stroke of diplomacy 
betrothed his eldest daughter to the king of scots and was thus safe from french intrigue on his vulnerable northern border whilst the new king of france was far too apprehensive of ferdinand's coalition to arouse the act of enmity of england the presence of ferdinand's daughter on english soil completed the security against attack upon henry from abroad it is true that the yorkists and their friends were still plotting quote, solicited allured and provoked by that old venomous serpent the duchess of burgundy ever the sower of sedition and beginner of rebellion against the king of england End quote. but henry knew well that with catherine at his court he could strike a death blow as he soon did at his domestic enemies without fear of reprisals from her brother-in-law philip the present sovereign of burgundy and flanders messengers were sent galloping to london to carry to the king the great news of catherine's arrival at plymouth but the roads were bad and it was not henry's way to spoil his market by a show of over-eagerness and though he sent forward the duchess of norfolk and the earl of surrey to attend upon the princess on her way towards london the royal party did not set out from shen palace to meet her until the fourth november travelling through a drenching rain by short stages from one seat to another henry the seventh and his daughter-in-law gradually approached each other with their splendid troops of followers all muffled up we are told in heavy rain cloaks to shield their finery from the inclemency of an english winter young arthur coming from the seat of his government in wales met his father near chertsey and together they continued their journey towards the west on the third day as they rode over the hampshire downs they saw approaching them a group of horsemen the leader of which dismounted and saluted the king in latin with a message from ferdinand and isabel ladies in spain were kept in strict seclusion until their marriage and the messenger who was the protonotary canazares sent with catherine to england to see that spanish etiquette was not violated prayed in the name of his sovereigns that the infanta should not be seen by the king and especially by the bridegroom until the public marriage was performed this was a part of the bargain that the cautious puebla had not mentioned and henry was puzzled at such a request in his own realm where no such oriental regard for women was known hastily taking counsel of the nobles on horseback about him he decided that as the infanta was in england she must abide by english customs indeed the demand for seclusion seems to have aroused the king's curiosity for putting spurs to his horse with but a small following and leaving the boy bridegroom behind he galloped on to dogmersfield at no great distance away where the infanta was awaiting his arrival when he came to the house in which she lodged he found a little group of horrified spanish prelates and nobles the archbishop of santiago the bishop of majorca and count cabra at the door of the infanta's apartments barring entrance the princess had they said retired to her chamber and ought not to be disturbed there was no restraining a king in his own realm however and henry brushed the group aside even if she were in bed he said he meant to see and speak with her for that was the whole intent of his coming finding that spanish etiquette would not be observed in england catherine made the best of matters and received henry graciously though evidently her latin and french were different from his for they were hardly intelligible to one another then after the king had changed his travelling garb 
he sent word that he had a present for the princess and led in the blushing prince arthur to the presence of his bride the conversation now was more easily conducted for the latin-speaking bishops were close by to interpret once more and for the fourth time the young couple formally pledged their troth and then after supper the spanish minstrels played and the ladies and gentlemen of catherine's suite danced young arthur though unable to dance in the spanish way trod an english measure with lady guildford to show that he was not unversed in courtly graces arthur appears to have been a slight fair delicate lad amiable and gentle and not so tall as his bride who was within a month of sixteen years arthur being just over fifteen catherine must have had at this time at least the grace of girlhood though she never can have been a great beauty like most of her mother's house she had pale rather hard statuesque features and ruddy hair as we trace her history we shall see that most of her mistakes in england and she made many were the natural result of the uncompromising rigidity of principle arising from the conviction of divine appointment which formed her mother's system she had been brought up in the midst of a crusading war in which the victors drew their inspiration and ascribed their triumph to the special intervention of the almighty in their favor and already catherine's house had assumed as a basis of its family faith that the cause of god was indissolubly linked with that of the sovereigns of castile and leon it was impossible that a woman brought up in such a school could be opportunist or would bend to the petty subterfuges and small complacences by which men are successfully managed and catherine suffered through life from the inflexibility born of self-conscious rectitude slowly through the rain the united cavalcades travelled back by chertsey and the spanish half then rode to kingston where the duke of buckingham with four hundred retainers in black and scarlet met the bride and so to the palace at kennington hard by lambeth where catherine was lodged until the sumptuous preparations for the public marriage at st paul's were completed to give a list of all the splendors that preceded the wedding would be as tedious as it is unnecessary but a general impression of the festivities as they struck a contemporary will give us a far better idea than a close catalogue of the wonderful things the princess saw as she rode her white palfrey on the twelfth november through southwark over london bridge and by cheapside to the bishop of london's house adjoining st paul's Quote, and because i will not be tedious to you i pass over the wise devices the prudent speeches the costly works the cunning portraitures practised and set forth in seven beautiful pageants erected and set up in diverse places of the city i leave also the goodly ballads the sweet harmony the musical instruments which sounded with heavenly noise in every side of the street i omit the costly apparel both of goldsmith's work and embroidery the rich jewels the massy chains the stirring horses the beautiful bards and the glittering trappers both with bells and spangles of gold i predermit also the rich apparel of the princess the strange fashion of the spanish nation the beauty of the english ladies the goodly demeanour of the young damsels the amorous countenance of the lusty bachelors i pass over the fine and grained clothes the costly furs of the citizens standing upon scaffolds railed from grace church to st paul's what should i speak 
of the odiferous scarlets and fine velvet and pleasant furs and rich chains which the mayor of london with the senate sitting on horseback at the little conduit in chepa wore upon their bodies and about their necks i will not molest you with rehearsing the rich auras the costly tapestry the fine cloths of silver and of gold the curious velvets and satins the pleasant silks which did hang in every street where she passed the wine that ran out of the conduits the graveling and railing of the streets and all else that needeth not remembering End quote. in short we may conclude that catherine's passage through london before her wedding was as triumphal as the citizens could make it even the common people knew that her presence in england made for security and peace and her lancastrian descent from john of gaunt seemed to add promise of legitimacy to future heirs of the crown a long raised gangway of timber handsomely draped ran from the great west door of st paul's to the entrance to the choir near the end of the gangway there was erected upon it a high platform reached by steps on each side with room on the top for eight persons to stand on the north side of the platform sat the king and queen incognito in a tribune supposed to be private whilst the corporation of london were ranged on the opposite side the day of the ceremony was the fourteenth november fifteen o one sunday and the day of saint erkenwald and all london was agog to see the show nobles and knights from every corner of the realm glittering and flashing in their new finery had come to do honour to the heir of england and his bride both bride and bridegroom were dressed in white satin and they stood together a comely young pair upon the high scarlet stage to be married for the fifth time on this occasion by the archbishop of canterbury then after mass had been celebrated at the high altar with archbishops and mitred prelates by the dozen a procession was formed to lead the newly married couple to the bishop of london's palace across the churchyard the stately bride looking older than her years came first followed by a hundred ladies and whilst on her left hand there hobbled the disreputable crippled old ambassador dr puebla the greatest day of whose life this was on the other side of the princess was led by the most engaging figure in all that vast assembly it was that of a graceful little boy of ten years in white velvet and gold his bearing so gallant and sturdy his skin so dazzlingly fair his golden hair so shining his smile so frank that a rain of blessings showered upon him as he passed this was the bridegroom's brother henry duke of york who in gay unconsciousness was leading his own fate by the hand again the details of crowds of lords and ladies in their sumptuous garments of banquets and dancing of chivalric jousts and puerile maskings may be left to the imagination of the reader when magnificence at last grew palling the young bride and bridegroom were escorted to their chamber in the bishop of london's palace with the broad suggestiveness then considered proper in all well-conducted weddings and duly recorded in this case by the courtly chroniclers of the times in the morning arthur called at the door of the nuptial chamber to his attendants for a draught of liquor to the bantering question of the chamberlain as to the cause of his unaccustomed thirst it was not unnatural considering the free manners of the day that the prince should reply in a vein of boyish boastfulness with a suggestion which was probably untrue regarding the aridity of the spanish climate 
and his own prowess as being the causes of his droughtiness in any case this indelicate bit of youthful swagger of arthur's was made nearly thirty years afterwards one of the principal pieces of evidence gravely brought forward to prove the illegality of catherine's marriage with henry on the day following the marriage the king and queen came in full state to congratulate the newly married pair and led them to the abode that had been elaborately prepared for them at baynard's castle whose ancient keep frowned over the thames below blackfriars on the thursday following the feast was continued at westminster with greater magnificence than ever in a splendid tribune extending from westminster hall right across what is now parliament square sat catherine with all the royal family and the court whilst the citizens crowded the stands on the other side of the great space reserved for the chilters invention was exhausted by the greater nobles and the contrivances by which they sought to make their respective entries effective one had borne over him a green erection representing a wooded mount crowded with allegorical animals another rode under a tent of cloth of gold and yet another pranced into the lists mounted upon a stage dragon led by a fearsome giant and so the pageantry that seems to us so trite and was then considered so exquisite unrolled itself before the enraptured eyes of the lieges who paid for it all how gold plate beyond valuation was piled upon the sideboards at the great banquet after the tilt in westminster hall how catherine and one of her ladies danced spanish dances and arthur led out his aunt sicily how masks and devices innumerable were paraded before the hosts and guests and above all how the debonair little duke of york charmed all hearts by his dancing with his elder sister and warming to his work cast off his coat and footed it in his doublet cannot be told here nor the ceremony in which catherine distributed rich prizes a few days afterwards to the successful tilters there was more feasting and mumming at shen to follow but at last the celebration wore itself out and arthur and his wife settled down for a time to married life in their palace at baynard's castle king henry in his letter to the bride's parents expresses himself as delighted with her quote, beauty and agreeable and dignified manners end quote, and promises to be to her quote, a second father who will ever watch over her and never allow her to lack anything that he can procure for her end quote. how he kept his promise we shall see later but there is no doubt that her marriage with his son was a great relief to him and enabled him first to cast his net wide and sweep into its meshes all the gentry of england who might be presumed to wish him ill and secondly to send epson and dudley abroad to wring from the well-to-do classes the last ducat that could be squeezed in order that he might buttress his throne with wealth probably arthur's letter to ferdinand and isabel written at the same time november thirty fifteen o one was drafted by other hands than his own but the terms in which he expresses his satisfaction with his wife are so warm that they doubtless reflect the fact that he really found her pleasant he had never he assured them felt so much joy in his life as when he beheld the sweet face of his bride and no woman in the world could be more agreeable to him the honeymoon was a short and could hardly have been a merry one for arthur was obviously a weakling 
consumptive some chroniclers aver and the grim old castle by the river was not a lively abode before the marriage feast were well over henry's avarice began to make things unpleasant for catherine we have seen how persistent he had been in his demands that the dowry should be paid to him in gold and how the bride's parents had pressed that the jewels and plate she took with her should be considered as part of the dowry on catherine's wedding the first instalment of one hundred thousand crowns had been handed to henry by the archbishop of santiago and there is no doubt that in the negotiations puebla had as usual with him thought to smooth matters by concealing from both sovereigns the inconvenient conditions insisted by each of them henry therefore imagined he said that he was led to believe it by puebla that the jewels and plate were to be surrendered to him on a valuation as part of the second installment whereas the bride's parents were allowed to suppose that catherine would still have the enjoyment of them in the middle of december therefore henry sent for juan de cuero catherine's chamberlain and demanded the valuables as an installment of the remaining one hundred thousand crowns of the dowry cuero astounded at such a request replied that it would be his duty to have them weighed and valued and a list given to the king in exchange for a receipt for their value but that he had not to give them up the king highly irate at what he considered an evasion of his due pressed his demand but without avail and afterwards saw catherine herself at baynard's castle in the presence of donna elvira manuel her principal lady in waiting what was the meaning of it he asked as he told her of cuero's refusal to surrender her valuables in fulfilment of the promise and further exposed puebla's double dealing puebla it appears had gone to the king and had suggested that if his advice was followed the jewels would remain in england whilst their value would be paid to henry in money as well he had he assured the king already gained over catherine to the plan which briefly was to allow the princess to use the jewels and plate for the present so when the time came for demanding their surrender her father and mother would be ashamed of her being deprived of them and would pay their value in money henry explained to catherine that he was quite shocked at such a dishonest suggestion which he refused he said to entertain he had therefore asked for the valuables at once as he saw that there was craft at work and he would be no party to it he acknowledged however that the jewels were not due to be delivered until the last payment on account of the dowry had to be made it was all puebla's fault he assured his daughter-in-law which was probably true though it will be observed that the course pursued allowed henry to assert his eventual claim to the surrender of the jewels and his many professions of disinterestedness cloaked the crudeness of his demand the next day henry sent for bishop ayala who was puebla's colleague and bitter enemy and told him that prince arthur must be sent to wales soon and that much difference of opinion existed as to whether catherine should accompany him what did ayala advise the spaniard thought that the princess should remain with the king and queen in london for the present rather than go to wales where the prince must necessarily be absent from her a good deal and she would be lonely when catherine herself was consulted by henry she would express no decided opinion and arthur was worked upon by his father to persuade her to say that she wished to go to wales finding that catherine still avoided the expression of an opinion henry with a great show of sorrow 
decided that she should accompany arthur then came the question of the maintenance of the princess's household puebla had again tried to please everyone by saying that henry would provide a handsome dotation for the purpose but when donna elvira manuel on the eve of the journey to wales asked the king what provision he was going to make he feigned the utmost surprise at the question he knew nothing about it he said the prince would of course maintain his wife and her necessary servants but no special separate grant could be made to the princess when pueblo was brought to book he threw the blame upon the members of catherine's household and was publicly rebuked by henry for his shiftiness but the spaniards believed probably with reason that the whole comedy was agreed upon between the king and puebla to obtain the possession of the plate and jewels or their value and sending of the princess to wales being for the purpose of making it necessary that she should use the objects and so give good grounds for a demand for their value in money on the part of henry in any case catherine found herself only five weeks after her marriage with an unpaid and inharmonious household dependent entirely upon her husband for her needs and conscious that an artful trick was in full execution with the object of either depriving her of her personal jewels and everything of value with which she had furnished her husband's table as well as her own or else of extorting a large sum of money from her parents embittered already with such knowledge as this catherine rode by her husband's side out of baynard's castle on the twenty first december fifteen o one to continue on the long journey to wales after passing their christmas at oxford the plague was rife throughout england and on the second april fifteen o two arthur prince of wales fell a victim to it at ludlow here was an unforeseen blow that threatened to deprive both henry and ferdinand of the result of their diplomacy for ferdinand the matter was of the utmost importance for an approachment of england and scotland to france would upset the balance of power he had so laboriously constructed already threatened as it was by the prospect that his flemish son-in-law philip and his wife would wear the crowns of the empire flanders and burgundy as well as those of spain and its possessions in which case he thought spanish interests would be the last considered the news of the unexpected catastrophe was greeted in london with real sorrow for arthur was promising and popular and both henry and his queen were naturally attached to their elder son just approaching manhood upon whose training they had lavished so much care though henry's grief at his loss may have been as sincere as that of elizabeth of york certainly was his natural inclinations soon asserted themselves ludlow was unhealthy and after the pompous funeral of arthur at worcester catherine and her household prayed earnestly to be allowed to approach london but for some weeks without success and by the time she arrived at her new abode at croydon the political intrigues of which she was the tool were in full swing again end of section three Section 4 of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1501 through 1509. Catherine's Widowhood and Why She Stayed in England. Part 2. When Ferdinand and Isabel first heard the news of their daughter's bereavement at the beginning of May, they were at toledo 
and lost no time in sending off post haste to england a fresh ambassador with special instructions from themselves the man they chose was the duc de estrada whose only recommendation seems to have been his rank for puebla was soon able to twist him round his finger his mission as we now know was an extraordinary and delicate one ostensibly he was to demand the immediate return of the one hundred thousand crowns paid to henry on account of dowry and the firm settlement upon catherine of the manors and rents securing to her the revenue assigned to her in england and at the same time he was to urge henry to send catherine back to spain at once but these things were really the last that ferdinand desired he knew full well that henry would go to any length to avoid disgorging the dowry and secret instructions were given to estrada to effect a betrothal between the ten years old henry duke of york and his brother's widow of sixteen strict orders were also sent to puebla of a character to forward the secret design although he was not fully informed of the latter he was to press amongst other things that catherine might receive her english revenue punctually catherine it appears had written to her parents saying that she had been advised to borrow money for the support of her household and the king and queen of spain were indignant at such an idea not a farthing they said must she be allowed to borrow and none of her jewels sold the king of england must provide for her promptly and handsomely in accordance with his obligations this course as the writers well knew would soon bring henry the seventh himself to propose the marriage for which ferdinand was so anxious henry professed himself very ready to make the settlement of the english income as requested but in such case he claimed that the whole of the spanish dowry in gold must be paid to him ferdinand could not see it in this light at all and insisted that the death of arthur had dissolved the marriage this fencing went on for some time neither party wishing to be the first to propose the indecorous marriage with henry that both desired it is evident that puebla and the chaplain alexander opposed the match secretly and endeavored to thwart it either from an idea of its illegality or more probably with a view of afterwards bringing it about themselves in the midst of this intrigue the king of france suddenly attacked ferdinand both in italy and on the catalonian frontier and made approaches to henry for the marriage of his son with a french princess this hurried the pace in spain and queen isabel ordered estrada to carry through the betrothal of catherine and her brother-in-law without loss of time quote, for any delay would be dangerous end quote. so anxious were the spanish sovereigns that nothing should stand in the way that they were willing to let the old arrangement about the dowry stand henry retaining the one hundred thousand crowns already paid and receiving when the marriage was consummated the remaining one hundred thousand on condition that in the meanwhile catherine was properly maintained in england even the incestuous nature of the union was to be no bar to its being effected though no papal dispensation had yet been obtained isabel sought salve for her conscience in this respect by repeating dona elvera manuel's assurance that catherine still remains intact her marriage with arthur not having been consummated to lure henry into an armed alliance against france once more the old bait of the recovery of normandy and guienna was dangled before him 
but the king of england played with a firmer hand now he knew his worth as a balancing factor his accumulated treasure made him powerful and he held all the cards in his hand for the king of scots was his son-in-law and the french were as anxious for his smiles as were the spanish sovereigns so he stood off and refused to pledge himself to a hostile alliance in view of this ferdinand and isabel's tone changed and they developed a greater desire than ever to have their daughter and above all her dowry returned to them we cannot endure wrote isabel to estrada on the tenth august fifteen o two that a daughter whom we love should be so far away from us in her trouble you shall tell the king of england that you have our orders to freight vessels for her voyage to this end you must make such a show of giving directions and preparing for the voyage that the members of the princess's household may believe that it is true send also some of her household on board with the captain i am now sending you and show all signs of departure if in consequence the english spoke of the betrothal with young henry the ambassador was to show no desire for it but was to listen keenly to all that was proposed and if the terms were acceptable he might clinch the matter at once without further reference and then the saintly queen concludes thus quote, the one object of this business is to bring the betrothal to a conclusion as soon as possible in conformity with your instructions for then all our anxiety will cease and we shall be able to seek the aid of england against france for this is the most efficient aid we can have End quote. henry was not for the moment to be frightened by fresh demands for his armed alliance against france the betrothal was to be forwarded first and then the rest would follow puebla who was quite confident that he alone could carry on the marriage negotiations successfully was also urged by mingled flattery and threats by his sovereign to do his utmost with that end whilst this diplomatic haggling was going on in london for the disposal of the widowed catherine to the best advantage a blow fell that for a moment changed the aspect of affairs elizabeth of york the wife of henry the seventh died on the eleventh february fifteen o three in the tower of london a week after giving birth to her seventh child she had been a good and submissive wife to the king whose claim to the throne she had fortified by her own greater right and we are told that the bereaved husband was quote, heavy and dolorous end quote, with his loss when he retired to a solitary place to pass his sorrow but before many weeks were over he and his crony puebla put their crafty heads together and agreed that the king might marry his widowed daughter-in-law himself the idea was cynically repulsive but it gives us the measure of henry's unscrupulousness puebla conveyed the hint to isabel and ferdinand who to do them justice appeared to be really shocked at the suggestion this time april fifteen o three the spanish sovereigns spoke with more sincerity than before they were they told their ambassador tired of henry's shiftiness and of their daughter's equivocal and undignified position in england now that the queen was dead and the betrothal still hung fire the princess was really to come to spain in a fleet that should be sent for her unless the marriage with the young prince of wales was agreed to at once as for a wife for king henry there was the widowed queen of naples ferdinand's niece who lived in valencia and he might have her with the blessing of the spanish sovereigns 
the suggestion was a tempting one to henry for the queen of naples was well dowered and the vigor of isabel's refusal to listen to his marriage with her daughter made it evident that that was out of the question so henry at last made up his mind at least to execute the treaty which was to betroth his surviving son to catherine in the treaty which was signed on the twenty third june fifteen o three it is set forth that inasmuch as the bride and bridegroom were related in the first degree of affinity a papal dispensation would be necessary for the marriage and it is distinctly stated that the marriage with arthur had been consummated this may have been a diplomatic form considered at the time unimportant in view of the ease in which dispensation could be obtained but it is at direct variance with donna elvira manuel's assurance to isabel at the time of arthur's death and with catherine's assertion uncontradicted by henry to the end of her life henry prince of wales was at this time twelve years old and if we are to believe erasmus a prodigy of precocious scholarship though his learning was superficial and carefully made the most of he was in effect an apt and diligent student from the first his mother and father had determined that their children should enjoy better educational advantages than had fallen to them and as henry had been until arthur's death intended for the church his learning was far in advance of that of most princes and nobles of his age the bride who thus became unwillingly affianced to a boy more than five years her junior was now a young woman in her prime experienced already in the chicane and falsity of the atmosphere in which she lived she knew none better that in the juggle for her marriage she had been regarded as a mere chattel and her own inclinations hardly taken into account and she faced her responsibilities bravely in her mother's exalted spirit of duty and sacrifice when she found herself once more princess of wales when ferdinand in accordance with his pledge in the treaty instructed his ambassador in rome to ask for the pope's dispensation he took care to correct the statement embodied in the document to the effect that the marriage of arthur and catherine had been consummated though the question might pertinently be asked why if it had not been a dispensation was needed at all the king himself answered the question by saying that quote, as the english are so much inclined to cavil it appeared prudent to provide for the case as if the previous marriage had been completed and the dispensation must be worded in accordance with the treaty since the succession to the crown depends on the undoubted legitimacy of the marriage End quote. no sooner was the ratification of the betrothal conveyed to ferdinand than he demanded the aid of henry against france and estrada was instructed to quote, make use of end quote, catherine to obtain the favor demanded if henry hesitated to provide the money for raising the two thousand english troops required catherine herself was to be asked by her kind father to pawn her plate and jewels for the purpose henry however had no intention to be hurried now that the betrothal had been signed there were several things he wanted on his side first the earl of suffolk and his brother richard pole were still in flanders and the greatest wish of henry's life was that they should be handed over to his tender mercies so the armed coalition against france still hung fire whilst a french ambassador was as busy courting the king of england as ferdinand himself in the meanwhile catherine for a time lived in apparent amity with henry and his family especially with the young princess mary 
who was her constant companion in the autumn of fifteen o four she passed a fortnight with them at windsor and richmond hunting every day but just as the king was leaving greenwich for a progress through kent the princess fell seriously ill and the letters written by henry during his absence to his daughter-in-law are worded as if he were the most affectionate of fathers on this progress the prince of wales accompanied his father for the first time as the king had previously been loath to disturb his studies it is quite wonderful wrote an observer how much the king loves the prince he has good reason to do so for he deserves all his love already the crafty and politic king was indoctrinating his son in the system he had made his own that the command of ready money gained no matter how meant power and that to hold the balance between two greater rivals was to have them both at his bidding and young henry though of different nature from his father made good use of his lesson catherine's greatest trouble at this time the autumn of fifteen o four was the bickering and worse of her spanish household we have already seen how puebla had set them by the ears with his jealousy of his colleagues and his dodging diplomacy catherine appealed to henry to bring her servants to order but he refused to interfere as they were not his subjects dona elvara manuel the governess was a great lady and resented any interference with her domain there is no doubt that her rule so far as regarded the princess herself was a wise one but as we shall see directly she castilian that she was and sister of the famous diplomatist juan manuel took up a position inimical to ferdinand after isabel's death and innocently led catherine into grave political trouble in november fifteen o four the death of isabel queen of castile long threatened after her strenuous life changed the whole aspect for ferdinand the heiress of the principal crown of spain was now catherine's sister juana who had lived for years in the latitudinarian court of brussels with her consort philip the last time she had gone to spain her freedom towards the strict religious observances considered necessary in her mother's court had led to violent scenes between isabel and juana even then the scandalized spanish churchmen who flocked around isabel whispered that the heiress of castile must be mad and her foreign husband the heir of the empire was hated and distrusted by the quote, catholic kings end quote. isabel by her will had left her husband guardian of her realms for juana and from the moment the queen breathed her last the struggle between ferdinand and his son-in-law never ceased until philip the handsome who thought he had beaten wily old ferdinand himself was beaten by poison the death of her mother not only threw catherine into natural grief for her loss which truly was a great one for at least isabel deeply loved her youngest child whilst ferdinand loved nothing but himself and aragon but it greatly altered for the worse her position in england philip of austria and his father the emperor had begun to play false to ferdinand long before the queen's death and now that the crown of castile had fallen to poor weak juana and a struggle was seen to be impending for the regency henry the seventh found himself as usual courted by both sides in the dispute the widowed archduchess margaret who had married as a first husband 
ferdinand's heir was offered to henry as a bride by philip and maximilian and a close alliance between them proposed and ferdinand whilst denouncing his son-in-law's ingratitude also bade high for the king of england's countenance henry listened to both parties but it was clear to him that he had now more to hope for from philip and maximilian who were friendly with france than from ferdinand and the unfortunate catherine was again reduced to the utmost neglect and penury unable to buy food for her own table except by pawning her jewels in the ensuing intrigues dona elvira manuel was on the side of the queen of castile as against her father and catherine lost the impartial advice of her best counsellor and involved herself in a very net of trouble in the summer of fifteen o five it was already understood that philip and juana on their way to spain by sea might possibly trust themselves in an english port and henry in order to be ready for any matrimonial combinations that might be suggested caused young henry to make solemn protest before the bishop of winchester at richmond against his marriage with catherine of this at the time of course the spanish agents were ignorant and so completely was even puebla hoodwinked that almost to the arrival of philip and his wife in england he believed that henry was in favor of ferdinand against philip and maximilian early in august fifteen o five puebla went to richmond to see catherine and as he entered one of the household told him that an ambassador from the archduke philip king of castile had just arrived and was waiting to see her puebla at once himself conveyed the news to catherine and to his glee served as interpreter between the ambassador and the princess on his knees before her the fleming related that he had come to propose a marriage between the duchess of savoy i e the widowed archduchess margaret and henry the seventh and showed the princess two portraits of the archduchess furthermore he said that philip and his wife were going by overland through france to spain and he was to ask henry what he thought of the plan puebla's eyes were thus partially opened and when a few days later he found that dona elvira had not only contrived frequent private meetings between catherine and the flemish ambassador but had persuaded the princess to propose a meeting between philip juana and the king of england he at once sounded a note of alarm catherine it must be recollected was yet young and probably did not fully understand the deadly antagonism that existed between her father and her brother-in-law she was much under the influence of donna elvira and doubtless yearned to see her unhappy sister juana so she was induced to write a letter to philip and to propose a meeting with henry at calais when a prompt affirmative reply came the princess innocently showed it to puebla at Durham house before sending it to henry the seventh the ambassador was aghast and soundly rated catherine for going against the interests of her father he would take the letter to the king he said but this catherine would not allow and dona alvira was appealed to she promised to retain the letter for the present but just as puebla was sitting down to dinner an hour afterwards he learnt that she had broken her word and sent philip's letter to henry the seventh starting up he rushed to catherine's apartments and with tears streaming down his face at his failure told the princess under pledge of secrecy 
that the proposed interview was a plot of the manuels to injure both her father and sister she must at once write a letter to henry which he puebla would dictate and whilst still feigning a desire for the meeting she must try to prevent it with all her might and beware of donna alvara in the future poor catherine alarmed at his vehemence did as she was told and the letter was sent flying to henry apologizing for the proposal of the interview henry must have smiled when he saw how eager they all were to court him nothing would please him better than the close alliance with philip which was already being secretly negotiated though he was effusively assuring ferdinand at the same time of the inviolability of their friendship promising that the marriage which he had secretly denounced between his son and catherine should be celebrated on the very day provided by the treaty and approving of some secret plot of ferdinand against philip which had been communicated to him amidst such falsity as this it is most difficult to pick one's way though it is evident through it all that henry had now gained the upper hand and was fully a match for ferdinand in his altered circumstances but as things improved for henry they became worse for catherine in december fifteen o five she wrote bitterly to her father from richmond complaining of her fate the unhappiness of which she said was all puebla's fault every day she wrote my troubles increase since my arrival in england i have not received a farthing except for food and i and my household have not even garments to wear she had asked puebla to pray the king to appoint an english duenna for her while dona elvira was in flanders but instead of doing so he had arranged with henry that her household should be dismissed altogether and that she should reside at court her letter throughout shows that at the time she was in deep despondency and anger at her treatment and especially resentful of puebla whom she disliked and distrusted profoundly as did donna alvara manuel the very elements seemed to fight on the side of the king of england ferdinand was in sheer desperation struggling to prevent his paternal realms from being merged in castile and the empire and with that end was negotiating his marriage with the french king's niece germain de foix and a close alliance with france in which england should be included when philip of austria and his wife juana of aragon queen of castile sailed from flanders to claim their kingdom at ferdinand's hands they too had made friends with france some time before but the marriage of ferdinand with a french princess had now drawn them strongly to the side of england and as we have seen they were already in full negotiation with henry for his marriage with the doubly widowed and heavily dowered archduchess margaret the king and queen of castile were overtaken by a furious southwest gale in the channel and their fine fleet dispersed the ship that carried philip and juana was driven by the storm into melcom regis on the dorset coast on the seventeenth january fifteen o six and lay there weather-bound for some time philip the handsome was a poor sailor and was we are told by an eyewitness quote, fatigate and unquieted in mind and body end quote he doubtless yearned to tread dry land again and against the advice of his council had himself rowed ashore only in the previous year he had as unguardedly put himself into the power of the king of france and his boldness had succeeded well as it had resulted in the treaty with the french king 
that had so much alarmed and shocked ferdinand but it is unlikely that philip on this occasion intended to make any stay in england or to go beyond weymouth the news of his coming brought together all the neighboring gentry to oppose or welcome him according to his demeanor and finding him friendly sir john trenchard prevailed upon him to take up his residence in his manor house hard by until the weather mended in the meanwhile formidable english forces mustered in the country around and philip began to grow uneasy but trenchard's hospitality was pressing and to all hints from the visitor that he wanted to be gone the reply was given that he really must wait until the king of england could bid him welcome when at last philip was given to understand that he was practically a prisoner he made the best of the position and with seeming cordiality awaited king henry's message no wonder as a chronicler says that henry when he heard the news quote, was replenished with an exceeding gladness for that he trusted his landing in england should turn to his profit and commodity End quote. this it certainly did philip and juana were brought to windsor in great state and met by henry and his son and a splendid train of nobles then the visitors were led through london in state to richmond and philip amidst all the festivity was soon convinced that he would not be allowed to leave england until the rebel plantagenet earl of suffolk was handed to henry and so the pact was made that bound england to philip and flanders against ferdinand the archduchess margaret with her vast fortune being promised with unheard of guarantees to the widowed henry when the treaty had been solemnly ratified on oath taken upon a fragment of the true cross in st george's chapel windsor philip was allowed to go his way on the second march to join his ship at falmouth whither juana had preceded him a fortnight before this new treaty made poor catherine of little value as a political asset in england since it was clear now that ferdinand's hold over anything but his paternal heritage in the mediterranean was powerless flanders and castile were a far more advantageous ally to england than the king of aragon and catherine was promptly made to feel the fact dr puebla was certainly either kept quite out of the way or his compliance bought or he would have been able to devise means for catherine to inform her sister juana of the real object of henry's treaty with philip for ferdinand always insisted that juana was a dutiful daughter and was not personally opposed to him as it was catherine was allowed to see her sister but for an hour just before juana's departure and then in the presence of witnesses in the interests of philip only a few weeks after the visitors had departed catherine wrote to her father in fear lest her letters should be intercepted begging him to have pity upon her she is deep in debt not for extravagant things but for food Quote, the king of england refuses to pay anything though she implores him with tears to do so he says he has been cheated about the marriage portion in the meanwhile she is in the deepest anguish her servants almost begging for alms and she herself nearly naked she has been at death's door for months and prays earnestly for a spanish confessor as she cannot speak english End quote. how false ferdinand met his dear children and made with his daughter's husband that hellish secret compact in the church of villa fafia that seemed to renounce everything to philip whilst ferdinand went humbly to his realm of naples <laughs> 
and his ill-used daughter Juana to lifelong confinement cannot be told here, nor the sudden death of Philip the Handsome, which brought back Ferdinand triumphant. If Juana was sane before, she certainly became more or less mad after her husband's death, and moreover was morbidly devoted to his memory. But what mattered madness or a widow's devotion to Henry the Seventh, when he had political objects to serve? All through the summer and autumn of 1506, Catherine had been ill with fever and ague, unhappy at the neglect and poverty she suffered. Ferdinand threw upon Castile the duty of paying the rest of her dowry. The Castilians retorted that Ferdinand ought to pay it himself and catherine in the depth of despondency in october fifteen o six learnt of her brother-in-law philip's death like magic henry the seventh became amiable again to his daughter-in-law he deplored her illness now and cordially granted her the change of residence from eltham to fulham that she had so long prayed for in vain the reason was soon evident for before juana had completed her dreary pilgrimage through spain to granada with her husband's dead body henry had cajoled catherine to ask her father for the distraught widow for his wife catherine must have fulfilled the task with repulsion though she seems to have advocated the match warmly and ferdinand though he knew or rather said that juana was mad was quite ready to take advantage of such an opportunity for again getting into touch with henry the letter in which ferdinand gently dallied with henry's offer was written in naples after months of shifty excuses for not sending the rest of catherine's dowry to england and doubtless the time he gained by postponing the answer about Juana's marriage until he returned to Spain was of value to him, for he was determined, now that a special providence carefully prepared had removed Philip from his path, that once more all Spain should bear his sway whilst he lived, and then should be divided, rather than his dear Aragon should be rendered subordinate to other interests. End of section four. Section five of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1501 through 1509 catherine's widowhood and why she stayed in england part three the encouraging talk of henry's marriage with juana with which both catherine and puebla were instructed to beguile him was all very well in its way and the king of england became quite joyously sentimental at the prospect of the new tie of relationship between the houses of tudor and aragon but really business was business if that long overdue dowry for catherine was not sent soon young henry would listen to some of the many other eligible princesses better dowered than catherine who were offered to him with much demure henry at length consented to wait for five months longer for the dowry that is to say until michaelmas 1507 and in the meanwhile drove a bargain as hard as that of a jew huckster in the valuation of catherine's jewels and plate which were to be brought into the account it is easy to see that this concession of five months delay was granted by henry in the hope that his marriage with juana would take place the plan was hideously wicked, and Puebla made no secret of it in writing to Ferdinand. Quote, 
no king in the world would make so good a husband to the queen of castile whether she be sane or insane she might recover her reason when wedded to such a husband but even in that case king ferdinand would at all events be sure to retain the regency of castile on the other hand if the insanity of the queen should prove incurable it would perhaps be not inconvenient that she should live in england the english do not seem to mind her insanity much especially since it is asserted that her mental malady would not prevent her from childbearing End quote. could anything be more repulsive than this pretty arrangement which had been concocted by henry and puebla at richmond during a time when the former was seriously ill with quincy and inaccessible to any one but the spanish ambassador in the meanwhile catherine felt keenly the wretched position in which she found herself the plate about which so much haggling was taking place was being pawned or sold by her bit by bit to provide the most necessary things for her own use her servants were in rags and she herself was contemned and neglected forbidden even to see her betrothed husband for months together though living in the same palace with him the more confident henry grew of his own marriage with the archduchess margaret or with queen juana the less inclined he was to wed his son to catherine a french princess for the prince of wales and the queen of castile for henry would indeed have served england on all sides on one occasion in april fifteen o seven henry frankly told catherine that he considered himself no longer bound by her marriage treaty since her dowry was overdue and all the poor princess could do was to weep and pray her father to fulfil his part of the compact by paying the rest of her portion whilst she serving as ferdinand's ambassador tried to retain henry's good graces by her hopeful assurances about the marriage of the latter with juana in all catherine's lamentations of her own sufferings and privation she never forgot to bewail the misery of her servants whilst she herself she said had been worse treated than any woman in england her five women servants all she had retained had never received a farthing since their arrival in england six years before and had spent everything they possessed catherine at this time of trial august fifteen o seven was living alone at ulm whilst henry was hunting at various seats in the midlands at length the king made some stay at woodstock where catherine saw him with suspicious alacrity he consented to a further postponement of the overdue dowry and showed himself more eager than ever to marry juana no matter how mad she might be catherine was quite acute enough to understand his motives and wrote to her father that so long as the money due of her dowry remained unpaid the king considered himself free so far as regarded her marriage with the prince of wales mine is always the worst part she wrote the king of england prides himself upon his magnanimity in waiting so long for the payment his words are kind but his deeds are as bad as ever she bitterly complained that puebla himself was doing his utmost to frustrate her marriage in the interests of the king of england and it is clear to see in her passionate letter to her father fourth october fifteen o seven that she half distrusted even him as she had been told that he was listening to overtures from the king of france for a marriage between juana and a french prince she failed in this to understand the political position fully if juana had married a frenchman it is certain that henry 
would have been only too eager to complete the marriage of his son with Catherine. But she was evidently in fear that, unless Henry was allowed to marry her sister, evil might befall her. Speaking of the marriage, she says, quote, I bait him with this, and his words and professions have changed for the better, although his acts remain the same. They fancy that I have no more in me than what outwardly appears, or that I shall not be able to phantom his, Puebla's, design. End quote. Under stress of her circumstances, Catherine was developing rapidly. She was no longer a girl dependent upon others. Doña Elvira had gone for good. Puebla she hated and distrusted as much as she did Henry, and there was no one by her to whom she could look for help. Her position was a terribly difficult one, pitted alone, as she was, against the most unscrupulous politicians in Europe, in whose hands she knew she was only one of the pieces in a game. Juana was still carrying about with her the unburied corpse of her husband, and falling into paroxysms of fury when a second marriage was suggested to her. And yet Catherine considered it necessary to keep up the pretense to Henry that his suit was prospering. She knew that though the Archduchess Margaret had firmly refused to tempt Providence again by a third marriage, with the king of england the boy sovereign of castile and flanders the archduke charles had been securely betrothed to golden-haired little mary tudor henry's younger daughter and that the close alliance thus sealed was as dangerous to her father king ferdinand's interests as to her own and yet she was either forced or forced herself to paint Henry, who was still treating her vilely, in the brightest colors, as a chivalrous, virtuous gentleman, really and desperately in love with poor crazy Juana. Catherine's letters to her sister on behalf of Henry's suit are nauseous, in view of the circumstances as we know them, and show that the Princess of Wales was already prepared to sacrifice every human feeling to political expediency. This miserable position could not continue indefinitely, for the extension of time for the payment of the dowry was fast running out. Juana was more intractable than ever. Catherine, in rage and despair at the contumely in which she was treated, insisted at length that her father should send an ambassador to england who could speak as the mouthpiece of a great sovereign rather than like a fawning menial of henry as puebla was the new ambassador was gomez de fuencelida knight commander of haro and membria a man as haughty as puebla had been servile and he went far beyond even catherine's desires in his plain speaking to Henry and his ministers. Ferdinand, indeed, by this time, had once more gained the upper hand in Europe, and could afford to speak his mind. Henry was no longer so vigorous or so bold as he had been, and his desire to grasp everything whilst risking nothing had enabled his rivals to form a great coalition from which he was excluded the league of cambrai when salida offended henry almost as soon as he arrived and was roughly refused permission to enter the english court he could only storm as he did to henry's ministers that unless the princess of wales was at once sent home to spain with her dowry king ferdinand and his allies would wreak vengeance upon england but henry knew that with such a hostage as catherine in his hands he was safe from attack and held the princess in defiance of it all but he was already a waning force whilst fencelita had no good word for the king 
he like all other spanish agents turned to the rising sun and sang persistently the praises of the prince of wales his gigantic stature and sturdy limbs his fair skin and golden hair his manliness his prudence and his wisdom were their constant theme and even catherine unhappy as she was with her marriage still in the balance seems to have liked and admired the gallant youth whom she was allowed to see so seldom it has become so much the fashion to speak of catherine not only as an unfortunate woman but as a blameless saint in all her relations that an historian who regards her as fallible and even in many respects a blameworthy woman who was to a large extent the cause of her own troubles must be content to differ from the majority of his predecessors we have already seen by the earnest attempts she made to drag her afflicted sister into marriage with a man whom she herself considered false cruel and unscrupulous that catherine was no better than those around her in moral principle the passion and animosity shown in her letters to her father about puebla fuensalida and others whom she distrusted show her to have been anything but a meek martyr she was indeed at this time fifteen o eight through fifteen o nine a self-willed ambitious girl of strong passion impatient of control domineering and proud her position in england had been a humiliating and hateful one for years she was the sport of the selfish ambitions of others which she herself was unable to control surrounded by people whom she disliked and suspected lonely and unhappy it is not wonderful that when henry the seventh was gradually sinking into his grave and her marriage with his son was still in doubt this ardent southern young woman in her prime should be tempted to cast to the wind considerations of dignity and prudence for the sake of her love for a man she was friendless in a foreign land and when her father was in naples in fifteen o six she wrote to him praying him to send her a spanish confessor to solace her before he could do so she informed him april fifteen o seven that she had obtained a very good spanish confessor for herself this was a young lusty dissolute franciscan monk called diego fernandez who then became a member of catherine's household when the new outspoken ambassador when salida arrived in england in the autumn of fifteen o eight he of course had frequent conference with the princess and could not for long shut his eyes to the state of affairs in her establishment he first sounded the alarm cautiously to ferdinand in a letter of fourth march fifteen o nine he had hoped against hope he said that the marriage of catherine and prince henry might be effected soon and the scandal might remedy itself without his worrying ferdinand about it but he must speak out now for he has been silent too long it is high time he says that some person of sufficient authority in the confidence of ferdinand should be put in charge of catherine's household and command respect Quote, for at present the princess's house is governed by a young friar whom her highness has taken for her confessor though he is in my opinion and that of others utterly unworthy of such a position he makes the princess commit many errors and as she is so good and conscientious this confessor makes a mortal sin of everything that does not please him and so causes her to commit many faults End quote. the ambassador continues that he dare not write all he would because the bearer a servant of catherine's is being sent by those who wish to injure him but he begs the king 
to interrogate the man who takes the letter as to what had been going on in the princess's household in the last two months Quote, the root of all the trouble is this young friar who is flighty and vain and extremely scandalous he has spoken to the princess very roughly about the king of england and because i told the princess something of what i thought of this friar and he learnt it he has disgraced me with her worse than if i had been a traitor that your highness may judge what sort of person he is i will repeat exactly without exaggeration the very words he used to me i know he said that they have been telling you evil tales of me i can assure you father i replied that no one has said anything about you to me i know he replied the same person who told you told me himself well i said any one can bear false witness and i swear by the holy body that so far as i can recollect nothing has been said to me about you ah he said there are scandal-mongers in this house who have defamed me and not with the lowest either but with the highest and that is no disgrace to me if it were not for contradicting them i should be gone already End quotes. proud fuen Salida tells the king that it was only with the greatest difficulty he kept his hands off the insolent priest at this Quote, his constant presence with the princess and amongst her women is shocking the king of england and his court dreadfully End quote. and then the ambassador hints strongly that henry is only allowing the scandal to go on so as to furnish him with a good excuse for still keeping catherine's marriage in abeyance with this letter to spain went another from catherine to her father railing bitterly against the ambassador she can no longer endure her troubles and a settlement of some sort must be arrived at the king of england treats her worse than ever since his daughter mary was betrothed to the young archduke charles sovereign of castile and flanders she had sold everything she possessed for food and raiment and only a few days before she wrote henry had again told her that he was not bound to feed her servants her own people she says are insolent and turn against her but what afflicts her most is that she is too poor to maintain fittingly her confessor quote, the best that ever woman had End quote. it is plain to see that the whole household was in rebellion against the confessor who had captured catherine's heart and that the ambassador was on the side of the household the princess and fuensalida had quarrelled about it and she wished that the ambassador should be reproved with vehement passion she begged her father that the confessor might not be taken away from her quote, i implore your highness to prevent him from leaving me and to write to the king of england that you have ordered this father to stay with me and beg him for your sake to have him well treated and humoured tell the prelates also that you wish him to stay here the greatest comfort in my trouble is the consolation he gives me almost in despair i send this servant to implore you not to forget that i am still your daughter and how much i have suffered for your sake do not let me perish like this but write at once deciding what is to be done otherwise in my present state i am afraid i may do something that neither the king of england nor your highness could prevent unless you send for me and let me pass the few remaining days of my life in god's service End quote that the princess's household and the ambassador were shocked at the insolent familiarity of the licentious young priest with their mistress and that she herself perfectly understood that the suspicions and rumors were against her honor is clear on one occasion henry the seventh had asked catherine and his daughter mary to go to richmond to meet him 
when the two princesses were dressed and ready to set out on their journey from hampton court to richmond the confessor entered the room and told catherine she was not to go that day as she had been unwell the princess protested that she was then quite well and able to bear the short journey i tell you replied father diego that on pain of mortal sin you shall not go to-day and so princess mary set out alone leaving catherine with the young priest of notorious evil life and a few inferior servants when the next day she was allowed to go to richmond accompanied amongst others by the priest king henry took not the slightest notice of her and for the next few weeks refused to speak to her the ambassador even confessed to ferdinand that since he had witnessed what was going on in the princess's household he acquitted henry of most of the blame for his treatment of his spanish daughter-in-law whilst the princess was in the direst distress her household in want of food and she obliged to sell her gowns to send messengers to her father she went to the length of pawning the plate that formed part of her dowry to quote, satisfy the follies of the friar end quote. deaf to all remonstrances from both king henry and her own old servants catherine obstinately had her way and the chances of her marriage in england grew smaller and smaller it is not to be supposed that the ambassador would have dared to say so much as he did to the lady's own father if he had not taken the gravest view of catherine's conduct and its probable political result but his hints to ferdinand's ministers were much stronger still the princess he said was guilty of things a thousand times worse than those he had mentioned and the parables that he had written to the king might be made clear by the examination of catherine's own servant who carried her letters the devil take me he continues if i can see anything in this friar for her to be so fond of him for he has neither learning nor good looks nor breeding nor capacity nor authority but if he takes it into his head to preach a new gospel they have to believe it by two letters still extant written by friar diego himself we see that the ambassador in no wise exaggerated his coarseness and indelicacy and it is almost incredible that catherine an experienced and disillusioned woman of nearly twenty-four can have been ready to jeopardize everything political and personal and face the opposition of the world for the sake alone of the spiritual comfort to be derived from the ministrations of such a man how far if at all the connection was actually immoral we shall probably never know but the case as it stands shows catherine to have been passionate self-willed and utterly tactless even after her marriage with young henry friar diego retained his ascendancy over her for several years and ruled her with a rod of iron until he was publicly convicted of fornication and deprived of his office as chancellor of the queen we shall have later to consider the question of his relationship with catherine after her marriage but it is almost certain that the ostentatious intimacy of the pair during the last months of henry the seventh had reduced catherine's chance of marriage with the prince of wales almost to a vanishing point when the death of the king suddenly changed the political position and rendered it necessary that the powerful coalition of which ferdinand was the head should be conciliated by england henry the seventh died at richmond on the twenty second april fifteen o nine making a better and more generous end than could have been expected from his life he like his rival ferdinand had been avaricious by deliberate policy
and his avarice was largely instrumental in founding england's coming greatness for the overflowing coffers he left to his son lent force to the new position assumed by england as the balancing power courted by both the great continental rivals ferdinand's ambition had overleaped itself and the possession of flanders by the king of castile had made england's friendship more than ever necessary thenceforward for france was opposed to spain now not in italy alone but on long conterminous frontiers in the north south and east as well henry the eighth at the age of eighteen was well fitting to succeed his father all contemporary observers agree that his grace and personal beauty as a youth were as remarkable as his quickness of intellect and his true tutor desire to stand well in the eyes of his people fully aware of the power his father's wealth gave him politically he was determined to share no part of the onus for the oppression with which the wealth had been collected and on the day following his father's death before himself retiring to morning reclusion in the tower of london the unpopular financial instruments of henry the seventh epson and dudley and others were laid by the heels to sate the vengeance of the people the spanish match for the young king was by far more popular in england than any other and the alacrity of henry himself and his ministers to carry it into effect without further delay now that his father with his personal ambitions and enmities was dead was also indicative of his desire to begin his reign by pleasing his subjects the death of henry the seventh had indeed cleared away many obstacles ferdinand had profoundly distrusted him his evident desire to obtain control of castile either by his marriage with juana or by that of his daughter mary with the nine-year-old archduke charles had finally hardened ferdinand's heart against him whilst henry's fear and suspicion of ferdinand had as we have seen effectually stood in the way of the completion of catherine's marriage with young henry as king affairs stood differently even before his father's death ferdinand had taken pains to assure him of his love and had treated him as a sovereign over the dying old king's head before the breath was out of henry the seventh ferdinand's letters were speeding to london to make all things smooth there would be no opposition now to ferdinand's ratification of his flemish grandson's marriage with henry's sister mary the clever old aragonese knew there was still plenty of time to stop that later and certainly young henry could not interfere in castile as his father might have done on the strength of mary tudor's betrothal so all went merry as a marriage bell ferdinand for once in his life was liberal with his money he implored his daughter to make no unpleasantness or complaint and to raise no question that might obstruct her marriage the ambassador fuensalida was warned that if the bickering between himself and the princess or between the confessor and the household was allowed to interfere with the match disgrace and ruin would be his lot and catherine was admonished that she must be civil to fuensalida and to the italian banker who was to pay the balance of her dowry the king of aragon need have had no anxiety young henry and his counsellors were as eager for the popular marriage as he was and dreaded the idea of disgorging the one hundred thousand crowns dowry already paid and the english settlements upon catherine on the sixth may accordingly three days before the body of henry the seventh was borne in gloomy pomp to its last resting place at westminster catherine wrote to her delighted father that her marriage with henry was finally settled end of section five
Section six of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifteen o nine through fifteen twenty seven. Catherine the Queen A Political Marriage and a Personal Divorce. Part one. Long live King Henry the Eighth, cried Garter king of arms in french as the great officers of state broke their staves of office and cast them into the open grave of the first tudor king through england like the blast of a trumpet the cry was echoed from the hearts of a whole people full of hope that the niggardliness and suspicion which for years had stood between the sovereign and his people were at last banished the young king expansive and hearty in manner handsome and strong as a pagan god in person was well calculated to captivate the love of the crowd his prodigious personal vanity which led him to delight in sumptuous raiment and gorgeous shows the state and ceremony with which he surrounded himself and his skill in manly exercises were all points in his favor with a pleasure yearning populace which had been squeezed of its substance without seeing any return for it whilst his ardent admiration for the learning which had during his lifetime become the fashion made grave scholars lose their judgment and write like flattering slaves about the youth of eighteen who now became unquestioned king of england and master of his father's hoarded treasures as we shall see in the course of this history henry was but a whited sepulchre young light-hearted with every one about him praising him as a paragon and his smallest whim indulged as a divine command there was no incitement for the exhibition of the baser qualities that underlay the big popular manner the flamboyant patriotism and it must be added the real ability which appealed alike to the gentle and simple over whom he was called to rule like many men of his peculiar physique he was never a strong man morally and his will grew weaker as his body increased in gross flabbiness the obstinate self-assertion and violence that impressed most observers as strength hid behind them a spirit that forever needed direction and support from a stronger soul so long as he was allowed in appearance to have his own way and his policy was showy he was as one of his wisest ministers said in his last days the easiest man in the world to manage his sensuality which was all his own and his personal vanity were the qualities by means of which one able counsellor after another used him for the ends they had in view until the bridle chafed him and his temporary master was made to feel the vengeance of a weak despot who discovers that he has been ruled instead of ruling in henry's personal character as sketched above we shall be able to find the key of the tremendous political events that made his reign the most important in our annals and we shall see that his successive marriages were the outcome of subtle intrigues in which representatives of various parties took advantage of the king's vanity and lasciviousness to promote their own political or religious views that the emancipation of england from rome was the ultimate result cannot fairly be placed to henry's personal credit if he could have had his own way without breaking with the papacy he would have preferred to maintain the connection but the reformation was in the air and craftier brains than henry's led the king step by step by his ruling passions until he had gone too far to retreat 
to what extent his various matrimonial adventures served these intrigues we shall see in the course of this book that henry's marriage with catherine soon after his accession was politically expedient has been shown in the aforegoing pages and the king's council were strongly in favor of it with the exception of the archbishop of canterbury lord chancellor warham who was more purely ecclesiastical than his colleagues and appears to have had doubts as to the canonical validity of the union as we have seen the pope had given a dispensation for the marriage years before in terms that covered the case of the union with arthur having been duly consummated though catherine strenuously denied that it had been or that she knew how the dispensation was worded the spanish confessor also appears to have suggested to fuen salida some doubts as to the propriety of the marriage but king ferdinand promptly put his veto upon any such scruples had not the pope given his dispensation he asked and did not the peace of england and spain depend upon the marriage the sin would be not the marriage but the failure to effect it after the pledges that had been given so the few doubters were silenced young henry himself all eager for his marriage was not one of them nor was catherine for to her the match was a triumph for which she had worked and suffered for years and on the eleventh june fifteen o nine the pair were married privately by warham at henry's palace of greenwich rarely in its long history has london seen so brave a pageant as the bride and bridegroom's triumphal passage through the city on saturday the twenty first june from the tower to westminster for their coronation rich tapestries and hangings of cloth of gold decked the streets through which they passed the city companies lined the way from gracechurch street to bread street where the lord mayor and the senior guild stood in bright array whilst the goldsmith's shops in chepa had each to adorn it a figure of the holy virgin in white with many wax tapers around it the queen rode in a litter of white and gold tissue drawn by two snowy palfreys she herself being garbed in white satin and gold with a dazzling coronet of precious stones upon her head from which fell almost to her feet her dark russet hair she was twenty-four years of age and in the full flush of womanhood her regular classical features and fair skin bore yet the curves of gracious youth and there need be no doubt of the sincerity of the ardent affection for her borne by the pink and white young giant who rode before her a dazzling vision of crimson velvet cloth of gold and flashing precious stones god save your grace was the cry that rattled like platoon firing along the crowded ways as the splendid cavalcade passed on the next day sunday twenty fourth june the pair were crowned in the abbey with all the tedious pomp of the times then the gargantuan feast in westminster hall of which the chronicler spares us no detail and the endless jousts and devices in which roses and pomegranates castles and leopards jostled each other in endless magnificence until a mere catalogue of the splendor grows meaningless the death of the king's wise old grandmother the countess of richmond interrupted for a time the round of festivities but henry was too new to the unchecked indulgence of his taste for splendor and pleasure to abandon them easily and his english counsellors as well as the watchful spanish agents began before many weeks were over to hint gravely that the young king was neglecting his business 
Catherine appears to have entered fully into the life of pleasure led by her husband. Writing to her father on the 29th July, she is enthusiastic in her praise. We are all so happy, she says. Our time passes in continual feasting. But in her case, at least, we see that mixed with the frivolous pleasure, there was the personal triumph of the politician who had succeeded. Quote, One of the principal reasons why I love my husband the king is because he is so true a son to your majesty. I have obeyed your orders and have acted as your ambassador. My husband places himself entirely in your hands. This country of England is truly your own now, and is tranquil and deeply loyal to the king and to me. End quote. What more could wife or stateswoman ask? Catherine had her reward. Henry was hers, and England was at the bidding of Ferdinand, and her sufferings had not been in vain. Henry, for his part, was, if we are to believe his letters to his father in law, as much enamored of his wife as she was satisfied with him. And so, amidst magnificent shows, and what seems to our taste puerile trifling, the pair began their married life, highly contented with each other and the world. The inevitable black shadows were to come later. In reality, they were an entirely ill-matched couple even apart from the six years disparity in their ages henry a bluff bully a coward morally and also perhaps physically a liar who deceived himself as well as others in order to keep up appearances in his favor he was just the man that a clever tactful woman could have managed perfectly beginning early in his life as catherine did catherine for all her goodness of heart and exalted piety, was, as we have seen, none too scrupulous herself. And if her ability and dexterity had been equal to her opportunities, she might have kept Henry in bondage for life. But even before her growing age and fading charms had made her distasteful to her husband, her lack of prudence and management towards him had caused him to turn to others for the guidance that she might still have exercised. The first rift of which we hear came less than a year after the marriage. Friar Diego, who was now Catherine's chancellor, wrote an extraordinary letter to King Ferdinand in May 1510, telling him of a miscarriage that Catherine had had at the end of January. The affair, he says, having been so secret that no one knew it but the king, two Spanish women, the physician, and himself. And the details he furnishes show him to have been as ignorant as he was impudent. Incidentally, however, he says, quote, Her Highness is very healthy and the most beautiful creature in the world, with the greatest gaiety and contentment that ever was. The king adores her, and her highness him. End quote. But with this letter to the king went another to his secretary, Almazan, from the new Spanish ambassador, Carroz, who complains bitterly that the friar monopolizes the queen entirely and prevents his access to her. He then proceeds to tell of Henry and Catherine's first matrimonial tiff. The two married sisters of the Duke of Buckingham were at court, one being a close friend of Catherine, whilst the other was said to be carrying on an intrigue with the king, through his favorite, Sir William Compton. This lady's family, and especially her brother the Duke, who had a violent altercation with Compton, and her sister the queen's friend, shocked at the scandal, carried her away to a convent in the country. In revenge for this, the king sent the queen's favorite away and quarreled with Catherine, 
Carraz was all for counseling prudence and diplomacy to the queen, but he complains that Friar Diego was advising her badly and putting her on bad terms with her husband. Many false alarms, mostly, it would seem, set afloat by the meddling friar, and dwelt upon by him in his letters with quite unbecoming minuteness, kept the court agog as to the possibility of an heir to the crown being born. Henry himself, who was always fond of children, was desperately anxious for a son, and when, on New Year's Day, 1511, the looked-for heir was born at Richmond, the king's unrestrained rejoicing again took his favorite form of sumptuous entertainments, after he had ridden to the shrine of Our Lady at Walsingham in Norfolk to give thanks for the favor vouchsafed to him. Once again Westminster glittered with cloth of gold and gems and velvet. Once again courtiers came to the lists, disguised as hermits, to kneel before Catherine, and then to cast off their gowns and stand in full panoply before her, craving for leave to tilt in her honor. Once again, fairy bowers of gold and artificial flowers sheltered sylvan beauties richly bedizened, the king and his favorites standing by in purple satin garments with the solid gold initials of himself and his wife sewn upon them. Whilst the dazzling company was dancing, the scenery was rolled back. It came too near the crowd of lieges at the end of the hall, and pilfering fingers began to pluck the golden ornaments from the bowers. Emboldened by their immunity for this, people broke the bounds, swarmed into the central space, and in the twinkling of an eye, all the lords and ladies, even the king himself, found themselves stripped of their finery to their very shirts the golden letters and precious tissues intended as presents for fine ladies being plunder now in grimy hands that turned them doubtless to better account henry in his bluff fashion made the best of it and called the booty largesse little wrecked he if the tiny heir whose existence fed his vanity throve but the babe died soon after this costly celebration of his birth. During the ascendancy that the anticipated coming of a son gave to Catherine, Ferdinand was able to beguile Henry into an offensive league against France by using the same bait that had so often served a similar purpose with Henry the Seventh, namely the reconquest for England of guiana and normandy spain the empire the papacy and england formed a coalition that boded ill for the french cause in italy as usual the showy but barren part fell to henry ferdinand promised him soldiers to conquer normandy but they never came all ferdinand wanted was to keep as many frenchmen as possible from his own battlegrounds, and he found plenty of opportunities for evading all his pledges. Henry was flattered to the top of his bent. The Pope sent him the blessed Golden Rose and saluted him as head of the Italian League, and the young king, fired with martial ardor, allowed himself to be dragged into war by his wife's connections in opposition to the opinion of the wiser heads in his council a war with france involved hostilities with scotland but henry was in the autumn of fifteen twelve cajoled into depleting his realm of troops and sending an army to spain to attack france over the pyrenees whilst another force under poinings went to help the allies against the duke of Geldris. The former host under the Marquis of Dorset was kept idle by its commander because it was found that Ferdinand really required them to reduce the Spanish kingdom of Navarre, and after months of inactivity and much mortality from sickness, 
they returned ingloriously home to england this was henry's first experience of armed alliances but he learned nothing by experience and to the end of his life the results of such coalitions to him were always the same but his ambition was still unappeased and in june fifteen thirteen he in person led his army across the channel to conquer france his conduct in the campaign was puerile in its vanity and folly and ended lamely with the capture of two to him unimportant fortresses in the north theren and tonnay and the panic flight of the french at the battle of the spurs or Gwingate. our business with this foolish and fruitless campaign in which henry was every one's tool is confined to the part that catherine played at the time on the king's ostentatious departure from dover he left catherine regent of the realm with the earl of surrey afterwards duke of norfolk to command the army in the north catherine we are told rode back from dover to london full of dolor for her lord's departure but we see her in her element during the subsequent months of her regency bold and spirited and it must be added utterly tactless she revelled in the independent domination which she enjoyed james the fourth of scotland had threatened that an english invasion of france would be followed by his own invasion of england let him do it in god's name shouted henry and catherine when the threat was made good delivered a splendid oration in english to the officers who were going north to fight the scots remember she said that the lord smiled upon those who stood in defence of their own remember that the english courage excels that of all other nations upon earth her letters to wolsey who accompanied henry as almoner or rather secretary are full of courage and as full of womanly anxiety for her husband she was troubled she wrote to learn that the king was so near the siege of therein until wolsey's letter assured her of the heed he takes to avoid all manner of dangers quote, with his life and health nothing can come amiss with him without them i see no manner of good things that shall fall after it End quote but her tactlessness even in this letter shows clearly when she boasts that the king in france is not so busy with war as she is in england against the scots quote, my heart is very good of it and i am horribly busy making standards banners and badges End quote. after congratulating henry effusively upon the capture of therein and his meeting with the emperor catherine herself set forth with reinforcements towards scotland but before she had travelled a hundred miles to woburn she met the couriers galloping south to bring her the great news of surrey's victory at flodden field turning aside to thank our lady of walsingham for the destruction of the scottish power catherine on the way sent the jubilant news to henry james the fourth and his defeat had been left dead upon the field clad in his check surcoat and a fragment of this coat soaked with blood the queen sent to her husband in france with a heartless jibe at his dead brother-in-law we are told that in another of her letters first giving the news of flodden and referring to henry's capture of the duke of longueville at Thuren, she vaingloriously compared her victory with his quote, it was no great thing for one armed man to take another but she was sending three captured by a woman if he henry sent her a captive duke she would send him a prisoner king End quote. for a wife and locum tenens to write thus 
in such circumstances to a supremely vain man like henry whose martial ambition was still unassuaged was to invite his jealousy and dislike his people saw as he with all his boastfulness cannot fail to have done that flodden was the real english victory not therein and that catherine and surrey not henry were the heroes such knowledge was gall and wormwood to the king and especially when the smoke of battle had blown away and he saw how he had been sold by his wife's relations who kept the fruit of victory whilst he was put off with the shell from that time catherine's influence over her husband weakened though with occasional intermission and he looked for guidance to a subtler mind than hers with henry to france had gone thomas wolsey one of the clergy of the royal chapel recently appointed almoner by the patronage of fox bishop of winchester henry's leading counsellor in foreign affairs the english nobles strong as they still were territorially could not be trusted with the guidance of affairs by a comparatively new dynasty depending upon parliament and the towns for its power and an official class raised at the will of the sovereign had been created by henry the seventh to be used as ministers and administrators such a class dependent entirely upon the crown were certain to be distasteful to the noble families and the rivalry between these two governing elements provided the germ of party divisions which subsequently hardened into the english constitutional tradition the officials usually being favorable to the strengthening of the royal prerogative and the nobles desiring to maintain the check which the armed power of feudalism had formerly exercised for reasons which will be obvious the choice of both henry the seventh and his son of their diplomatists and ministers fell to a great extent upon clergymen and wolsey's brilliant talents and facile adaptiveness during his close attendance upon henry in france captivated his master who needed for a minister and guide one that could never become a rival either in the field or the ladies chamber where the king most desired distinction henry came home in october fifteen thirteen bitterly enraged against catherine's kin and ripe for the close alliance with france which the prisoner duke of longueville soon managed to bring about what mattered it that lovely young mary tudor was sacrificed in marriage to the decrepit old king louis the twelfth notwithstanding her previous solemn betrothal to catherine's nephew young charles of austria and her secret love for henry's bosom friend sir charles brandon princesses were but pieces in the great political game and must perforce take the rough with the smooth henry in any case could thus show to the spaniard that he could defy him by a french connection it must have been with a sad heart that catherine took part in the triumphal doings that celebrated the peace directed against her father the french agents then in london in describing her say that she was lively and gracious quite the opposite of her gloomy sister and doubtless she did her best to appear so for she was proud and schooled to disappointment but with the exception of the fact that she was again with child all around her looked black her husband openly taunted her with her father's ill faith henry was carrying on now an open intrigue with lady talibois whom he had brought from calais with him ferdinand the catholic at last was slowly dying all his dreams and hopes frustrated and on the thirteenth august fifteen fourteen in the palace of greenwich 
Catherine's dear friend and sister-in-law, Mary Tudor, was married, by proxy, to Louis the Twelfth. Catherine, led by the Duke of Longville, attended the festivity. She was dressed in ash-colored satin, covered with raised gold embroidery, costly chains and necklaces of gems covered her neck and bust, and a coif trimmed with precious stones was on her head. The king at the ball in the evening charmed everyone by his graceful dancing, and the scene was so gay that the grave Venetian ambassador says that, had it not been for his age and office, he would have cast off his gown and footed it with the rest. But already sinister whispers were rife, and we may be sure they were not unknown to Catherine. She had been married five years, and no child of hers had lived, and, though she was again pregnant, it was said that the Pope would be asked to authorize Henry to put her aside and to marry a French bride. Had not his new French brother-in-law done the like years ago? To what extent this idea had really entered Henry's head at the time, it is difficult to say, but courtiers and diplomatists have keen eyes, and they must have known which way the wind was blowing before they talked thus. In October 1514, Catherine was born slowly in a litter to Dover, with the great concourse that went to speed Mary Tudor on her loveless two months' marriage. And a few weeks afterwards, Catherine gave birth prematurely to a dead child. Once more the hopes of Henry were dashed, and though Peter Martyr ascribed the misfortune to Henry's unkindness, the superstitious time servers of the king, and those in favor of the French alliance, began to hint that Catherine's offspring were accursed, and that, to get an heir, the king must take another wife. The doings at court were still as brilliant and as frivolous as ever, the king's great delight being in adopting some magnificent and, of course, perfectly transparent disguise in mask or ball, and then to disclose himself when everyone, the queen included, was supposed to be lost in wonder at the grace and agility of the pretended unknown. Those who take pleasure in the details of such puerility may be referred to Hall's Chronicle for them. We here have more to do with the hearts beneath the finery than with the trappings themselves. That Catherine was striving desperately at this time to retain her influence over her husband and her popularity in England is certain from the letter of Ferdinand's ambassador, 6th December, 1514. He complains that, on the recommendation of Friar Diego, Catherine had thrown over her father's interests in order to keep the love of Henry and his people. The Castilian interest and the Manuels have captured her, wrote the ambassador, and if Ferdinand did not promptly, quote, put a bridle on this colt, end quote, i.e. Henry, and bring Catherine to her bearings as her father's daughter, England would be forever lost to Aragon. There is no doubt that, at this time, Catherine felt that her only chance of keeping her footing was to please Henry and forget Spain, as Friar Diego advised her to do. When the King of France died on New Year's Day, 1515, and his young widow, Catherine's friend Mary Tudor, clandestinely married her lover, Charles Brandon, Catherine's efforts to reconcile her husband to the peccant pair are evidence, if no other existed, that Henry's anger was more assumed than real, and that his vanity was pleased by the submissive prayers for his forgiveness. As no doubt the Queen and Wolsey, who had joined his efforts with hers, foresaw 
not only were mary and brandon pardoned but taken into high favor at the public marriage of mary and brandon at greenwich at easter fifteen fifteen more tournaments masks and balls enabled the king to show off his gallantry and agility in competition with his new brother-in-law and on the subsequent may day at shooter's hill catherine and mary who were inseparable took part in elaborate and costly alfresco entertainments in which robin hood several pagan deities and the various attributes of spring were paraded for their delectation it all sounds very gay though somewhat silly as we read the endless catalogues of bedizenment of tilts and races feasting dancing and music that delighted henry and his friends but before catherine there ever hovered the spectre of her childlessness and henry after the ceremonial gaiety and overdone gallantry to his wife would too frequently put spurs to his courser and gallop off to new hall in essex where lady talibois lived a gleam of hope and happiness came to her late in fifteen fifteen when she was again expecting to become a mother by liberal gifts the greatest presents ever brought to england said henry himself and by flattery unlimited ferdinand almost on his deathbed managed to bridle his son-in-law to borrow a large sum of money from him and draw him anew into a coalition against france but the hope was soon dashed king ferdinand died almost simultaneously with the birth of a girl child to his daughter catherine it is true the babe was like to live but a son not a daughter was what henry wanted yet he put the best face on the matter publicly the venetian ambassador purposely delayed his congratulations because the child was of the wrong sex and when finally he coldly offered them he pointedly told the king that they would have been much more hardy if the child had been a son we are both young replied henry if it is a daughter this time by the grace of god sons will follow the desire of the king for a male heir was perfectly natural no queen had reigned independently over england and for the perpetuation of a new dynasty like the tudors the succession in the male line was of the highest importance in addition to this henry was above all things proud of his manliness and he looked upon the absence of a son as in some sort reflecting a humiliation upon him catherine's health had never been robust and at the age of thirty-three after four confinements she had lost her bloom disappointment and suffering added to her constitutional weakness was telling upon her and her influence grew daily smaller the gorgeous shows and frivolous amusements in which her husband so much delighted palled upon her and she now took little pains to feign enjoyment in them giving up much of her time to religious exercises fasting rigidly twice a week and saints days throughout the year in addition to the lenten observances and wearing beneath her silks and satins a rough franciscan nun's gown of serge as in the case of so many of her kindred mystical devotion was weaving its gray web about her and saintliness in the secular spanish type was covering her as with a garment henry on the contrary was a full-blooded young man of twenty-eight with a physique like that of a butcher held by no earthly control or check upon his appetites overflowing with vitality and the joy of life and it is not to be wondered at that he found his disillusioned and consciously saintly wife a somewhat uncomfortable companion end of section six
Section 7 of The Wives of Henry the Eighth in the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1509 through 1527. Catherine the Queen. A Political Marriage and a Personal Divorce. Part 2. The Death of Louis the Twelfth, Maximilian and ferdinand and the peaceful accession of young charles to the throne of spain and the prospective imperial crown entirely altered the political aspect of europe francis i needed peace in the first years of his reign and to charles it was also desirable in order that his rule over turbulent spain could be firmly established and his imperial succession secured all the english ministers and counsellors were heavily bribed by france wolsey himself was strongly in favour of the french connection and everybody entered into a conspiracy to flatter henry the natural result was a league first of england and france and subsequently a general peace to which all the principal christian potentates subscribed and men thought that the millennium had come catherine's international importance had disappeared with the death of her father and the accession of charles to the throne of aragon as well as to that of castile wolsey was now henry's sole adviser in matters of state and managed his master dexterously whilst endeavouring not entirely to offend the queen glimpses of his harmonious relations with catherine at this time fifteen sixteen through fifteen twenty are numerous at the splendid christening of the princess mary wolsey was one of the sponsors and he was gossip with catherine at the baptism of mary tudor duchess of suffolk's son nor can the queen's famous action after the evil may day fifteen seventeen have been opposed or discountenanced by the cardinal the universal peace had brought to london hosts of foreigners especially frenchmen and the alien question was acute wolsey whose sudden rise and insolence had deeply angered the nobles had as principal promoter of the unpopular peace with france to bear a full share of the detestation in which his friends the aliens were held late in april there were rumors that a general attack upon foreigners by the younger citizens would be made and at wolsey's instance the civic authorities ordered that all londoners should be kept indoors some lads in chepa disregarded the command and the aldermen of the ward attempted to arrest one of them then rose the cry of prentices and clubs death to the cardinal and forth there poured from lane and alley riotous youngsters by the hundred to wreak vengeance on the insolent foreigners who took the bread out of worthy englishmen's mouths sack and pillage reigned for a few hours but the guard quelled the boys with blood the king rode hastily from richmond the lieutenant of the tower dropped a few casual cannonballs into the city and before sunset all was quiet the gibbets rose at the street corners and a bloody vengeance fell upon the rioters dozens were hanged drawn and quartered with atrocious cruelty and under the ruthless duke of norfolk four hundred more were condemned to death for treason to the king who it was bitterly said in london loved outlanders better than his own folk it is unlikely that henry really meant to plunge all his capital in mourning by hanging the flower of its youth but he loved for vanity's sake that his clemency should be publicly sought and to act the part of a deity in restoring to life those legally dead in any case catherine's spontaneous and determined intercession for the prentice lads would take no denial and she pleaded with effect 
her intercession nevertheless could hardly have been so successful as it was if wolsey had been opposed to it and the subsequent comedy in the great hall at westminster on the twenty second may was doubtless planned to afford henry an opportunity of appearing in his favorite character seated upon a canopied throne high upon a dais of brocade surrounded by his prelates and nobles and with wolsey by his side henry frowned in crimson velvet whilst the quote, poor younglings and old false knaves end quote, trooped in a sorry procession stripped to their shirts with halters around their necks wolsey in stern words rebuked their crime and scolded the lord mayor and aldermen for their laxity ending by saying they all deserved to hang mercy gracious lord mercy cried the terrified boys and their distracted mothers behind and the cardinal and the peers knelt before the throne to beg the life of the offenders which the king granted and with a great shout of joy halters were stripped from many a callow neck and cast into the rafters of the hall for very joy but all men knew and the mothers too that wolsey's intercession was only make-believe and that what they saw was but the ceremonial act of grace the queen they thanked in their hearts and not the haughty cardinal for the king had pardoned the apprentices privately days before when catherine and her two sisters-in-law the widowed queens of france and scotland had knelt before the king in unfeigned tears and had clamoured for the lives of the londoners to the day of the queen's unhappy death this debt was never forgotten by the citizens who loved her faithfully to the end far better than any of her successors the sweating sickness in the autumn of fifteen seventeen sent henry and his wife as far away from contagion as possible for sickness always frightened the big bully into a panic during his absence from london wolsey was busy negotiating a still closer alliance with france by the marriage of the baby princess mary to the newly born dauphin it can hardly have been the match that catherine would have chosen for her cherished only child but she was a cipher by the side of wolsey now and made no open move against it at the time early in the spring of fifteen eighteen the plague broke out again and henry in dire fear started upon a progress in the midlands richard pace who accompanied him wrote to wolsey on the twelfth april telling him as a secret that the queen was again pregnant i pray heartily he continued that it may be a prince to the surety and universal comfort of the realm and he begs the cardinal to write a kind letter to the queen in june the glad tidings were further confirmed as likely to result in quote, an event most earnestly desired by the whole kingdom end quote. still dodging the contagion the king almost fled from one place to another and when at woodstock in july henry himself wrote a letter to wolsey which tells in every line how anxious he was that the coming event should be the fulfilment of his ardent hope catherine had awaited him at woodstock and he had been rejoiced at the confident hope she gave him he tells wolsey the news formally and says that he will remove the queen as little and as quietly as may be to avoid risk soon all the diplomatists were speculating at the great things that would happen when the looked-for prince was born and it was probably the confident hope that this time henry would not be disappointed that made possible the success of wolsey's policy and the marriage of the princess mary with the infant dauphin of wolsey's magnificent feasts that accompanied the ratification of peace in the betrothal on the fifth october feasts more splendid says the venetian ambassador than ever were given by caligula or cleopatra 
no account can be given here it was wolsey's great triumph and he surpassed all the records of luxury in england in its celebration the sweet little bride dressed in cloth of gold stood before the thrones upon which her father and mother sat in the great hall of greenwich and then carried in the arms of a prelate was held up whilst the cardinal slipped the diamond wedding ring upon her finger and blessed her nuptials with the baby bridegroom that the heir of france should marry the heiress of england was a danger to the balance of europe and especially a blow to spain it was moreover not a match which england could regard with equanimity for a french king consort would have been repugnant to the whole nation and henry could never have meant to conclude the marriage finally unless the expected heir was born but alas for human hopes on the night of tenth november fifteen eighteen catherine was delivered of a daughter quote, to the vexation of as many as knew it end quote. and king and nation mourned together now that after all a frenchman might reign over england to catherine this last disappointment was bitter indeed her husband wounded and irritated first in his pride and now in his national interests avoided her her own country and kin had lost the english tie that meant so much to them and she herself in poor health and waning attractions could only mourn her misfortunes and cling more closely than ever to her one darling child mary for the new undesired infant girl had died as soon as it was born the ceaseless round of masking mummery and dancing which so much captivated henry went on without abatement and catherine perforce had to take her part in it but all the king's tenderness was now shown not to his wife but to his little daughter whom he carried about in his arms and praised inordinately so frivolous and familiar indeed had henry's behaviour grown that his counsel took fright and under the thin veil of complaints against the behaviour of his boon companions carew peachy wingfield and bryan who were banished from court they took henry himself seriously to task the four french hostages held for the payment of the war indemnity were also feasted and entertained so familiarly by henry under wolsey's influence as to cause deep discontent to the lieges who had always looked upon france as an enemy and knew that the unpopular cardinal's overwhelming display was paid for by french bribes at one such entertainment catherine was made to act as hostess at her dower house of havering in essex where in the summer of fifteen nineteen we are told that quote, for their welcoming she purveyed all things in the most liberalist manner and especially she made to the king such a sumptuous banquet that he thanked her heartily and the strangers gave it great praise End quote. later in the same year catherine was present at a grand series of entertainments given by the king in the splendid new manor house which he had built for lady talibois who had just rejoiced him by giving birth to a son we have no record of catherine's thoughts as she took part here in the tedious foolery so minutely described by hall she plucked off the masks we are told of eight disguised dancers in long dominoes of blue satin and gold quote, who danced with the ladies sadly and communed not with them after the fashion of maskers End quote of course the masqueraders were the duke of suffolk brandon and other great nobles as the poor queen must well have known but when she thought that all this mummery was to entertain frenchmen and the house in which it passed 
was devoted to the use of Henry's mistress, she must have covered her own heart with a more impenetrable mask than those of Suffolk and his companions, if her face was attuned to the gay sights and sounds around her. Catherine had now almost ceased to strive for the objects to which her life had been sacrificed, namely, the binding together of England and Spain to the detriment of France. Wolsey had believed that his own interests would be better served by a close French alliance, and he had had his way. Henry himself was but the vainglorious figure in the international pageant. The motive power was the cardinal. But a greater than Wolsey, Charles of Austria and Spain, though he was as yet only a lad of nineteen, had appeared upon the scene, and soon was to make his power felt throughout the world. Wolsey's close union with France, and the marriage of the Princess Mary with the Dauphin, had been met as a blow to Spain, to lead, if possible, to the election of Henry to the imperial crown, in succession to Maximilian instead of the latter's grandson charles if the king of england were made emperor the way of the cardinal of york to the throne of saint peter was clear henry was flattered at the idea and was ready to follow his minister anywhere to gain such a showy prize but quite early in the struggle it was seen that the unpopular french alliance which had already cost England the surrender of the king's conquests in the war, was powerless to bring about the result desired. Francis I, as vain and turbulent as Henry, and perhaps more able, was bidding high for the empire himself. His success in the election would have been disastrous both to Spain and England, and yet the French alliance was too dear to Wolsey to be easily relinquished and francis was assured that all the interest of his dear brother of england should be cast in his favor whilst with much more truth the spanish candidate was plied with good wishes for his success and underhand attempts were made at the same time to gain the electors for the king of england wolsey hoped thus to win in any case and up to a certain point he did so for he gave to charles the encouragement he needed for the masterly move which soon after revolutionized political relations charles at this time fifteen nineteen young as he was had already developed his marvelous mental and physical powers patient and self-centered with all his aragonese grandfather's subtlety he possessed infinitely greater boldness and width of view he knew well that the seven prince electors who chose the emperor might like other men be bought if enough money could be found to provide it and give to him the dominant power of the world he was ready to crush the ancient liberties of castile to squeeze his Italian and Flemish dominions of their last obtainable ducat, for he knew that his success in the election would dazzle his subjects until they forgot what they had paid for it. And so it happened. Where Francis bribed in hundreds, Charles bribed in thousands. And England, in the conflict of money bags and great territorial interests, hardly counted at all. When Charles was elected emperor in June 1519, Henry professed himself delighted, but it meant that the universal peace that had been proclaimed with such a flourish of trumpets only three years before was already tottering, and that England must soon make a choice as to which of the two great rivals should be her friend and which her enemy. Francis nursed his wrath to keep it warm, and did his best to retain Henry and Wolsey on his side. Bribes and pensions flowed freely from France upon English counsellors. The inviolable love of Henry and Francis 
alike in gallantry and age was insisted upon again and again the three-year-old princess mary was referred to always as dauphiness and future queen of france though when the little dauphin was spoken of as future king of england henry's subjects pulled a wry face and cursed all frenchmen a meeting between the two allies which for its splendor should surpass all other regal displays was constantly urged by the french hostages in england by order of francis as a means of showing to the world that he could count upon henry to the latter the meeting was agreeable as a tribute to his power and as a satisfaction to his love of show and to wolsey it was useful as enhancing his sale value in the eyes of two lavish bidders to charles who shared none of the frivolous tastes of his rival sovereigns it only appealed as a design against him to be forestalled and defeated when therefore the preparations for the field of the cloth of gold were in full swing early in the year fifteen twenty charles by a brilliant though risky move such as his father philip would have loved took the first step to win england to his side in the now inevitable struggle for supremacy between the empire and france whilst he was still wrangling with his indignant castilian parliament in march charles sent envoys to england to propose a friendly meeting with henry whilst on his way by sea from spain to flanders it was catherine's chance and she made the most of it she had suffered long and patiently whilst the french friendship was paramount but if god would vouchsafe her the boon of seeing her nephew in england it would she said to his envoys be the measure of her desires wolsey too smiled upon the suggestion for failing francis the new emperor in time might help him to the papacy so with all secrecy a solemn treaty was signed on the eleventh april fifteen twenty settling down to the smallest details the reception of charles by henry and catherine at sandwich and canterbury on his voyage or else at a subsequent meeting of the monarchs between calais and Gavlina. it was late in may when news came from the west that the spanish fleet was sailing up the channel and henry was riding towards the sea from london ostensibly to embark for france when he learnt that the emperor's ships were becalmed off dover wolsey was dispatched post haste to greet the imperial visitor and invite him to land and charles surrounded by a gorgeous suite of lords and ladies with the black eagle of austria on cloth of gold fluttering over and around him was conducted to dover castle where before dawn next morning the twenty seventh may henry arrived and welcomed his nephew there was no mistaking the cordiality of the english cheers that rang in peals from dover to canterbury and through the ancient city as the two monarchs rode side by side in gorgeous array they meant as clearly as tone could speak that the enemy of france and queen catherine's nephew was the friend for the english people whatever the cardinal of york might think to catherine it was a period of rejoicing and her thoughts were high as she welcomed her sister's son the sallow young man with yellow hair already in title the greatest monarch in the world though beset with difficulties by her stood beautiful mary tudor duchess of suffolk twice married since she had as a child been betrothed under such heavy guarantees to charles himself and holding her mother's hand was the other mary tudor a prim quaint little maid of four with big brown eyes already great plans for her filled her mother's brain true she was betrothed to the dolphin but what if the hateful french match fell through and the emperor 
he of her own kin were to seal a national alliance by marrying the daughter of england charles feasted for four days at canterbury and then went on his way amidst loving plaudits to his ships at sandwich but before he sailed he whispered that to wolsey which made the cardinal his servant for the emperor suzerain of italy and king of naples sicily and spain might do more than a king of france in future towards making a pope by the time that henry and francis met early in june on the ever memorable field between ardra and gisna the riot of splendor which surrounded the sovereigns and wolsey though it dazzled the crowd and left its mark upon history as a pageant was known to the principal actors of the scene to be but hollow mockery the glittering baubles that the two kings loved the courtly dallying the pompous ceremony the masks and devices to symbolize eternal amity were not more evanescent than the love they were supposed to perpetuate catherine went through her ceremonial part of the show as a duty and graciously received the visit of francis in the wonderful flimsy palace of wood drapery and glass at gisna but her heart was across the flemish frontier a few miles away where her nephew awaited the coming of the king of england to greet him as his kinsman and future ally Gavlina was a poor place but charles had other ways of influencing people than by piling up gewgaws before them a single day of rough hearty feasting was an agreeable relief to henry after the glittering insincerity of gisna in the four days following in which charles was entertained at calais as the guest of henry and catherine made up in prodigality for the coarseness of the flemish fare whilst wolsey who was already posing as the arbitrator between all christian potentates was secured to the side of the emperor in future by a grant of the bulk of the income from two spanish bishoprics badajof and palencia already the two great rivals were bidding against each other for allies and charles though his resources were less concentrated than those of francis could promise most leo x for his own territorial ambition and in fear of luther rallied to the side of the emperor the german princes seconded their suzerain and the great struggle for the supremacy of christendom began in march fifteen twenty one england by treaty was bound to assist france but this did not suit wolsey or henry in their new mood and the cardinal pressed his arbitration on the combatants francis reluctantly consented to negotiate but minds were aflame with a subject that added fierceness to the political rivalry between charles and francis the young emperor when he had met the german princes at worms april fifteen twenty one had thrown down the gauge to luther and thenceforward it was war to the knife between the old faith and the new spirit henry we may be certain to the delight of catherine violently attacked luther in his famous book and was flattered by the fulsome praises of the pope and the emperor in the circumstances wolsey's voyage to calais for the furtherance of arbitration was turned into one to conclude an armed alliance with charles and the pope the cardinal who had bent all others to his will was himself bent by the emperor and the arbitrator between two monarchs became the servant of one by the treaty signed at Baruchus by wolsey for henry charles contracted an engagement to marry his little cousin princess mary and to visit england for a formal betrothal in the following year how completely wolsey had at this time surrendered himself to the emperor is evident from catherine's new attitude towards him during his period of french sympathy she had been 
as we have seen practically alienated from state affairs but now in henry's letters to wolsey her name is frequently mentioned and her advice was evidently welcome during his absence in flanders for instance wolsey received a letter from henry in which the king says quote, the queen my wife hath desired me to make her most hearty recommendation unto you as to him that she loveth very well and both she and i would fain know when you would repair unto us End quote. great news came that the emperor and his allies were brilliantly successful in the war but in the midst of victory the great medici pope leo the tenth though still a man in his prime died there is no doubt that a secret promise had been made by charles to wolsey of his support in case a vacancy in the papacy arose but no one had dreamed of its occurring so quickly and charles found his hand forced he needed for his purpose a far more pliable instrument in the pontifical chair than the haughty cardinal of york so whilst pretending to work strenuously to promote wolsey's elevation and thus to gain the good will of henry and his minister he took care secretly that some humbler candidate such as the one ultimately chosen by the conclave his old schoolmaster cardinal adrian should be the new pope wolsey was somewhat sulky at the result of the election and thenceforward looked with more distrust on the imperial connection but withal he put as good a face on the matter as possible and when at the end of may fifteen twenty two he again welcomed the emperor in henry's name as he set foot on english soil at dover the cardinal though watchful was still favorable to the alliance this visit of the young emperor was the most splendid royal sojourn ever made in england and henry revelled in the ceremonies wherein he was the host of the greatest monarch upon earth End of section 7section eight of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen o nine through fifteen twenty seven catherine the queen a political marriage and a personal divorce part three charles came with a train of a thousand horse and two thousand courtiers and to feed and house such a multitude the guilds of london and even the principal citizens were obliged to make return of all their spare beds and stocks of provisions in order to provide for the strangers the journey of the monarchs was a triumphal progress from dover through canterbury sittingbourne and rochester to gravesend on the downs between dover and canterbury henry and a great train of nobles was to have met his nephew but the more to do him honour the king rode into dover itself and with pride showed his visitor his new great ship the hairy grace adieu and the rest of the english fleet whereupon quote, the emperor and his lords much praised the making of the ships and especially the artillery they said they had never seen ships so armed End quote. from gravesend the gallant company rode in the royal barges amidst salvos of guns to greenwich there at the hall door of the palace stood catherine surrounded by her ladies and holding her tiny daughter by the hand sinking upon one knee the emperor craved his aunt's blessing which was given and thenceforward for five weeks the feasting and glorious shows went on without intermission on the second day after the arrival at greenwich whilst henry was arming for a joust a courier all travel-stained and weary demanded prompt audience 
to hand the king a letter from his ambassador in france the king read the despatch with knitted brows and turning to his friend sir william compton said go and tell the emperor i have news for him when charles came the letter was handed to him and it must have rejoiced his heart as he read it francis bade defiance to the king of england and thenceforward henry and the emperor were allies in arms against a common enemy glittering pageants followed in london and windsor where charles sat as knight of the garter under triumphant henry's presidency masks and dances banquets and hunting delighted the host and surprised the guests with the unrestrained lavishness of the welcome but we may be certain that what chiefly interested catherine and her nephew was not this costly trifling but the eternal friendship between england and spain solemnly sworn upon the sacrament in st george's chapel windsor by the emperor and henry and the binding alliance between them in peace and war cemented by the pledge that charles should marry his cousin mary tudor and no one else in the world it was catherine's final and greatest triumph and the shadows fell thick and fast thereafter henry promptly took his usual showy and unprofitable part in the war only a few weeks after the emperor bade his new ally farewell an english force invaded picardy and the earl of surrey's fleet threatened all french shipping in the channel coerced by the king of england too venice deserted france and joined forces with the allies the new pope and the italian princes did the same and the emperor's arms carried all before them in italy henry was kept faithful to his ally by the vain hope of a dismemberment of france in which he should be the principal gainer the pope clement the seventh the ambitious medici who succeeded adrian in september fifteen twenty three hungered for fresh territory which charles alone could give him the rebel de bourbon the greatest soldier of france was fighting against his own king and in february fifteen twenty five the crushing blow of pavia fell and francis quote, all lost except honor end quote, was a prisoner in the hands of his enemy who looking over christendom saw none to say him nay but the bold monk at wittenberg three years of costly war for interests not primarily their own had already disillusioned the english people by methods more violent and tyrannical than ever had been adopted by any previous king henry had wrung from parliament supplies so oppressive and extortionate for the purposes of the war as to disgust and incense the whole country wolsey too had been for the second time beguiled about the papacy he coveted and knew now that he could not trust the emperor to serve any interests but his own the french collapse at pavia moreover and pity for the captive francis languishing at madrid had caused in england and elsewhere a reaction in his favor henry himself was as was his wont violently angry at the cynical way in which his own hopes in france were shelved by charles and the pope alarmed now at the emperor's unchecked dominion in italy and the insufficient share of the spoil offered to him also began to look askance at his ally so notwithstanding the official rejoicings in england when the news of pavia came and the revived plan of henry and wolsey to join bourbon in his intention to dismember france with or without the aid of charles the archbishop of canterbury warham correctly interpreted the prevailing opinion in england in his letter to wolsey 
quoted by hallam saying that the people had quote, more cause to weep than to rejoice end quote, at the french defeat the renewed extortionate demands for money aroused in england discontent so dangerous as to reach rebellion against the king's officers risings in kent and the eastern counties and the outspoken remonstrances of the leaders of the middle and working classes at length convinced wolsey and through him the king that a change of policy was inevitable england once more had been made the cat's paw of spain and now with an empty exchequer and a profoundly discontented people was obliged again to shift its balance to the side which promised the best hopes for peace and to redress the equilibrium in europe upon which the english power depended france was still rich in resources and was made to pay or rather promise the vast sum of two million crowns in instalments and an annuity of a hundred thousand a year to the king for england's friendship whilst francis was forced to abandon all his claims on italy and burgundy january fifteen twenty six and mary the emperor's sister leonora before he was permitted to return to france at peace once more it is true that every party to the treaties endeavored to evade the fulfillment of his pledges but that was the custom of the times the point that interests us here is that the new policy now actively pursued by wolsey of close friendship with france necessarily meant the ruin of catherine unless she was dexterous and adaptable enough either to reverse the policy or openly espouse it unfortunately she did neither she was now forty-one years of age and had ceased for nearly two years to cohabit with her husband her health was bad she had grown stout and her comeliness had departed all hopes of her giving to the king the son and heir for whom he so ardently craved had quite vanished and with them much of her personal hold upon her husband to her alarm and chagrin henry as if in despair of being succeeded by a legitimate heir in 1525 before signing the new alliance with france had created his dearly loved natural son henry fitzroy a duke under the royal title of duke of richmond which had been born by his father and catherine not without reason feared the king's intention to depose her daughter the betrothed of the emperor in favor of an english bastard we have in previous pages noticed the peculiar absence of tact and flexibility in catherine's character and wolsey's ostentatious french leanings after fifteen twenty five were met by the queen with open opposition and acrimonious reproach instead of by temporizing wiliness the emperor's off-hand treatment of his betrothed bride mary tudor further embittered catherine who was thus surrounded on every side by disillusionment and disappointment charles sent commissioners to england just before the battle of pavia to demand amongst other unamiable requirements the prompt sending of mary who was only nine years old to flanders with an increased dowry this was no part of the agreement and was as no doubt charles foresaw and desired certain to be refused the envoys received from henry and catherine and more emphatically from wolsey a negative answer to the request mary being as they said the greatest treasure they had for whom no hostages would be sufficient catherine would not let her nephew slip out of his engagement without a struggle mary herself was made soon after 
to send a fine emerald to her betrothed with a grand message to the effect that when they came together she would be able to know i e by the clearness or otherwise of the gem quote, whether his majesty do keep himself as continent and chaste as with god's grace she will End quote. as at this time the emperor was a man of twenty-five whilst his bride had not reached ten years the cases were hardly parallel and within three months in july fifteen twenty five charles had betrothed himself to his cousin of portugal the treaty that had been so solemnly sworn to on the altar at windsor only three years before had thus become so much waste paper and catherine's best hopes for her child and herself were finally defeated a still greater trial for her followed for whilst wolsey was drawing nearer and nearer to france and the king himself was becoming more distant from his wife every day the little princess was taken from the loving care of her mother and sent to reside in her principality of wales thenceforward the life of catherine was a painful martyrdom without one break in the monotony of misfortune catherine appears never to have been unduly jealous of henry's various mistresses she one of the proudest princesses in christendom probably considered them quite beneath her notice and as usual adjuncts to a sovereign's establishment henry moreover was far from being a generous or complacent lover and allowed his lady favorites no great social or political power such as that wielded by the mistresses of francis i lady talibois eleanor blount made no figure at court and mary boleyn the wife of william carey a quite undistinguished courtier who had been henry's mistress from about fifteen twenty one was always impecunious and sometimes disreputable though her greedy father reaped a rich harvest from his daughter's attractions catherine evidently troubled herself very little about such infidelity on the part of her husband and certainly wolsey had no objection the real anxiety of the queen arose from henry's ardent desire for a legitimate son which she could not hope to give him and wolsey with his eyes constantly fixed on the papacy decided to make political capital and influence for himself by binding france and england so close together both dynastically and politically as to have both kings at his bidding before the next pope was elected the first idea was the betrothal of the jilted princess mary of ten to the middle-aged widower who sat upon the throne of france an embassy came to london from the queen regent of france whilst francis was still a prisoner in madrid in fifteen twenty five to smooth the way for a closer intimacy special instructions were given to the ambassador to dwell upon the complete recovery of francis from his illness and to make the most of the emperor's unfaithfulness to his english betrothed for the purpose of marrying the richly dowered portuguese francis eventually regained his liberty on hard conditions that included his marriage with charles's widowed sister leonora queen dowager of portugal and his sons were to remain in spain as hostages for his fulfillment of the terms but from the first francis intended to violate the treaty of madrid wherever possible and early in fifteen twenty seven a stately train of french nobles headed by de gramont bishop of tarbes came with the formal demand for the hand of young mary tudor for the already much married francis again the palace of greenwich was a blaze of splendor for the third nuptials of the little princess and the elaborate mummery that henry loved was re-enacted 
on the journeys to and from their lodgings in merchant taylor's hall the bishop of tarbes and viscount de Torraine heard nothing but muttered curses saw nothing but frowning faces of the london people for mary was in the eyes of henry's subjects the heiress of england and they would have said they no frenchman to reign over them when their own king should die catherine took little part in the betrothal festivities for she was a mere shadow now her little daughter was made to show off her accomplishments to the frenchmen speaking to them in french and latin playing on the harpsichord and dancing with the viscount de Tourraine, whilst the poor queen looked sadly on stiff with gems and cloth of gold the girl appearing we are told quote, like an angel end quote, gravely played her part to her proud father's delight and the bishop of tarbes took back with him to his master enthusiastic praises of this quote, pearl of the world end quote. the backward little girl of eleven who was destined as francis said to be the quote, cornerstone of the new covenant end quote between france and england either by her marriage with himself or failing that with his second son the duke of orleans which in every respect would have been a most suitable match no sooner had the treaty of betrothal been signed than there came second june fifteen twenty seven the tremendous news that the emperor's troops under bourbon had entered and sacked rome with ruthless fury and that pope clement was a prisoner in the castle of saint angelo clamoring for aid from all christian princes against his impious assailants all those kings who looked with distrust upon the rapidly growing power of charles drew closer together when the news came wolsey was in france on his embassy of surpassing magnificence whilst public discontent in england at what was considered his warlike policy was already swelling into fierce denunciations against him his pride his greed and his french proclivities english people cared little for the troubles of the italian pope or indeed for anything else so long as they were allowed to live and trade in peace and they knew full well that war with the emperor would mean the closing of the rich flemish and spanish markets to them as well as the seizure of their ships and goods but to wolsey's ambition the imprisonment of clement the seventh seemed to open a prospect of unlimited power if francis and henry were closely aligned with the support of the papacy behind them wolsey might be commissioned to exercise the papal authority until he relieved the pontiff from duress and in due course might succeed to the chair of saint peter so deaf to the murmuring of the english people he pressed on his goal being to bind france and england closely together that he might use them both the marriage treaty of mary with the duke of orleans instead of with his father was agreed upon by francis and the cardinal at almia in august fifteen twenty seven but wolsey knew that the marriage of the children could not be completed for some years yet and he was impatient to forge an immediately effective bond francis had a sister and a sister-in-law of full age either of whom might marry henry but catherine stood in the way and she was the personification of the imperial connection wolsey had no scruples he knew how earnestly his master wished for a son to inherit his realm and how weak of will that master was if only he kept up the appearance of omnipotence he knew that catherine disappointed glum and austere 
had lost the charm by which women rule men and the plan that for many months he had been slowly and stealthily devising was boldly brought out to light of day divorce was easy and it would finally isolate the emperor if catherine were set aside the pope would do anything for his liberators why not dissolve the unfruitful marriage and give to england a new french consort in the person of either the widowed margaret duchess of alenon or of princess renee it is true that the former indignantly refused the suggestion and dynastic reasons prevented francis from favoring that of a marriage of rene of france and brittany with the king of england but women and indeed men were for wolsey but puppets to be moved not creatures to be consulted and the cardinal went back to england exultant and hopeful that at last he would compass his aspiration and make himself ruler of the princes of christendom never was hope more fallacious or fortune's irony more bitter with a strong master wolsey would have won with a flabby sensualist as his stalking horse he was bound to lose unless he remained always at his side the cardinal's absence in france was the turning point of his fortunes whilst he was glorying abroad his enemies at home dealt him a death-blow through a woman at exactly what period or by whom the idea of divorcing catherine at this time had been broached to henry it is difficult to say but it was no unpardonable or uncommon thing for monarchs for reasons of dynastic expediency to put aside their wedded wives popes usually in a hurry to enrich their families could be bribed or coerced and the interests of the individual even of a queen consort were as nothing in comparison of those of the state as represented by the sovereign if the question of religious reform had not complicated the situation and henry had married a catholic princess of one of the great royal houses as wolsey intended instead of a mere upstart like anne boleyn there would probably have been little difficulty about the divorce from catherine and the first hint of the repudiation of a wife who could give the king no heir for the sake of marrying another princess who might do so and at the same time consolidate a new international combination would doubtless be considered by those who made it as quite an ordinary political move it is probable that the bishop of tarbes when he was in england in the spring of fifteen twenty seven for the betrothal of mary conferred with wolsey as to the possibility of henry's marriage to a french princess which of course would involve the repudiation of catherine in any case the king and wolsey whether truly or not asserted that the bishop had first started the question of the validity of henry's marriage with his wife with special reference to the legitimacy of the princess mary who was to be betrothed to francis i or his son it may be accepted as certain however that the matter had been secretly fermenting ever since wolsey began to shift the center of gravity from the emperor towards france catherine may have suspected it though as yet no word reached her but she was angry at the intimate hobnobbing with france at her daughter's betrothal to the enemy of her house and at the elevation of henry's bastard son to a royal dukedom she was deeply incensed too at her alienation from state affairs and had formed around her a cabal of wolsey's enemies for the most part members of the older nobility traditionally in favor of the spanish alliance and against france in order if possible to obstruct the cardinal's policy the king 
no doubt fully aware of wolsey's plan was as usual willing to wound but yet afraid to strike not caring how much wrong he did if he could only gloze it over to appear right and save his own responsibility before the world the first formal step which was taken in april fifteen twenty seven was carefully devised with this end henry representing that his conscience was assailed by doubts secretly consulted certain of his counsellors as to the legality of his union with his deceased brother's widow it is true that he had lived with her for eighteen years and that any impediment to the marriage on the ground of affinity had been dispensed with to the satisfaction of all parties at the time by the pope's bull but trifles such as these could never stand in the way of so tender a conscience as that of henry tudor or so overpowering an ambition as that of his minister the counsellors most of those chosen were of course french partisans thought the case was very doubtful and were favourable to an inquiry on the seventeenth may fifteen twenty seven warham archbishop of canterbury who it will be recollected had always been against the marriage with wolsey stephen gardiner and certain doctors of law held a private sitting at the york house westminster at which the king had been cited to appear and answer the charge of having lived in incest with his sister-in-law the court was adjourned twice to the twentieth and thirty-first may during which time the sham pleadings for and against the king were carefully directed to the desired end but before the first sitting was well over the plot got wind and reached catherine the queen and the imperial connection were popular wolsey and the french were feared and detested the old nobility and the populace were on the queen's side the mere rumour of what was intended by the prelates at york house set people growling ominously and the friends of the spanish flemish alliance became threateningly active the king and wolsey saw that for a degree of nullity to be pronounced by warham and wolsey alone after a secret inquiry at which the queen was not represented would be too scandalous and dangerous in the state of public feeling and an attempt was made to get the bishops generally to decide in answer to a leading question that such a marriage as that of the king and catherine was incestuous but the bishops were faithful sons of the papacy and most of them shied at the idea of ignoring the pope's bull allowing the marriage henry had also learnt during the proceedings of the sacking of rome and the imprisonment of clement which was another obstacle to his desires for though the pope would doubtless have been quite ready to oblige his english and french friends to the detriment of the emperor when he was free it was out of the question that he should do so now that he and his dominions were at the mercy of the imperial troops the king seems to have had an idea that he might by his personal persuasion bring his unaccommodating wife to a more reasonable frame of mind he and wolsey had been intensely annoyed that she had learnt so promptly of the plot against her but since some spy had told her it was as well thought henry that she should see things in their proper light with a sanctimonious face he saw her on the twenty second june fifteen twenty seven and told her how deeply his conscience was touched at the idea that they had been living in mortal sin for so many years in future he said he must abstain from her company and requested that she would remove far away from court she was a haughty princess no angel in temper notwithstanding her devout piety 
and she gave Henry the vigorous answer that might have been expected. They were man and wife, as they had always been, she said, with the full sanction of the church and the world, and she would stay where she was, strong in her rights as an honest woman and a queen. It was not Henry's way to face a strong opponent, unless he had someone else to support him and bear the brunt of the fight, and, in accordance with his character, he whined that he never meant any harm. He only wished to discover the truth, to set at rest the scruples raised by the Bishop of Tarbes. All would be for the best, he assured his angry wife, but pray keep the matter secret. Henry did not love to be thwarted, and Wolsey, busy making ready for his ostentatious voyage to France, had to bear, as best he might, his master's ill humor. The famous ecclesiastical lawyer, Samson, had told the cardinal that the marriage with Arthur had never been consummated, and consequently that, even apart from the Pope's dispensation, the present union was unimpeachable. The queen would fight the matter to the end, he said, and though Wolsey did his best to answer Samson's arguments, he was obliged to transmit them to the king and recommend him to handle his wife gently, quote, until it was shown what the Pope and Francis would do, end quote. Henry acted on the advice, as we have seen, but Wolsey was scolded by the king as if he himself had advanced Samson's arguments instead of answering them. Catherine did not content herself with sitting down and weeping. She dispatched her faithful Spanish chamberlain, Francisco Felipe, on a pretended voyage to a sick mother in Spain, in order that he might beg the aid of the emperor to prevent the injustice intended against the queen. And Wolsey's spies made every effort to catch the man and lay him by the heels. She sent to her confessor, Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, begging for his counsel, he being one of the bishops who held that her marriage was valid. She desired, said Wolsey to the king, counsel, as well of strangers as of English, and generally showed a spirit the very opposite of that of the patient Griselda in similar circumstances. How entirely upset were the king and Wolsey by the unexpected force of the opposition is seen in the cardinal's letter to his master a day or two after he had left London at the beginning of July to proceed on his French embassy. Writing from Faversham, he relates how he had met Archbishop Warham and had told him, in dismay, that the queen had discovered their plan and how irritated she was, and how the king, as arranged with Wolsey, had tried to pacify and reassure her. To Wolsey's delight, Warham persisted that, whether the queen liked it or not, quote, truth and law must prevail, end quote. On his way through Rochester, Wolsey tackled Fisher, who was known to favor the queen, he admitted, under Wolsey's pressure, that she had sent to him, though he pretended not to know why, and, quote, greatly blamed the queen, and thought that if he might speak to her, he might bring her to submission, end quote. But Wolsey considered this would be dangerous, and bade the bishop stay where he was, and so, with the iniquitous plot temporarily shelved by the unforeseen opposition, personal and political, Wolsey and his great train, more splendid than that of any king, went on his way to Dover and to Almia, whilst in his absence that happened in England, which in due time brought all his dignity and pride to dust and ashes. End of section 8
section nine of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen twenty seven through fifteen thirty catherine and anne the divorce part one enough has been said in the aforegoing pages to show that henry was no more a model of marital fidelity than other contemporary monarchs it was not expected that he should be the marriages of such men were usually prompted by political reasons alone and for the indulgence of affairs of the heart kings were forced to look elsewhere than towards the princesses they had taken in fulfilment of treaties mary the younger daughter of sir thomas bolin and wife of william carey was the king's mistress for some years after her marriage in fifteen twenty one with the result that her father had received many rich grants from the crown and in fifteen twenty five was created lord rockford as treasurer of the household lord rockford was much at court and his relationship with the howards st ledgers and other great families through his marriage with lady elizabeth daughter of the duke of norfolk naturally allied him with the party of nobles whose traditions ran counter to those of the bureaucrats in henry's council his elder daughter anne who was born early in fifteen o three probably at hever castle in kent had been carefully educated in the learning and accomplishments considered necessary for a lady of birth at court and she accompanied mary tudor to france in fifteen fourteen for her fleeting marriage with the valetudinarian louis the twelfth related in an earlier chapter on queen mary's return to england a few months afterwards with her second husband charles brandon the youthful anne boleyn remained to complete her courtly education in france under the care of the new queen of france claude first wife of francis i when the alliance of the emperor and england was negotiated in fifteen twenty one and war with france threatened anne was recalled home and in fifteen twenty two began her life in the english court and with her family in their various residences her six years in the gay court of francis i during her most impressionable age had made her in manner more french than english she can never have been beautiful her face was long and thin her chin pointed and her mouth hypocritically prim but her eyes were dark and very fine her brows arched and high and her complexion dazzling above all she was supremely vain and fond of admiration similar qualities to these might have been and doubtless were possessed by a dozen other high-born ladies in henry's court but circumstances partly political and partly personal gave to them in anne's case a national importance that produced enduring consequences upon the world we have already glanced at the mixture of tedious masquerading hunting and amorous intrigue which formed the principal occupations of the ladies and gentlemen who surrounded henry and catherine in their daily life and from her arrival in england anne appears to have entered to the full into the enjoyment of such pastimes there was some negotiation for her marriage even before she arrived in england with sir piers butler an irish cousin of hers but it fell through on the question of settlements and in fifteen twenty six when she was already about twenty-three she took matters in her own hands and captivated an extremely eligible suitor in the person of a silly flighty young noble henry percy eldest son and heir to the earl of northumberland percy was one of the court butterflies who attached themselves to wolsey's household 
and when angrily taken to task by the cardinal for flirting with anne notwithstanding his previous formal betrothal to another lady the daughter of the earl of shrewsbury the young man said that as he loved anne best he would rather marry her the cardinal did not mince words with his follower but percy stood stoutly to his choice and the earl of northumberland was hastily summoned to london to exercise his authority over his recalcitrant son cavendish gives an amusing account of the interview between them at which he was present the earl seems to have screwed up his courage by a generous draught of wine when he left wolsey's presence to await his son in the hall of york house when the youth did come in the scolding he got was vituperative in its violence with the result that percy was reluctantly forced to abandon the sweetheart to whom he had plighted his troth wolsey's interference in their love affair deeply angered both anne and her sweetheart percy was a poor creature and could do wolsey little harm but anne did not forget swearing that if ever it lay in her power she would do to the cardinal some displeasure which indeed she afterwards did the reason for wolsey's strong opposition to a match which appeared a perfectly fitting one for both the lovers is not far to seek cavendish himself gives us the clue when he says that when the king first heard that anne had become engaged to percy quote, he was much moved thereat for he had a private affection for her himself which was not yet discovered to any End quote. and the faithful usher in telling the story excuses wolsey by saying that quote, he did nothing but what the king commanded End quote this affair marks the beginning of henry's infatuation for anne there was no reason for wolsey to object to a flirtation between the girl and her royal admirer indeed the devotion of the king to a new mistress would doubtless make him the more ready to consent to contract another entirely political marriage if he could get rid of catherine and the cardinal smiled complacently at the prospect that all was going well for his plans anne for the look of the thing was sent away from court for a short time after the percy affair had been broken off but before many weeks were over she was back again as one of catherine's maids of honor and the king's admiration for her was evident to all observers it is more than questionable whether up to this time fifteen twenty six anne ever dreamed of becoming henry's wife but in any case she was too clever to let herself go cheaply she knew well the difference in the positions held by the king's mistresses in the french court and that which had been occupied by her sister and lady talibois in england and she coyly held her royal lover at arm's length with the idea of enhancing her value at last henry as we have seen was utterly tired of and estranged from catherine and his new flame with her natural ability and acquired french arts flattered and pleased his vanity better than any woman had done before it is quite probable that she began to aim secretly at the higher prize in the spring of fifteen twenty seven when the idea of the divorce from catherine had taken shape in the king's mind under the sedulous prompting of wolsey for his personal and political ends but if such was the case she was careful not to show her hand prematurely her only hope of winning such a game was to keep imperious henry in a fever of love whilst declining all his illicit advances it was a difficult and a dangerous thing to do for her quarry might break away at any moment 
whereas if such a word as marriage between the king and her reached the ears of the cardinal she and her family would inevitably be destroyed such was the condition of affairs when wolsey started for france in july fifteen twenty seven he went determined to leave no stone unturned to set henry free from catherine he knew that there was no time to be lost for the letters from mendoza the spanish ambassador in london and catherine's messenger felipe were on their way to tell the story to the emperor in spain and clement the seventh a prisoner in the hands of the imperialists would not dare to dissolve the marriage after charles had had time to command him not to do so it was a stiff race who should get to the pope first wolsey's alternative plan in the circumstances was a clever one it was to send to rome the bishop of worcester the italian Genucci, henry's ambassador in spain then on his way home to obtain with the support of the cardinals of french sympathies a quote, general faculty end quote, from clement the seventh for wolsey to exercise all the papal functions during the pope's captivity quote, by which without informing the pope of your i e henry's purpose i may delegate such judges as the queen will not refuse and if she does the cognizance of the cause shall be devolved upon me and by a closetto be inserted in the general commission no appeal be allowed from my decision to the pope End quote. how unscrupulous wolsey and henry were in the matter is seen in a letter dated shortly before the above was written in which wolsey says to Genucci, bishop of worcester and dr lee henry's ambassador with the emperor that quote, a rumor has somehow or other sprung up in england that proceedings are being taken for a divorce between the king and the queen which is entirely without foundation yet not altogether causeless for there has been some discussion about the papal dispensation not with any view to a divorce but to satisfy the french who raised the objection on proposing a marriage between the princess mary tudor and their sovereign the proceedings which took place on this dispute gave rise to the rumor and reached the ears of the queen who expressed some resentment but was satisfied after explanation and no suspicion exists except perchance the queen may have communicated with the emperor End quote. charles had indeed heard the whole story as far as catherine knew it from the lips of felipe before this was written and was not to be put off with such smooth lies he wrote indignantly to his ambassador mendoza in london directing him to see henry and point out to him in diplomatic language veiling many a threat the danger as well as the turpitude of repudiating his lawful wife with no valid excuse and more vigorously still he let the pope know that there must be no underhand work to his detriment or that of his family whilst the arrogant cardinal of york was thus playing for his own hand first and for henry secondly in france his jealous enemies in england might put their heads together and plot against him undeterred by the paralyzing fear of his frown his pride and insolence as well as his french political leanings had caused the populace to hate him the commercial classes who suffered most by the wars with their best customers the flemings and spaniards were strongly opposed to him whilst the territorial and noble party which had usually been friendly with catherine and were traditionally against bureaucratic or ecclesiastical ministers of the crown suffered with impatience the galling yoke of the ipswich butcher's son who drove them as he listed 
and was in the circumstances a more powerful ally for them than catherine she was the niece of the duke of norfolk the leader of the party of nobles and her ambition would make her an apt and eager instrument the infatuation of the king for her grew more violent as she repelled his advances and doubtless at the prompting of wolsey's foes it soon began to be whispered that if henry could get rid of his wife he might marry his english favorite before the cardinal had been in france a month mendoza the spanish ambassador first sounded the new note of alarm to the emperor by telling him that anne might become the king's wife it is hardly possible that no hint of the danger can have reached wolsey but if it did he was confident of his power over his master when he should return to england unfortunately for him his ideas for the king's divorce were hampered by the plans for his own advancement and the proposals he wrote to henry were all founded on the idea of exerting international pressure either for the liberation of the pope or to obtain from the pontiff the decree of divorce it was evident that this process must be a slow one and anne as well as henry was in a hurry unlike charles who though he was falsity itself to his rivals never deceived his own ministers henry constantly showed the moral cowardice of his character by misleading those who were supposed to direct his policy and at this juncture he conceived a plan of his own which promised more rapidity than that of wolsey without informing wolsey of the real object of his mission old dr knight the king's confidential secretary was sent to endeavor to see the pope in st angelo and by personal appeal from the king persuade him to grant a dispensation for henry's marriage either before his marriage with catherine was dissolved formally constante matrimonial or else if that was refused a dispensation to marry after the declaration had been made nullifying the previous union saluto matrimonio but in either case the strange demand was to be made that the dispensation was to cover the case of the bride and bridegroom being connected within the prohibited degrees of affinity knight saw wolsey on his way through france and hoodwinked him as to his true mission by means of a bogus set of instructions though the cardinal was evidently suspicious and ill at ease this was on the twelfth september fifteen twenty seven and less than a fortnight later wolsey hurried homeward when he had set forth from england three months before he seemed to hold the king in the hollow of his hand private audience for him was always ready and all doors flew open at his bidding but when he appeared on the thirtieth september at the palace of richmond and sent one of his gentlemen to inquire of the king where he would receive him anne sat in the great hall by henry's side as was usual now before the king could answer the question of wolsey's messenger the favorite with a petulance that catherine would have considered undignified snapped quote, where else should the cardinal come but where the king is End quote. for the king to receive his ministers at private audience in a hall full of people was quite opposed to the usual etiquette of henry's court and wolsey's man still stood awaiting the king's reply but it only came in the form of a nod that confirmed the favorite's decision this must have struck the proud cardinal to the heart and when he entered the hall and bowed before his sovereign who was toying now with his lady-love and joking with his favorites the minister must have known that his empire over henry had for the time vanished he was clever and crafty he had often conquered difficulties before and was not dismayed now that a young woman had supplanted him 
for he still held confidence in himself so he made no sign of annoyance but he promptly tried to checkmate knight's mission when he heard of it whilst pretending approval of the king's attachment to anne the latter was deceived she could not help seeing that with wolsey's help she would attain her object infinitely more easily than without it and she in turn smiled upon the cardinal though her final success would have boded ill for him as he well knew his plan doubtless was to let the divorce question drag on as long as possible in the hope that henry would tire of his new flame first he persuaded the king to send fresh instructions to knight on the ground that the pope would certainly not give him a dispensation to commit bigamy in order that he might marry anne and that it would be easier to obtain from the pontiff a decree leaving the validity of the marriage with catherine to the decision of the legates in england wolsey and another cardinal henry having once loosened the bridle did not entirely return to his submission to wolsey like most weak men he found it easier to rebel against the absent than against those who faced him but he was not if he and anne could prevent it again going to put his neck under the cardinal's yoke completely and in a secret letter to-night he ordered him to ask clement for a dispensation couched in the curious terms already referred to allowing him to marry again even within the degrees of affinity as soon as the union with catherine was dissolved knight had found it impossible to get near the pope in rome for the imperialists had been fully forewarned by this time but at length clement was partially released and went to orvieto in december whither knight followed him before the new instructions came from england knight was no match for the subtle churchman clement dared not moreover mortally offend the emperor whose men-at-arms still held rome and the dispensation that knight sent so triumphantly to england giving the legate's court in london power to decide the validity of the king's marriage had a clause slipped into it which destroyed its efficacy because it left the final decision to the pontiff after all it may be asked if henry believed as he now pretended that his first marriage had never been legal in consequence of catherine being his brother's widow why he needed a papal dispensation to break it the papal brief that had been previously given allowing the marriage was asserted by henry's ecclesiastical friends to be ultra vires in england because marriage with a brother's widow was prohibited under the common law of the land with which the pope could not dispense but the matter was complicated with all manner of side issues the legitimacy of the princess mary the susceptibilities of the powerful confederation that obeyed the emperor the sentiment of the english people and above all the invariable desire of henry to appear a saint whilst he acted like a sinner and to avoid personal responsibility and so henry still strove with the ostensible but none too hardy aid of wolsey to gain from the pope the nullification of a marriage which he said was no marriage at all wolsey's position had become a most delicate and dangerous one as soon as the emperor learned of anne's rise he had written to mendoza thirtieth september fifteen twenty seven saying that the cardinal must be bought at any price all his arrears of pension forty five thousand ducats were to be paid six thousand ducats a year more from a spanish bishopric were to be granted and a milanese marquisate was to be conferred upon him with a revenue of fifteen thousand ducats a year if he would only serve the emperor's interests 
but he dared not do it quickly or openly dearly as he loved money for anne was watchful and henry suspicious of him his only hope was that the king's infatuation for this long-faced woman with the prude's mouth and the blazing eyes might pall then his chance would come again far from growing weaker however henry's passion grew as anne's virtue became more rigid she had not always been so austere for gossip had already been busy with her good name percy and sir thomas wyatt had both been her lovers and with either or both of them she had in some way compromised herself but she played her game cleverly for the stake was a big one and her fascination must have been great she was often away from court feigning to prefer the rural delights of hever to the splendors of greenwich or richmond or offended at the significant tittle-tattle about herself and the king she was thus absent when in july fifteen twenty seven wolsey had gone to france but took care to keep herself in henry's memory by sending him a splendid jewel of gold and diamonds representing a damsel in a boat on a troubled sea the lovesick king replied in the first of those extraordinary love letters of his which have so often been printed henceforward he says my heart shall be devoted to you only i wish my body also could be god can do it if he pleases to whom i pray once a day that it may be and hope at length to be heard and he signs Esclipta de la bord au secrétaire coenquer cor avalanti a vous loyal et plus assure serviteur ash atracarnicers air soon afterwards when wolsey was well on his way the king writes to his lady love again quote, the time seems so long since i heard of your good health and of you that i send the bearer to be better ascertained of your health and your purpose for since my last parting from you i have been told you have quite abandoned the intention of coming to court either with your mother or otherwise if so i cannot wonder sufficiently for i have committed no offence against you and it is very little return for the great love i bear you to deny me the presence of the woman i esteem most in all the world if you love me as i hope you do our separation should be painful to you i trust your absence is not wilful for if so i can but lament my ill fortune and by degrees abate my great folly End quote. this was the tone to bring anne to her lover again and before many days were over they were together and in wolsey's absence the marriage rumors spread apace the fiasco of knight's mission had convinced henry and anne that they must proceed through the ordinary diplomatic channels and with the aid of wolsey in their future approaches to the pope and early in fifteen twenty eight stephen gardiner and edward fox two ecclesiastics attached to the cardinal were dispatched on a fresh mission to orvieto to urge clement to grant to wolsey and another legate power to pronounce finally on the validity of henry's marriage the pope was to be plied with sanctimonious assurances that no carnal love for anne prompted henry's desire to marry her as the pope had been informed but solely her quote, approved excellent virtuous qualities the purity of her life her constant virginity her maidenly and womanly pudicity her soberness her chasteness meekness humility wisdom decent right noble and high through royal blood education and all good and laudable qualities and manners apparent aptness to procreation of children with her other infinite good qualities gardiner and fox on their way to dover called at hever and showed to anne this panegyric penned by wolsey upon her and thenceforward for a time 
all went trippingly gardiner was a far different negotiator from knight and was able though with infinite difficulty to induce clement to grant the new bull demanded relegating the cause finally to the legatine court in london the pope would have preferred that wolsey should have sat alone as legate but wolsey was so unpopular in england and the war into which he had again dragged the country against the emperor was so detested whilst queen catherine had so many sympathizers that it was considered necessary that a foreign legate should add his authority to that of wolsey to do the evil deed compeggio who had been in england before and was a pensioner of henry as bishop of hereford was the cardinal selected by wolsey and at last clement consented to send him every one concerned appears to have endeavoured to avoid responsibility for what they knew was a shabby business the pope crafty and shifty was in a most difficult position and blew hot and cold the first commission given to gardiner and fox which was received with such delight by anne and henry when fox brought it to london in april fifteen twenty eight was found on examination still to leave the question open to papal veto it is true that it gave permission to the legates to pronounce for the king but the responsibility for the ruling was left to them and their decision might be impugned when at the urgent demand of gardiner the pope with many tears gave a decretal laying down that the king's marriage with catherine was bad by canon law if the facts were as represented he gave secret orders to the legate compeggio that the decretal was to be burnt and not to be acted upon whilst the pope was thus between the devil and the deep sea trying to please the emperor on the one hand and the kings of france and england on the other and deceiving both the influence of anne over her royal lover grew stronger every day wolsey was in the toils and he knew it when charles had answered the english declaration of war january fifteen twenty eight it was the cardinal's rapacity pride and ambition against which he thundered as the cause of the strife and of the insult offered to the imperial house to the emperor the cardinal could not again turn henry moreover was no longer the obedient tool he had been before anne was by his side to stiffen his courage and wolsey knew that notwithstanding the favorite's feline civilities and feigned dependence upon him it would be the turn of his enemies to rule when once she became the king's wedded wife he was indeed hoist with his own petard the divorce had been mainly promoted if not originated by him and the divorce in the present circumstances would crush him but he had pledged himself too deeply to draw back openly and he still had to smile upon those who were planning his ruin and himself urge forward the policy by which it was to be effected in the meanwhile catherine stood firm living under the same roof as her husband sitting at the same table with him with a serene countenance in public and to all appearance unchanged in her relations to him but though her pride stood her in good stead she was perplexed and lonely henry's intention to divorce her and his infatuation for anne were of course public property and the courtiers turned to the coming constellation whatever the common people might do mendoza the spanish ambassador withdrew from court in the spring after the declaration of war and the queen's isolation was then complete to the spanish latinist in flanders j luis vives and to erasmus she wrote asking for counsel in her perplexity but decorous epistles in stilted latin 
advising resignation and a christian fortitude was all she got from either her nephew the emperor had urged her in any case to refuse to recognize the authority of any tribunal in england to judge her case and had done what he could to frighten the pope against acceding to henry's wishes but even he was not implacable if his political ends were served in any arrangement that might be made and at this time he evidently hoped as did the pope fervently that as a last resource catherine would help everybody out of the trouble by giving up the struggle and taking the veil her personal desire would doubtless have been to adopt this course for the world had lost its savior but she was a daughter of isabel the catholic and tame surrender was not in her line her married life with henry she knew was at an end but her daughter was now growing into girlhood and her legitimacy and heirship to the english crown she would only surrender with her own life so to all smooth suggestions that she should make things pleasant all around by acquiescing in the king's view of their marriage she was scornfully irresponsive End of section 9section ten of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen twenty seven through fifteen thirty catherine and anne the divorce part two through the plague scourged summer of fifteen twenty eight henry and anne waited impatiently for the coming of the legate Compeggio. He was old and gouty, hampered with a mission which he dreaded, for he could not hope to reconcile the irreconcilable, and the Pope had quietly given him the hint that he need not hurry. Clement was, indeed, in a greater fix than ever. He had been made to promise by the Emperor that the case should not be decided in England and yet he had been forced into giving the dispensation and decretal not only allowing it to be decided there in favor of henry but had dispatched compeggio to pronounce judgment he had however at the same time assured the emperor that means should be found to prevent the finality of any decision in england until the emperor had approved of it and compeggio was instructed accordingly the spaniards thought that the english cardinal would do his best to second the efforts of the pope without appearing to do so and there is no doubt that they were right for wolsey was now the summer of fifteen twenty eight really alarmed at the engine he had set in motion and could not stop catherine knew that the legate was on his way and that the pope had in appearance granted all of henry's demands but she did not know or could not understand the political forces that were operating in her favor which made the pope defraud the king of england and turned her erstwhile mortal enemy wolsey into her secret friend tact and ready adaptability might still have helped catherine the party of nobles under norfolk it is true had deserted her but wolsey and the bureaucrats were still a power to be reckoned with and the middle classes and the populace were all in favor of the queen and the imperial alliance if these elements had been cleverly combined they might have conquered for henry was always a coward and would have bent to the stronger force but Catherine was a bad hand at changing sides, and Wolsey dared not openly do so. For a few days in the summer of 1528, whilst Compeggio was still lingering on the continent, it looked as if a mightier power than any of them might settle the question for once and all. Henry and Anne were at Greenwich, 
when the plague broke out in london in june one of anne's attendants fell ill of the malady and henry in a panic sent his favorite to hever whilst he hurried from place to place in hertfordshire the plague followed him sir francis poins sir william compton william carey and other members of his court died in the course of the epidemic and the dread news soon reached henry that anne and her father were both stricken at hever castle henry had written daily to her whilst they had been separated since your last letter mine own darling he wrote a few days after she left walter welsh master brown thomas Kerr, greeren of brereton and john coke the apothecary have fallen of the sweat in this house by the mercy of god the rest of us be yet well and i trust shall pass it either not to have it or at least as easily as the rest have done later he wrote the uneasiness my doubts about your health gave me disturbed and alarmed me exceedingly and i should not have had any quiet without hearing certain tidings but now since you have felt as yet nothing i hope and am assured that it will spare you as i hope it is doing with us for when we were at waltham two ushers two valets and your brother master treasurer fell ill but are now quite well and since we have returned to our house at hunston we have been perfectly well and have not now one sick person god be praised i think if you would retire from surrey as we did you would escape all danger there is another thing may comfort you which is in truth that in this distemper few or no women have been taken ill and no person of our court has died for which reason i beg you my entirely beloved not to frighten yourself nor be too uneasy at our absence for wherever i am i am yours and yet we must sometimes submit to our misfortunes for whoever will struggle against fate is generally but so much the further from gaining his end wherefore comfort yourself and take courage and avoid the pestilence as much as you can for i hope shortly to make you sing la envoye no more at present from lack of time but that i wish you in my arms that i might a little dispel your unreasonable thoughts written by the hand of him who is and always will be yours when the news of anne's illness reached him he dispatched one of his physicians post haste with the following letter to his favorite Quote, there came to me suddenly in the night the most afflicting news that could have arrived the first to hear the sickness of my mistress whom i esteem more than all the world and whose health i desire as i do my own so that i would gladly bear half your illness to make you well the second the fear that i have of being still longer harassed by my enemy your absence much longer who is so far as i can judge determined to spite me more because i pray god to rid me of this troublesome tormentor the third because the physician in whom i have most confidence is absent at the very time when he might be of the most service to me for i should hope by his means to obtain one of my chiefest joys on earth that is the care of my mistress yet for want of him i send you my second and hope that he will soon make you well i shall then love him more than ever i beseech you to be guided by his advice and i hope soon to see you again which will be to me a greater comfort than all the precious jewels in the world End quote. in a few days anne was out of danger and the hopes and fears aroused by her illness gave place to the old intrigues again a few weeks later anne was with her lover at amphill hoping and praying daily for the coming of the gouty legate who was slowly being carried through france to the coast wolsey had to be very humble now for anne had shown her ability to make henry brave him and the king rebuked him publicly at her bidding but until compeggio came 
and the fateful decision was given that would make anne a queen both she and henry diplomatically alternated cajolery with the humbling process towards the cardinal anne's well-known letter with henry's postscript so earnestly asking wolsey for news of compeggio is written in most affectionate terms and saying amongst other pretty things that she quote, loves him next unto the king's grace above all creatures living end quote. but the object of her wheedling was only to gain news of the speedy coming of the legate the king's postscript to this letter is characteristic of him quote, the writer of this letter would not cease till she had caused me likewise to set my hand desiring you though it be short to take it in good part i assure you that there is neither of us but greatly desireth to see you and are joyous to hear that you have escaped the plague so well trusting the fury thereof to be past especially with them that keepeth good diet as i trust you do the not hearing of the legate's arrival in france causeth us somewhat to muse notwithstanding we trust by your diligence and vigilance with the assistance of almighty god shortly to be eased out of that trouble End quote. compeggio was nearly four months on his way urged forward everywhere by english agents and letters held back everywhere by the pope's fears and his own ailments but at last one joyful day in the middle of september henry could write to his lady love at hever quote, the legate which we most desire arrived at paris on sunday last past so that i trust next monday to hear of his arrival at calais and then i trust within a while after to enjoy that which i have so long longed for to god's pleasure and both our comfort no more to you at present mine own darling for lack of time but that i would you were in mine arms or i in yours for i think it long since i kissed you End quote. henry had to wait longer than in his lover-like eagerness he had expected it was fully a fortnight before he had news of compeggio's arrival at dover great preparations had been made to entertain the papal legate splendidly in london and on his way thither but he was suffering and sorry and begged to be saved the fatigue of a public reception so ill was he that rather than face the streets of london on the day he was expected he lodged for the night at the duke of suffolk's house on the surrey side of london bridge and the next day eighth october was quietly carried in the duke's barge across the river to the bishop of bath's palace beyond temple bar where he was to lodge there he remained ill in bed until the king's impatience would brook no further delay and on the twelfth he was carried sick as he was and sorely against his will in a crimson velvet chair for his first audience in the great hall of the palace of bridewell hard by blackfriars henry sat in a chair of state with wolsey and compeggio on his right hand whilst one of the legate's train delivered a fulsome latin oration setting forth the iniquitous outrages perpetrated by the imperialists upon the vicar of christ and the love and gratitude of the pontiff for his dearest son henry for his aid and sympathy the one thing apparently that the pope desired was to please his benefactor the king of england when the public ceremony was over henry took compeggio and wolsey into a private room and the day following the king came secretly to compeggio's lodging and for four long hours plied the suffering churchman with arguments and authorities which would justify the divorce up to this time compeggio had fondly imagined that he might with the papal authority persuade henry to abandon his object but this interview undeceived him he found the king as he says better versed in the matter quote, 
than a great theologian or jurist end quote. and compeggio opined at last that quote, if an angel descended from heaven he would be unable to persuade him end quote, that the marriage was valid when however compeggio suggested that the queen might be induced to enter a convent henry was delighted if they would only prevail upon her to do that she should have everything she demanded the title of queen and all her dowry revenue and belongings the princess mary should be acknowledged heiress to the crown failing legitimate male issue to the king and all should be done to catherine's liking accordingly the next day fourteenth october compeggio and wolsey took boat and went to try their luck with the queen after seeing the king for the third time beginning with a long sanctimonious rigmarole compeggio pressed her to take a quote, course which would give general satisfaction and greatly benefit herself end quote. and wolsey on his knees and in english seconded his colleague's advice catherine was cold and collected she was she said a foreigner in england without skilled advice and she declined at present to say anything she had asked the king to assign counsellors to aid her and when she had consulted them she would see the legates again as day broke across the thames on the twenty fifth october compeggio lay awake in bed at bath house suffering the tortures of gout and perturbed at the difficult position in which he was placed when wolsey was announced having come from york place in his barge when the cardinal entered the room he told his italian colleague that the king had appointed archbishop warham bishop fisher and others to be counsellors for the queen and that the queen had obtained her husband's permission to come to compeggio and confess that morning at nine o'clock catherine came unobserved to bathhouse by water and was closeted for long with the italian cardinal what she told him was under the sacred seal of the confessional but she prayed that the pope might in strict secrecy be informed of certain of the particulars arising out of her statements she reviewed the whole of her life from the day of her arrival in england and solemnly swore on her conscience that she had only slept with young arthur seven nights a key de lui resto intacta e incorrupta and this assertion as far as it goes we may accept as the truth seeing the solemn circumstances under which it was made but when compeggio again urged catherine to get them all out of their difficulty by retiring to a convent and letting the king have his way she almost vehemently declared that quote, she would die as she had lived a wife as god had made her end quote. let a sentence be given she said and if it be against me i shall be free to do as i like even as my husband will but neither the whole realm nor on the other hand the greatest punishment even being torn limb from limb shall alter me in this and if after death i were to return to life i would die again and yet again rather than i would give way against such firmness as this the poor flaccid old churchman could do nothing but hold up his hands and sigh at the idea of any one being so obstinate a day or two afterwards wolsey and compeggio saw the queen again formally she was on this occasion attended by her advisers and once more heard coldly and irresponsibly the appeals to her prudence her worldly wisdom her love for her daughter and every other feeling that could lead her to cut the gordian knot that baffled them all she would do nothing to her soul's damnation or against god's law she said as she dismissed them whether it was at this interview or as it seems to me more likely 
the previous one that she broke out in violent invective against wolsey for his enmity towards the emperor we know not but the storm of bitter words she poured upon him for his pride his falsity his ambition and his greed her taunts at his intrigues to get the papacy and her burning scorn that her marriage unquestioned for twenty years should be doubted now must have finally convinced both wolsey and campeggio that if henry was firm catherine was firmer still campeggio was in a pitiable state of mind imploring the pope by every post to tell him what to do he and wolsey at one time conceived the horrible idea of marrying the princess mary to her half-brother the duke of richmond as a solution of the succession difficulty and the pope appears to have been inclined to allow it but it was soon admitted that the course proposed would not forward but rather retard the king's second marriage and that was the main object sought at length wolsey ruefully understood that conciliation was impossible and pressed as he was by the king was forced to insist with campeggio that the cause must be judicially decided without further delay illness prayerful attempts to bring one side or the other to reason and many other excuses for procrastination were tried but at length campeggio had to confess to his colleague that the pope's decretal laying down the law in the case of henry's favor was only a show document not to be used or to leave his possession for a moment and moreover that no final judgment could be given by him that was not submitted to the pope's confirmation wolsey was aghast and wrote in rage and indignation to the english agent with the pope denouncing this bad faith quote, i see ruin infamy and subversion of the whole dignity and estimation of the apostolic see if this course be persisted in you see in what dangerous times we are if the pope will consider the gravity of this cause and how much the safety of the nation depends upon it he will see that the course he now pursues will drive the king to adopt those remedies that are so injurious to the pope and are frequently instilled into the king's mind without the pope's compliance i cannot bear up against the storm and when i reflect upon the conduct of his holiness i cannot but fear lest the common enemy of souls seeing the king's determination inspires the pope with his present fears and reluctance which will alienate all the faith and devotion from the apostolic see it is useless for campeggio to think of reviving the marriage if he did it would lead to worse consequences let him therefore proceed to sentence prostrate at the feet of his holiness i most urgently beg of him to set aside all delays End quote. this cry wrung evidently from wolsey's heart at the knowledge of his own danger is the first articulate expression of the tremendous religious issue that might depend upon the conduct of the various parties in the divorce proceedings the fire lit by luther a few years previously had spread apace in germany and had reached england all christendom would soon have to range itself in two divisions cutting athwart old national affinities and alliances charles had defied luther at the outset and the traditions of his spanish house made him the most powerful monarch in europe the champion of orthodoxy but his relations with the papacy as we have seen had not been uniformly cordial to him the pope was a little italian prince whilst he was a great one and he was jealous of the slightest interference of rome with the spanish church his position in germany moreover as suzerain of the princes of the empire some of whom already leant to lutheranism 
complicated the situation so that it was not yet absolutely certain that charles would finally stake everything upon the unification of the christian church by force on the lines of strict papal authority on the other hand both francis and henry had for political reasons strongly supported the pope in his greatest distress and their religion was certainly no less faithful than that of the emperor it was inevitable that whichever side charles took in the coming religious struggle would not for political reasons commend itself to francis and vice versa and everything depended upon the weight which henry might cast onto one scale or the other his national traditions and personal inclination would lead him to side with charles but at the crucial moment when the first grain had to be dropped on to the balance he found himself bound by wolsey's policy to francis and at issue with the emperor owing to the relationship of the latter to catherine wolsey felt in the letter quoted above that the pope's shilly-shally in order not to offend the emperor would drive the impatient king of england to flout and perhaps break with the papacy and events proved that the cardinal was right in his fears we shall see later how the rift widened but here the first fine crevice is visible henry prompted by anne and his vanity intended to have his way at whatever cost catherine could give him no son he would marry a woman who could do so and one that he loved far better than he ever loved his wife in ordinary circumstances there need have been no great difficulty about the divorce nor would there have been in this case but for the peculiar political and religious situation of europe at the time and but for catherine's unbending rigidity of character she might have made her own terms if she had consented to the conciliatory suggestions of the churchmen the legality of her marriage would have been declared her daughter recognized as heiress presumptive her own great revenues would have been left to her and her title of queen respected she was not even to be asked to immure herself in a convent or to take any conventional vow but that of chastity if she would only consent to a divorce on the ground of her desire to devote herself to religion as compeggio repeated a dozen times the only thing she would be asked to surrender was conjugal relations with the king that had ceased for years and in no case would be renewed much as we may admire her firmness it is impossible to avoid seeing that the course recommended to her was that which would have best served not only her own interest and happiness but also those of her daughter of her religion and of the good relations between henry and the emperor that she had so much at heart henry on his side was determined to allow nothing to stand in his way whilst keeping up his appearance of impeccability legal and ecclesiastical authorities in england and france were besought to give their sanction to his view that no pope had the power of dispensation for a marriage with a deceased brother's widow and the english clergy were assured that the king only sought an impartial authoritative decision for the relief of his own conscience the attitude of the english people gave him some uneasiness for like all in his house he loved popularity the common people being ignorant we are told and others that favored the queen talked largely and said that for his own pleasure the king would have another wife and had sent for this legate to be divorced from the queen with many foolish words inasmuch as whoever spake against the marriage was of the common people abhorred and reproved the feeling indeed in favor of catherine was so outspoken and general that the king took the unusual course 
of assembling the nobles judges and so many of the people as could enter in the great hall of bridewell on sunday afternoon the eighth november to endeavor personally to justify himself in the eyes of his subjects as usual with him his great aim was by sanctimonious protestations to make himself appear a pure-souled altruist and to throw upon others the responsibility for his actions he painted in dismal colors the dangers to his subjects of a disputed succession on his death Quote, and although it hath pleased almighty god to send us a fair daughter by a noble woman and me begotten to our great joy and comfort yet it hath been told us by divers great clerks that neither she is our lawful daughter nor her mother our lawful wife and that we live together abominably and detestably in open adultery End quote. he swore almost blasphemously that for the relief of his conscience he only sought authoritatively to know the truth as to the validity of his marriage and that compeggio had come as an impartial judge to decide it if catherine was adjudged to be his wife nothing would be more pleasant or acceptable to him and he praised her to the skies as a noble lady against whom no words could be spoken the measure of his sincerity is seen when we compare this hypocritical harangue with the letters now before us to and from his envoys in rome by which it is evident that the last thing he desired was an impartial judgment or indeed any judgment but one that would set him free to marry again one of the most extraordinary means employed to influence catherine soon after this appears to have been another visit to her of wolsey and compeggio they were to say that the king had intelligence of a conspiracy against him and wolsey by her friends and the emperor's english partisans and they warned her that if anything of the sort occurred she would be to blame they were then to complain of her bearing towards the king quote, who was now persuaded by her behavior that she did not love him she encouraged ladies and gentlemen to dance and make merry for instance whereas she had better tell them to pray for a good end in the matter at issue she shows no pensiveness or countenance nor in her apparel nor behavior she shows herself too much to the people rejoicing greatly in their exclamations and ill obloquy and by beckoning with her head and smiling which she has not been accustomed to do in times past rather encouraged them in doing so End quote. for all this and many other things the king does not consider it fitting to be in her company or to let the princess be with her the acme of hypocrisy was reached in the assurance the legates were then to give the queen that if she would behave well and go into a convent the king neither could nor would marry another wife in her lifetime and she could come out to the world again if the sentence were in her favor let her go they said and submit to the king on her knees and he would be good to her but otherwise he would be more angry than ever scornful silence was the queen's reply end of section ten section eleven of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen twenty seven through fifteen thirty catherine and anne the divorce part three after this catherine lived lonely and depressed at greenwich frequently closeted with bishop fisher and others of her counsellors whilst henry was strengthening his case with the opinions of jurists and by attempts to influence compeggio 
to greenwich he went accompanied by anne and a brilliant court to show the italian cardinal how bounteously a christmas could be spent in england campeggio's son was knighted and regaled with costly presents and all that bribes the bishopric of durham etc and flattery might do was done to influence the legate favorably but throughout the gay doings jousts and tourneys banquets and maskings quote, the queen showed to them no manner of countenance and made no great joy of nothing her mind was so troubled End quote. well might it be poor soul for anne was by the king's side pert and insolent surrounded by a growing party of wolsey's enemies who cared little for pope or emperor and who waited impatiently for the time when anne should rule the king alone and they through her should rule england catherine in good truth was in everybody's way for even her nephew could not afford to quarrel with england for her sake and her death or disappearance would have made a reconciliation easy especially if wolsey the friend of france fell also anne we are told by the french ambassador quote, was lodged in a fine apartment close to that of the king in a greater court was now paid to her every day than has been paid to the queen for a long time i see that they mean to accustom the people by degrees to endure her so that when the great blow comes it may not be thought strange but the people remain quite hardened against her and i think they would do more if they had more power End quote. thus the months passed the pope being plied by alternate threats and hopes both by english and spanish agents until he was nearly beside himself wolsey almost frantically professing his desire to forward the king's object and campeggio temporizing and trying to find a means of conciliation which would leave the king free catherine herself remained immovable she had asked for and obtained from the emperor a copy of the papal brief authorizing her marriage with henry but the king's advocates questioned its authenticity and even her own advisers urged her to obey her husband's request that she should demand of the emperor the original document constrained by her sworn pledge to write nothing to the emperor without the king's knowledge she sent the letter dictated to her urgently praying her nephew to send the original brief to england the letter was carried to spain by her young english confessor thomas abel whom she did not entirely trust and sent with him her spanish usher montoya but they had verbal instructions from their mistress to pray the emperor to disregard her written request and refuse to part with the brief and to exert all his influence to have the case decided in rome by this it will be seen that catherine was fully a match in duplicity for those against whom she was pitted she never wavered from first to last in her determination to refuse to acknowledge the sentence of any court sitting in england on her case and to resist all attempts to induce her to withdraw voluntarily from her conjugal position and enter a nunnery henry and especially anne in the meanwhile were growing impatient at all this calculated delay and began to throw the blame upon wolsey quote, the young lady used very rude words to him end quote, wrote du Bellay on the twenty fifth january and quote, the duke of norfolk and his party already began to talk big end quote. a few days afterwards mendoza in a letter to the emperor spoke even more strongly quote, the young lady that is the cause of all this disorder finding her marriage delayed that she thought herself so sure of entertains great suspicion 
that wolsey puts impediments in her way from a belief that if she were queen his power would decline in this suspicion she is joined by her father and the dukes of norfolk and suffolk who have combined to overthrow the cardinal the king is so hot upon it the divorce that there is nothing he does not promise to gain his end compeggio has done nothing for the queen as yet but to press her to enter religion End quote. henry at length determined that he would wait no longer his four agents in rome had almost driven the pope to distraction with their importunities gardiner had gone to the length of threatening clement with the secession of england from the papacy and anne's cousin henry's boon companion brian deploring the pope's obstinacy in a letter from rome to the king was bold enough to say quote, i hope i shall not die until your grace has been able to requite the pope and popes and not be fed with their flattering words End quote. but in spite of it all clement would only palliate and temporize and finally refused to give any fresh instructions to the legates or help the king's cause by any new act to Campeggio he wrote angrily, telling him, for God's sake, to procrastinate the matter in England somehow, and not to throw upon his shoulders in Rome the responsibility of giving judgment, whilst Campeggio, though professing a desire to please Henry in everything, in the hope of getting the promised rich see of Durham, his enemy said, was equally determined not to go an inch beyond the pope's written instructions or to assume responsibility for the final decision the churchmen indeed were shuffling and lying all around for the position was threatening with lutheranism daily becoming bolder and the emperor growing ever more peremptory now that he had become reconciled to the pope by the end of may henry had had enough of dallying especially as rumors came from rome that the pope might revoke the commission of the legates and the great hall of the monastery of blackfriars was made ready for the sittings of the legatine court on a raised dais were two chairs of state covered with cloth of gold and on the right side of the dais a throne and canopy for the king confronted by another for the queen the first sittings of the legates were formal and the king and queen were summoned to appear before the tribunal on the eighteenth june fifteen twenty nine early in the morning of the day appointed the hall was full to overflowing with bishops clerics and counsellors and upon the crowd there fell the hush of those who consciously look upon a great drama of real life after the bishops of bath and lincoln had testified that citations to the king and queen had been delivered and other formal statements had been taken an usher stood forth and cried henry king of england appear but henry was at greenwich five miles away and in his stead there answered the ecclesiastical lawyer dr sampson then catherine queen of england rang out and into the hall there swept the procession of the queen herself rustling in stiff black garments with four bishops amongst them fisher of rochester and a great train of ladies standing before the throne erected for her she made a low obeisance to the legates and then in formal terms protested against the competence of the tribunal to judge her case consisting as it did of those dependent upon one of the parties and unable to give an impartial judgment she appealed from the legates to the sovereign pontiff who without fear or favor of man would decide according to divine and human law then with another low obeisance catherine turned her back upon the court and returned to the adjoining palace of bridewell on the following monday the twenty first the court again sat to give judgment upon her protest which compeggio would have liked to accept and so relieve him of his difficulty but for the pressure put upon him by wolsey and the court 
to the call of his name henry on this occasion answered in person from his throne here whilst the queen contented herself by an inclination of the head when the legates had rejected her protest the king rose and in one of his sanctimonious speeches once more averred his admiration and affection for his wife and swore that his fear of living sinfully was the sole cause of his having raised the question of the validity of his marriage when his speech had ended catherine rose between them the clerks and assessors sat at a large table so that she had to make the whole circuit of the hall to approach the king as she came to the foot of his throne she knelt before him for a last appeal to his better feelings in broken english and with tears coursing down her cheeks she spoke of their long married life together of the little daughter they both loved so well of her obedience and devotion to him and finally called him and god to witness that her marriage with his brother had been one in name only then rising she bowed low to the man who was still her husband and swept from the room when she reached the door henry realizing that all christendom would cry out against him if she was judged in her absence bade the usher summon her back but she turned to the welsh courtier griffin richards upon whose arm she leaned saying quote, go on it is no matter this is no impartial court to me End quote. and thus by an act of defiance bade henry do his worst like other things she did it was brave even heroic in the circumstances but it was unwise from every point of view it would be profitless to follow step by step the further proceedings which compeggio and wolsey at least must have known were hollow the court sat from week to week and henry grew more angry as each sitting ended fruitlessly the main question at issue now being the consummation or non-consummation of the first marriage until at the end of july compeggio demanded a vacation till october in accordance with the rule in roman courts whilst this new delay was being impatiently borne the revocation of the powers of the legates so long desired by compeggio came from rome and henry saw that the churchman had cheated him after all his rage knew no bounds and the cardinal's enemies led by anne and her kinsmen cleverly served now by the new man stephen gardiner fanned the flame against wolsey he might still however be of some use and though in deadly fear he was not openly disgraced yet one day the king sent for him to bridewell during the recess and was closeted with him for an hour in his barge afterwards on his way home wolsey sat perturbed and unhappy with the bishop of carlisle it is a very hot day said the latter yes replied the unhappy man if you had been as well chafed as i have been in the last hour you would say it was hot wolsey in his distress went straight to bed when he arrived at york place but before he had lain two hours anne's father came to his bedside to order him in the name of the king to accompany compeggio to bridewell to make another attempt to move the queen he had to obey and calling at bathhouse for compeggio on his way they sought audience of catherine they found her cool and serene indeed she seems rather to have overplayed the part she came to meet them with a skein of silk around her neck i am sorry to keep you waiting she said i was working with my ladies to wolsey's request for a private audience she replied that he might speak before her people she had no secrets with him and when he began to speak in latin she bade him use english throughout she was cool and stately and as may be supposed the visit was as fruitless as others had been 
wolsey was not quite done with even yet he might still act as legate alone if the pope's decretal deciding the law of the case in favor of henry could be obtained from compeggio who had held it so tightly by the pope's command so when compeggio was painfully carried into northamptonshire in september to take leave of the king wolsey was ordered to accompany him henry thought it politic to receive them without open sign of displeasure and sent the italian cardinal on his way with presents and smooth words wolsey escorted him a few miles on his road from grafton where the king was staying to tausta but when next day the cardinal returned to grafton alone he found the king's door shut against him and norries brought him an order that he was to return to london it was a blow that struck at his heart and he went sadly with the shadow of impending ruin upon him never to set eyes on his master more before his final fall there was still one thing he might do and he was given a few days reprieve that he might do it the pope had pledged himself in writing not to withdraw the legate's commission and although he had done so the original commission might still be alleged as authority for wolsey to act alone if only the papal decretal could be found compeggio's privileged character was consequently ignored and all his baggage ransacked in the hope of finding the document before he left english soil alas as an eyewitness tells us all that the packs contained were quote, old hosen old coats and such vile stuff as no honest man would carry end quote. for the decretal had been committed to the flames months before by the pope's orders and the outraged old italian legate with his undignified belongings crossed the channel and so passes out of our history anne had so far triumphed by the coalition of wolsey's enemies her own hatred of him was more jealous and personal than political for she and her paternal family were decidedly french in their sympathies and wolsey at all events in the latest stages had striven his utmost to help forward her marriage with the king the older nobility led by norfolk who had deserted catherine their former ally in order to use anne for their rival's ruin had deeper and longer-standing motives for their hate of the cardinal although most of them now were heavily bribed and pensioned by france their traditions were always towards the imperial and spanish alliance and against bureaucratic ministers there was yet another element that had joined anne's party in order to overthrow wolsey it consisted of those who from patriotic sentiment resented the galling supremacy of a foreign prince over the english church and cast their eyes towards germany where the process of emancipation from the papacy was in full swing the party in england was not a large one and hardly concerned itself yet with fine points of doctrine it was more an expression of the new-born english pride and independence than the religious revolt it was to become later and the fit mouthpiece of the feeling was bluff charles brandon duke of suffolk who had publicly insulted the legates in the hall at blackfriars it is obvious that a party consisting of so many factions would lose its cohesion when its main object was attained with the fall of wolsey the latter had bent before the storm and at once surrendered all his plunder to the king and to anne's relatives which secured his personal immunity for a time whilst he watched for divisions amongst his opponents that might give him his chance again anne's uncle norfolk aristocratic and conservative took the lead in the new government to the annoyance of the duke of suffolk who occupied a secondary place for which his lack of political ability alone qualified him sir thomas more became chancellor and between him and anne there was no great love lost 
whilst anne's father now earl of wiltshire became lord privy seal and her brother lord rochford was sent as an english ambassador to france with such a government as this of which anne was the real head no very distinct line of policy could be expected the parliament which was summoned on wolsey's fall was kept busy legalizing the enrichment of anne at the expense of the cardinal and in clamorous complaints of the abuses committed by the clergy but when foreign affairs had to be dealt with the voice of the government was a divided one anne and her paternal family were still in favor of france but the emperor and the pope were close friends now and it was felt necessary by the king and norfolk to attempt to reconcile them to the divorce if possible by a new political arrangement for this purpose anne's father travelled to bologna where charles and clement were staying together and urged the case of his master the only result was a contemptuous refusal from the emperor to consider any proposal for facilitating his aunt's repudiation and the serving of wiltshire as henry's representative with a formal citation of the king of england to appear in person or by proxy before the papal court in rome entrusted with the decision of the divorce case this latter result drove henry and anne into a fury and strengthened their discontent against the churchmen whilst it considerably decreased the king's confidence in wiltshire's ability it was too late now to recall wolsey although the french government did what was possible to soften the king's rigor against him but henry longed to be able to command the consummate ability and experience of his greatest minister and early in the year fifteen thirty henry himself became a party to an intrigue for the cardinal's partial rehabilitation anne when she thought wolsey was dying was persuaded to send him a token and a kind message but when later she learnt that an interview between the king and him was in contemplation she took fright and norfolk who at least was at one with her in her jealousy of the fallen minister ordered the latter to go to his diocese of york and not to approach within five miles of the king anne's position in the king's household was now a most extraordinary one she had visited the fine palace york place which wolsey had conveyed to the king at westminster and with the glee of a child enjoying a new toy had inspected and appraised the splendors it contained in future it was to be the royal residence and she was its mistress she sat at table in catherine's place and even took precedence of the duchess of norfolk and ladies of the highest rank this was all very well in its way but it did not satisfy anne to be queen in name as well as in fact was the object for which she was striving and anything less galled her the pope was now hand in glove with the emperor and could not afford to waver on henry's side whilst charles was more determined than ever to prevent the close alliance between england and france that the marriage and a bolin predominance seemed to forebode the natural effect of this was of course to drive henry more than ever into the arms of france and though wolsey had owed his unpopularity largely to his french sympathies he had never truckled so slavishly to francis as henry was now obliged to do in order to obtain his support for the divorce which he despaired of obtaining from the pope without french pressure the papal court was divided then and always into french and spanish factions and in north italy french and spanish agents perpetually tried to outwit each other throughout the continent wherever the influence of france extended pressure was exerted to obtain legal opinions favorable to henry's contention bribes as lavish as they were barefaced were offered to jurists 
for decisions confirming the view that marriage with a deceased's brother's widow was invalid in fact and incapable of dispensation the french universities were influenced until some sort of irregular dictum afterwards formally repudiated was obtained in favor of henry and in italy french and spanish intrigue were busy at work the one extorting from lawyers support to the english view the other by threats and bribes preventing its being given this however was a slow process and of doubtful efficacy after all because whilst the final decision on the divorce lay with the pope the opinions of jurists and universities even if they had been generally favorable to henry instead of the reverse could have had ultimately no authoritative effect henry began to grow restive by the end of fifteen thirty all his life he had seemed to have his own way in everything and here he found himself and his most ardent wishes unceremoniously set aside as if of no account other kings had obtained divorces easily enough from rome why not he the answer that would naturally occur to him was that his affairs were being ineptly managed by his ministers and he again yearned for wolsey the cardinal had in the meanwhile plucked up some of his old spirit at york and was still in close communication with the french and even with the emperor's ambassador again norfolk became alarmed and a disclosure of the intrigue gave an excuse for wolsey's arrest it was the last blow and the heart of the proud cardinal broke on his way south to prison leaving henry with no strong counsellor but the fair-faced woman with the tight mouth who sat in his wife's place she was brave quote, as fierce as a lioness end quote, the emperor's ambassador wrote and would quote, rather see the queen hanged than recognize her as her mistress end quote. But the party behind her was a divided one, and the greatest powers in Europe were united against her. There was only one way in which she might win, and that was by linking her cause with that of successful opposition to the papacy. The Pope was a small Italian prince now, slavishly subservient to the emperor. Luther, had defied a greater sovereign pontiff than he why should clement a degenerate scion of the mercantile medicis dare to dictate to england and her king end of section eleven section twelve of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1530 through 1534. Henry's Defiance. The Victory of Anne. Part 1. The deadlock with regard to the validity of the marriage could not continue indefinitely, for the legitimacy of the Princess Mary having been called into question, the matter now vitally touched the succession to the english crown catherine was immovable she would neither retire to a convent nor accept a decision from an english tribunal and through her proctor in rome she passionately pressed for a decision there in her favor norfolk at the end of his not very extensive mental resources could only wish that both catherine and anne were dead and the king married to someone else the pope was ready to do anything that did not offend the emperor and bring about peace and when under pressure from henry and norfolk the english prelates and peers including wolsey and warham signed a petition to the pope saying that henry's marriage should be dissolved or they must seek a remedy for themselves in the english parliament clement 
was almost inclined to give way for schism in england he dreaded before all things but charles's troops were in rome and his agents forever bullying the wretched pope and the latter was obliged to reply finally to the english peers with a rebuke there were those both in england and abroad who urged henry to marry anne at once and depend upon the recognition of the fait accompli by means of negotiation afterwards but this did not satisfy either the king or the favorite every interview between the king and the nuncio grew more bitter than the previous one no english cause swore henry should be tried outside his realm where he was master and if the pope insisted on giving judgment for the queen as he had promised the emperor to do the english parliament should deal with the matter in spite of rome the first ecclesiastical thunderclap came in october fifteen thirty when henry published a proclamation reminding the lieges of the old law of england that forbade the pope from exercising direct jurisdiction in the realm by bull or brief no one could understand at the time what was meant but when the nuncio in perturbation went and asked norfolk and suffolk the reason of so strange a proclamation at such a time they replied roughly that they quote, cared nothing for popes in england the king was emperor and pope too in his own realm End quote. later henry told the nuncio that the pope had outraged convention by summoning him before a foreign tribunal and should now be taught that no usurpation of power would be allowed in england the parliament was called said henry to restrain the encroachment of the clergy generally and unless the pope met his wishes promptly a blow would be struck at all clerical pretensions the reply of the pope was another brief forbidding henry's second marriage and threatening parliaments and bishops in england if they dared to meddle in the matter the question was thus rapidly drifting into an international one on religious lines which involved either the submission of henry or schism from the church the position of the english clergy was an especially difficult one they naturally resented any curtailment of the privileges of their order though they dared not speak too loudly for they owed the enjoyment of their temporalities to the king but they were all sons of the church looking to rome for spiritual authority and were in mortal dread of the advance of the new spirit of religious freedom aroused in germany the method of bridling them adopted by henry was as clever as it was unscrupulous the bull giving to wolsey independent power to judge the matrimonial cause in england as legate had been as will be recollected demanded by the king and recognized by him as it had been of course by the clergy but in january fifteen thirty one when parliament and convocation met the english clergy found themselves laid under premunire by the king for having recognized the legatine bull and were told that as subjects of the crown and not of the pope they had thus rendered themselves liable to the punishment for treason the unfortunate clergy were panic-stricken at this new move and looked in vain to rome for support against their own king but rome as usual was trying to run with the hare and hunt with the hounds and could only wail at the obstinacy both of henry and catherine in the previous sitting of parliament in fifteen twenty nine severe laws had been passed against the laxity and extortion of the english ecclesiastics notwithstanding the violent indignation of fisher of rochester but what was now demanded of them as a condition of their pardon for recognizing the bull was practically to repudiate the authority of the pope over them and to recognize the king of england 
as supreme head of the church in addition to paying the tremendous fine of a hundred thousand pounds they were in utter consternation and they struggled hard but the alternative to submission was ruin and the majority gave way the die was cast henry was pope and king in one and could settle his own cause in his own way when the english clergy had thus been brought to heel henry's opponents saw that they had driven him too far and were aghast at his unexpected exhibition of strength a strength be it noted not his own as will be explained later and somewhat moderated their tone but the king of england snapped his fingers now at threats of excommunication and cared nothing he said for any decision from rome the emperor dared not to go to war with england about catherine for the french were busily drawing towards the pope whose niece catherine de medici was to be betrothed to the son of francis and the imperial agents in rome ceased to insist so pertinaciously upon a decision of the matrimonial suit catherine alone clamoured unceasingly that her quote, hell upon earth end quote, should be ended by a decision in her favour from the sovereign pontiff her friends in england were many for the old party of nobles were rallying again to her side even norfolk was secretly in her favour or at least against the king's marriage with his niece anne and henry's new bold step against the papacy taken under bureaucratic influence had aroused much fear and jealousy amongst prelates like fisher and jurists like moore as well as amongst the aristocratic party in the country desperate efforts were made to prevent the need for further action in defiance of the papacy by the decision of the matrimonial suit by the english parliament and early in june fifteen thirty one henry and his council decided to put fresh pressure upon catherine to get her to consent to a suspension of the proceedings in rome and to the relegation of the case to a tribunal in some neutral territory catherine at greenwich had secret knowledge of the intention and she can hardly have been so surprised as she pretended to be when as she was about to retire to rest at nine o'clock at night to learn that the dukes of suffolk and norfolk and some thirty other nobles and prelates sought audience of her norfolk spoke first and in the king's name he complained bitterly of the slight put upon him by the pope's citation he urged the queen for the sake of england for the memory of the political services of henry to her kin and his past kindness to her to meet his wishes and consent to a neutral tribunal judging between them catherine was as usual cool and contemptuous no one was more sorry than she for the king's annoyance though she had not been the cause of it but there was only one judge in the world competent to deal with the case Quote, his holiness who keeps the place and has the power of god upon earth and is the image of eternal truth End quote. as for recognizing her husband as supreme head of the church that she would never do when dr lee spoke harshly telling her that she knew that her first marriage having been consummated her second was never legal she vehemently denied the fact and told him angrily to go to rome and argue he would find there others than a lone woman to answer him dr sampson then took up the parable and reproached her for her determination to have the case settled so quickly and she replied to him that if he had passed such bitter days as she had he would be in a hurry too dr stokesley was dealt with similarly by the queen and she then proudly protested at thus being baited late at night by a crowd of men she quote, a poor woman without friends or counsel end quote. 
norfolk reminded her that the king had appointed the archbishop of canterbury the bishop of durham and the bishop of rochester to advise her Quote, pretty counsellors they are she replied if i asked for canterbury's advice he tells me he will have nothing to do with it and forever repeats era principis morses the bishop of durham dares to say nothing because he is the king's subject and rochester only tells me to keep a good heart and hope for the best catherine knew it not but many of those before her were really her friends gardiner now first secretary looked with fear upon the lutheran innovations guilford the controller lord talbot and even norfolk wished her well and feared the advent of anne and guilford less prudent than the rest spoke so frankly that the favorite heard of his words she broke out in furious invective against him before his face when i am queen of england she cried you will soon lose your office you need not wait so long he replied and he went straight away to deliver his seals to the king henry told him he ought not to mind an angry woman's talk and was loath to accept his resignation but the controller insisted and another rankling enemy was raised up to anne the favor she enjoyed had fairly turned her head and her insolence even to those who in any case had a right to her respect and made her thoroughly detested the duke of suffolk enemy of the papacy as he was and the king's brother-in-law was as anxious now as talbot guilford and fitzwilliam to avert the marriage with anne who was setting all the court by the ears catherine's attitude made matters worse she still lived under the same roof as the king though he rarely saw her except on public occasions and her haughty replies to all his emissaries and her constant threats of what the emperor might do irritated henry beyond endurance under the taunts of anne the latter was bitterly jealous also of the young princess mary of whom henry was fond and by many spiteful petty acts of persecution the girl's life was made unhappy once when henry praised his daughter in anne's presence the latter broke out into violent abuse of her and on another occasion when catherine begged to be allowed to visit the princess henry told her roughly that she should go away as soon as she liked and stop away but catherine stood her ground she would not leave her husband she said even for her daughter until she was forced to do so henry's patience was nearly tired out between anne's constant importunities and catherine's dignified immobility and leaving his wife and daughter at windsor he went off on a hunting progress with anne in the hope that he might soon be relieved of the presence of catherine altogether public feeling was indignantly in favor of the queen and it was no uncommon thing for people to waylay the king whilst he was hunting with entreaties that he would live with his wife again and wherever anne went the women loudly cried shame upon her in his distraction henry was at a loss what to do he always wanted to appear in the right and he dared not imprison or openly ill-treat catherine for his own people favored her and all europe would have joined in condemning him yet it was clear that even windsor castle was not in future big enough for both queen and favorite at the same time and positive orders at length were sent to catherine in the autumn of fifteen thirty one to take up her residence at moore in hertfordshire in a house formerly belonging to wolsey she obeyed with a heavy heart for it meant parting and forever with her daughter who was sent to live at richmond and was strictly forbidden to communicate with her mother catherine said she would have preferred to have been sent to the tower 
to being consigned to a place so unfit for her as more with its foul ways and ruinous surroundings but nothing broke her spirit or humbled her pride her household was still regal in its extent for we are told by an italian visitor to her that quote, thirty maids of honor stood around her table when she dined and there were fifty who performed its service her household consisting of about two hundred persons in all end quote. but her state was a mockery now for lady anne she knew was with her husband loudly boasting that within three or four months she would be a queen and already playing the part insolently the privy purse expenses of the period show how openly anne was acknowledged as being henry's actual consort not only did she accompany the king everywhere on his excursions and progresses and partake of the receptions offered to him by local authorities and nobles but large sums of money were paid out of the king's treasury for the gorgeous garb in which she loved to appear purple velvet at half a guinea a yard costly furs and linen bows and arrows liveries for her servants and all sorts of fine gear were bought for anne the lord mayor of london in june fifteen thirty sent her a present of cherries and the bearer got a reward of six s eight d soon after anne's greyhounds killed a cow and the privy purse had to pay the damage ten s in november nineteen and three-quarter yards of crimson satin at fifteen s a yard had to be paid for to make lady anne a robe and eight pounds eight s for budge skins was paid soon afterwards when christmas came and card playing was in season my lady anne must have playing money twenty pounds all in groats and when she lost as she did pretty heavily her losings had to be paid by the treasurer though her winnings she kept for herself no less than a hundred pounds was given to her as a new year's gift in fifteen thirty one a few weeks afterwards a farm at greenwich was bought for her for sixty six pounds and her writing desk had to be adorned with latin and gold at great cost as the year fifteen thirty one advanced and catherine's cause became more desperate the extravagance of her rival grew and when in the autumn of that year the queen was finally banished from court anne's bills for dressmakers finery amounted to extravagant proportions the position was rendered the more bitter for catherine when she recognized that the pope in a fright now at henry's defiance was trying to meet him halfway and was listening to the suggestion of referring the question to a tribunal at cambrai or elsewhere whilst the emperor himself was only anxious to get the cause settled somehow without an open affront to his house or necessary cause for quarrel with henry and yet withal the divorce did not seem to make headway in england itself as we have seen the common people were strongly against it the clergy trembling as well they might for their privileges between the pope and the king were naturally as a body in favor of the ecclesiastical view and many of henry and anne's clerical instruments such as dr bennett in rome and dr sampson at vienna were secretly working against the cause they were supposed to be aiding even some of the new prelates such as gardiner of winchester and stokesley of london grew less active advocates when they understood that upon them and their order would fall ultimately the responsibility of declaring invalid a marriage which the church and the pope had sanctioned much stronger still even was the dislike to the king's marriage on the part of the older nobility whose enmity to wolsey had first made the marriage appear practicable they had sided with anne to overthrow wolsey but the obstinate determination of the king to rid himself of his wife and marry his favorite had brought forward new clerical and bureaucratic ministers 
whose proceedings and advice alarmed the aristocracy much more than anything wolsey had done if catherine had been tactful or even an able politician she had the materials at hand to form a combination in favor of herself and her daughter before which henry coward as he was would have quailed but she lacked the qualities necessary for a leader she irritated the king without frightening him and instead of conciliating the nobles who really sympathized with her though they were forced to do the king's bidding she snubbed them haughtily and drove them from her anne flattered and pleased the king but it was hardly her mind that moved him to defy the powerful papacy or sustained him in his fight with his own clergy from the first we have seen him leaning upon some adviser who would relieve him from responsibility whilst giving him all the honor for success he desired the divorce above all things but as usual he wanted to shelter himself behind other authority than his own when in fifteen twenty nine he had been seeking learned opinions to influence the pope chance had thrown the two ecclesiastics who were his instruments fox and gardiner into contact with a learned theologian and reader in divinity at cambridge university thomas cranmer had studied and lived much he was a widower and fellow of magdalene cambridge of forty years of age and although in orders and a doctor of divinity his tastes were rather those of a learned country gentleman than of an ecclesiastic in monkish times in conversation with fox and gardiner this high authority on theology expressed the opinion that instead of enduring the delays of the ecclesiastical courts the question of the legality of the king's marriage should be decided by divines from the words of the scriptures themselves the idea seemed a good one and henry jumped at it in an interview soon afterwards he ordered cranmer to put his arguments into a book and placed him in the household of anne's father the earl of wiltshire to facilitate the writing of it the religious movement in germany had found many echoes in england and doubtless cranmer conscientiously objected to papal control certain it is that fortified as he was by the encouragement of anne and her father his book was a persuasive one and greatly pleased the king who sent it to the pope and others nor did cranmer's activity stay there he entered into disputation everywhere with the object of gaining the theological recruits for the king's side and wrote a powerful refutation of reginald pole's book in favor of catherine the king thought so highly of cranmer's controversial ability that he sent him with lee stokesley and other theologians to rome paris and elsewhere on the continent to forward the divorce and from rome he was commissioned as english ambassador with the emperor whilst cranmer was thus fighting the king's battle abroad another instrument came to henry's hand for use in england on the disgrace of wolsey his secretary thomas cromwell was recommended to henry by friends the king disliked him and at first refused to see him but consented to do so when it was hinted that cromwell was the sort of man who would serve him well in what he had at heart the hint was a well-founded one for thomas cromwell was as ambitious and unscrupulous as his master had been strong bold and fortunately unhampered by ecclesiastical orders when henry received him in the gardens at whitehall cromwell spoke as no priest and few laymen would have dared to do for apart from the divorce question there was to be no dallying with heresy if henry could help it and the fires of smithfield burning doubters were already beginning to blaze under the influence of sir thomas more sire said cromwell to the king the pope refuses you a divorce 
why wait for his consent every englishman is master in his own house and why should you not be so in england ought a foreign prelate to share your power with you it is true the bishops make oath to your majesty but they make another to the pope immediately afterwards which absolves them from it sire you are but half a king and we are but half your subjects your kingdom is a two-headed monster will you bear such an anomaly any longer frederick and other german princes have cast off the yoke of rome do likewise become once more king govern your kingdom in concert with your lords and commons with much more of such talk cromwell flattered the king who probably hardly knew whether to punish or reward such unheard-of boldness but when cromwell prepared for the emergency took from his pocket a copy of the prelate's oath to the pope henry's indignation bore all before it and cromwell's fortune was made he at once obtained a seat in parliament fifteen twenty nine and took the lead in the anti-clerical measures which culminated in the emancipation of the english clergy from the papacy and their submission to the king gardiner ambitious and able as he was was yet an ecclesiastic and looked grimly upon such a religious policy as that into which henry was being towed by his infatuation for anne but cromwell was always ready with authorities and flattery to stiffen the king's resolve and thenceforward until his fall before a combination of nobles his was the strong spirit to which henry clung it will be seen that the influences against the king's marriage with anne were very powerful since it had become evident that the object could only be attained by the separation of england from the papal communion a step too bold and too much smacking of lutheranism to commend itself to any but the few who might benefit by the change the greatest danger seemed that by her isolation england might enable the two great catholic powers to combine against her in which case henry's ruin was certain and eager as he was to divorce catherine in england and marry anne the king dared not do so until he had secured at least the neutrality of france as usual he had to pay heavily for it dr fox henry's most able and zealous foreign minister was again sent to france and an alliance was negotiated in the spring of fifteen thirty two by which henry bound himself to join francis against the emperor in case of attack and francis undertook to support henry if any attempt was made by charles to avenge his aunt anne was once more jubilant and hopeful for her cause was now linked with a national alliance which had a certain party of adherents in the english court and an imperial attack upon england in the interests of catherine was rendered unlikely but withal the opposition in england itself had to be overcome for henry was ever a stickler for correctness in form and wanted the divorce to have an appearance of defensible legality the bishops in parliament were sounded but it was soon evident that they as a body would not fly in the face of the papacy in the catholic interests even to please the king timid tired old warham the archbishop of canterbury was approached with a suggestion that he as primate might convene a quorum of prelates favorable to henry who would approve of the entire repudiation of the papal authority in england and themselves pronounce the king's divorce but warham was already hastening to the grave and flatly refused to stain his last hours by spiritual revolt despairing of the english churchman henry then turned to the lay peers and commons and through norfolk asked them to decide that the matrimonial cause was one that should be dealt with by a lay tribunal 
but norfolk's advocacy was but half-hearted and the peers refused to make the declaration demanded the fact is clear that england was not yet prepared to defy spiritual authority to satisfy the king's caprice and anne was nearly beside herself with rage she indeed was for braving everybody and getting married at once divorce or no divorce why lose so much time the french ambassador asked if the king wanted to marry again let him do as king louis did and marry of his own motion the advice pleased both henry and his lady love but norfolk and anne's father were strongly opposed to so dangerous and irregular a step and incurred the furious displeasure of anne for daring to thwart her every one she said even her own kinsmen were against her and she was not far wrong for with the exception of cranmer in germany and cromwell no one cared to risk the popular anger by promoting the match above all warham stood firm the continued attacks of the king at cromwell's suggestion against the privileges of the clergy hardened the old archbishop's heart and it was evident that he as primate would never now annul the king's marriage and defy the authority of rome the opposition of lord chancellor moore and of the new bishop of winchester gardiner to cromwell's anti-clerical proposals in parliament angered the king and convinced him that with his present instruments it would be as difficult for him to obtain a divorce in legal form in england as in rome itself moore was made to feel that his position was an impossible one and retired when parliament was proroged in may and gardiner had a convenient attack of gout which kept him away from court until the king found he could not conduct foreign affairs without him and brought him back in the meanwhile catherine neglected the opportunities offered to her of combining all these powerful elements in her favor nobles clergy and people were almost universally on her side anne was cordially hated and had no friends but the few religious reformers who hoped by her means to force the king ever further away from the papacy and yet the queen continued to appeal to rome and the emperor against whom english patriotic feeling might be raised by anne's few friends the unwisdom of thus linking catherine's cause with threats of foreign aggression whilst england itself was favorable to her was seen when the nuncio presented to henry a half-hearted exhortation to take his lawful wife back henry fulminated against the foreigner who dared to interfere between him and his wife and very far from alarming him the pope's timid action only proved the impotence of rome to harm him but the results fell upon the misguided catherine who had instigated the step she was sent from the moor to Amtho, a house belonging to one of her few episcopal enemies end of section 12section 13 of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 1530 through 1534 henry's defiance the victory of anne part two all through the summer of 1532 the coming and going of french agents to england puzzled the queen and her foreign friends but suddenly late in july the truth came out henry and anne had gone with a great train on a hunting tour through the midlands in july but only a few days after starting they suddenly returned to london the quidnucks whispered that the people on the way 
had clamoured so loudly that the queen might be recalled to court and had so grossly insulted anne that the royal party had been driven back in disgust and though there was no doubt some ground for the assertion the real reason for the return was that the interview between henry and the french king so long secretly in negotiation had at last been settled to enlist francis personally on the side of the divorce and against the clerical influence was good policy for the emperor could not afford to quarrel both with france and england for his aunt and especially as the meeting arranged between francis and the pope at nice for the betrothal of the duke of orleans with catherine de medici was already in contemplation and threatened the emperor with a combination of france england and perhaps the papacy which would be powerful enough to defy him the policy was cromwell's who had inherited from his master wolsey a leaning for the french alliance but norfolk and the rest of henry's advisers were heavily bribed by france and were on this occasion not inimical the people at large as usual looked askance at the french connection they dreaded above all things a war with spain and flanders and recollected with apprehension the fruitless and foolish waste in splendor on the last occasion of the monarchs of france and england meeting an attempt was made to provide that the preparations should be less costly and elaborate than those for the field of the cloth of gold but henry could not forgo the splendor that he loved and a suite of three thousand or four thousand people were warned to accompany the king across the channel to boulogne and calais for the interview to have its full value in the eyes of henry and his mistress the latter must be present at the festival and be recognized by the french royal family as being of their own caste francis was not scrupulous but this was difficult to arrange his own second wife was the emperor's sister and she of course would not consent to meet the concubine nor would any other of the french princesses if they could avoid it but although the french at first gave out that no ladies would be present anne began to get her fine clothes ready and enlist her train of ladies as soon as the interview between the kings was arranged so confident was she now of success that she foretold to one of her friends that she would be married whilst in france to add to her elation in the midst of the preparations archbishop warham died and the chief ecclesiastical obstacle to the divorce in england disappeared some obedient churchman as primate would soon manage to enlist a sufficient number of his fellows to give to his court an appearance of authority and the church of england would ratify the king's release the effects of warham's death twenty third august fifteen thirty two were seen immediately there is every probability that up to that time anne had successfully held her royal lover at arm's length but with cranmer or another such as he at lambeth her triumph was only a matter of the few weeks necessary to carry out the formalities and by the end of the month of august fifteen thirty two she probably became the king's mistress this alone would explain the extraordinary proceedings when on the first september she was created marchioness of pembroke in her own right it was sunday morning before mass at windsor where the new french alliance was to be ratified that the king and his nobles and the french ambassador met in the great presence chamber and anne knelt to receive the coronet and robe of her rank the first peeress 
ever created in her own right in england precedence being given to her before the other two english marchionesses both ladies of the blood royal everything that could add prestige to the ceremony was done anne herself was dressed in regal crimson velvet and ermine splendid presents were made to her by the enamoured king fit more for a sovereign's consort than his mistress a thousand pounds a year and lands were settled upon her and her rank and property were to descend to the issue male of her body but the cloven hoof is shown by the omission from the patent of the usual legitimacy clause even if after all the cup of queendom was dashed from her lips untasted she had made not a bad bargain for herself her short triumph indeed was rapidly coming she had fought strenuously for it for many years and now most of the legal bars against her had fallen but withal there was bitterness still in her chalice the people scowled upon her no less now that she was a marchioness than before and the great ladies who were ordered to attend the king's cousin into france did their service but sourly whilst francis had to be conciliated with all sorts of important concessions before he could be got to welcome the lady into his realm when at last he consented quote, because she would have gone in any case for the king cannot be an hour without her End quote. francis did it gallantly and with good grace for after all anne was just then the strongest prop in england of the french alliance catherine from afar off watched these proceedings with scornful resentment henry had no chivalry no generosity and saved his repudiated wife no humiliation that he could deal her in reward for her obstinacy he had piled rich gifts upon anne but her greed for costly gewgaws was insatiable and when the preparations for her visit to france were afoot she coveted the queen's jewels henry's sister the duchess of suffolk queen dowager of france had been made to surrender her valuables to the king's favorite but when henry sent the message to his wife bidding her give up her jewels the proud princess blazed out in indignant anger at the insult tell the king she said that i cannot send them to him for when lately according to the custom of this realm i presented him with a new year's gift he warned me to send him no such presents for the future besides it is offensive and insulting to me and would weigh upon my conscience if i were led to give up my jewels for such a base purpose as that of decking out a person who is a reproach to christendom and is bringing scandal and disgrace upon the king through his taking her to such a meeting as this in france but still if the king commands me and sends specially for them himself i will give him my jewels such an answer as this proves clearly the lack of practical wisdom in the poor woman she might have resisted or she might have surrendered with a good grace but to irritate and annoy the weak bully without gaining her point was worse than useless anne's talk about marrying the king in france angered catherine beyond measure but the favorite's ambition grew as her prospect brightened and when it was settled that cranmer was to be recalled from germany and made primate anne said that she had changed her mind Quote, even if the king wished to marry her there in france she would not consent to it she will have it take place here in england where other queens have usually been married and crowned End quote. through kent 
avoiding as they might the plague-stricken towns the king and his lady love with a great royal train rode to dover early in october fifteen thirty two at calais henry's own town anne was received almost with regal honors but when henry went forth to greet francis upon french soil near boulogne and to be sumptuously entertained it was seen that though the french armed men were threateningly numerous there were no ladies to keep in countenance the english concubine and the proud dames who did her service blazing in gems the two kings met with much courtly ceremony and hollow professions of affection banqueting speech-making and posturing in splendid raiment occupied five days at boulogne the while the lady marcus ate her heart out at calais in petulant disappointment though she made as brave a show as she could to the frenchmen when they came to return henry's visit the chronicler excels himself in the description of the lavish magnificence of the welcome of francis at calais and tells us that after a bounteous supper on the night of sunday twenty seventh october at which the two kings and their retinues sat down quote, the marchioness of pembroke with seven other ladies in masking apparel of strange fashion made of cloth of gold compassed with crimson tinsel satin covered with cloth of silver lying loose and knit with gold laces end quote, tripped in and each masked lady chose a partner and of course taking the french king in the course of the dance henry plucked the masks from the ladies faces and debonair francis in courtly fashion conversed with his fair partner one of the worst storms in the memory of man delayed the english king's return from calais till the thirteenth november but when at length the te deum for his safe homecoming was sung at st paul's anne knew that the king of france had undertaken to frighten the pope into inactivity by talk of the danger of schism in england and that cranmer was hurrying across europe on his way from italy to london to become primate of the church of england the plot projected was a clever one but it was still needful to handle it very delicately cranmer during his residence in germany and italy had been zealous in winning favorable opinions for henry's contention and his foregathering with lutheran divines had strengthened his reforming opinions he had indeed proceeded to the dangerous length of going through a form of marriage secretly with a young lady belonging to a lutheran family his leanings cannot have been quite unknown to the ever watchful spies of the pope and the emperor though cranmer had done his best to hoodwink them and to some extent had succeeded but to ask the pope to issue the bulls confirming such a man in the primacy of england was at least a risky proceeding and henry had to dissemble in january catherine fondly thought that her husband was softening towards her for he released her chaplain abel who had been imprisoned for publicly speaking in her favor she fancied poor soul that quote, perhaps god had touched his heart and that he was about to acknowledge his error End quote. chapus attributed henry's new gentleness to his begrudging the cost of two queenly establishments but seen from this distance of time it was clearly caused by a desire to disarm the suspicion of the pope and the emperor who were again to meet at bologna until the bulls confirming cranmer's appointment to the archbishopric had been issued henry went out of his way to be amiable to the imperial ambassador chapus whilst he beguiled the nuncio with the pretended proposal for reconciliation by means of a decision on the divorce to be given by two cardinal legates 
appointed by the pope and sitting in neutral territory in vain chapus warned the emperor that cranmer could not be trusted but henry's diplomatic signs of grace prevailed and the pope dreading to drive england further into schism confirmed cranmer's election as archbishop of canterbury march fifteen thirty three it was high time for under a suave exterior both henry and anne were in a fever of impatience at the very time that queen catherine thought that her husband had repented anne conveyed to him the news that she was with child it was necessary for their plans that the offspring should be born in wedlock and yet no public marriage was possible or the eyes of the papal party would be opened before the bulls confirming cranmer's elevation were issued some time late in january fifteen thirty three therefore a secret marriage was performed at greenwich probably by the reforming franciscan friar george brown and anne became henry's second wife whilst catherine was still undivorced the secret was well kept for a time and the nuncio baron de burgo was fooled to the top of his bent by flatteries and hopes of bribes he even sat in state on henry's right hand the french ambassador being on the left at the opening of parliament probably with the idea of convincing the trembling english clergy that the king and the pope were working together in any case the close association of the nuncio with henry and his ministers aroused the fears of catherine anew and she broke out in denunciations of the pope's supineness in thus leaving her without aid for three and a half years and now entertaining as she said a suggestion that would cause her to be declared the king's concubine and her daughter a bastard in vain chapus the only man of his party who saw through the device prayed that cranmer's bulls should not be sent from rome that the sentence in catherine's favor should no longer be delayed it was already too late the pride of anne and her father at the secret marriage could not much longer be kept under in the middle of february whilst dining in her own apartment she said that quote, she was now as sure that she should be married to the king as she was of her own death End quote. and the earl of wiltshire told the aged kinsman of henry the earl of rutland a staunch adherent of catherine that quote, the king was determined not to be so considerate as he had been but would marry the marchioness of pembroke at once by the authority of parliament End quote. anne's condition indeed could not continue to be concealed and whispers of it reached the queen at amphil by march the rumor was rife at court that the marriage had taken place a rumor which it is plain that anne's friends took no pains to deny and cranmer positively encouraged cromwell in the meanwhile grew in power and boldness with the success of his machinations the chancellorship vacant by moore's resignation was filled by cromwell's friend audley and every post that fell vacant or could be vacated was occupied by known opponents of the clergy the country and parliament were even yet not ready to go so far as cromwell in his policy of emancipation from rome in spiritual affairs and only by the most illegal pressure both in the two houses and in convocation was the declaration condemning the validity of the king's marriage with catherine at last obtained armed with these declarations and the bulls from rome confirming cranmer's appointment henry was ready in april to cast away the mask and the dukes of norfolk and suffolk 
were sent to tell Catherine at Amphil, quote, that she need not trouble any more about the king, for he had taken another wife, and that in future she must abandon the title of queen and be called duchess, though she should be left in possession of her property. End quote. Chapus was indignant and urged the emperor to make war upon england in revenge for the insult to his house quote, the moment this accursed anne gets her foot firmly in the stirrup she will do the queen all the harm she can and the princess also which is what the queen fears most she anne has lately boasted that she will make the princess one of her maids which will not give her too much to eat or will marry her to some varlet. End quote. But the emperor had cares and dangers that his ambassador in England knew not of, and he dared not avenge his aunt by the invasion of England. A long and fruitless war of words was waged between Henry and Chapus when the news of the secret marriage became known, the talk turning upon the eternal question of the consummation of catherine's first marriage chapus reminded the king that on several occasions he henry had confessed that his wife had been intact by arthur ah replied henry i only said that in fun a man when he is frolicking and dining says a good many things that are not true now i think i have satisfied you what else do you want to know a day or two after this on easter eve anne went to mass in truly royal state loaded with diamonds and other precious stones and dressed in a gorgeous suit of tissue the train being borne by her cousin the daughter of the duke of norfolk betrothed to the king's illegitimate son the duke of richmond she was followed by a greater suite and treated with more ceremony than had formerly attended catherine and to the astonishment of the people was prayed for thenceforward in the church services at court as queen in london the attitude of the people grew threatening and the lord mayor was taken to task by the king who ordered that proclamation should be made forbidding any unfavorable reference to the king's second marriage but the fire of indignation glowed fiercely beneath the surface for everywhere the cause of catherine was bound up as it seemed with the old faith in which all had been born with the security of commerce with england's best customers and with the rights of anointed royalty as against low-born insolence no humiliation was spared to catherine her daughter was forbidden to hold any communication with her her household was reduced to the meagre proportions of a private establishment her scutcheon was taken down from westminster hall and her cognizance from her barge and as a crowning indignity she was summoned to appear before the primate's court at dunstable a summons which at the prompting of chapus she entirely disregarded up to this time she had stood firm in her determination to maintain an attitude of loyalty to the king and to her adopted country but as she grew more bitter at her rival's triumph and the flowing tide of religious change rose at her feet she listened to plans for bringing a remedy for her ills by a subversion of henry's regime but she was a poor conspirator and considerations of safety for her daughter and her want of tact in uniting the english elements in her favor always paralyzed her in the meanwhile the preparations for the public recognition and coronation of anne went on the new queen tried her best to captivate the londoners but without success and only with difficulty could the contributions be obtained for the coming festivities when the new queen passed through the city on the tenth may catherine was declared contumacious 
by the primate's court and on the twenty third may cranmer pronounced the king's first marriage to have been void from the first this was followed by a pronouncement to the effect that the second marriage that with anne was legal and nothing now stood in the way of the final fruition of so much labor and intrigue pregnant with such tremendous results to england on the twenty ninth may fifteen thirty three the first scene of the pageant was enacted with the state progress by water from greenwich to the tower no effort had been spared by henry to make the occasion a brilliant one we are told that the whole river from the point of departure to that of arrival was covered with beautifully bedizened boats guns roared forth their salutations at greenwich and from the crowd of ships that lay in the stream flags and few de choix could be bought courtiers guilds and nobles' barges could be commanded but the hearty cheers of the lieges could not be got for all of king harry's power as the new queen in the old queen's barge was born to the frowning fortress which so soon was to be her own place of martyrdom on sunday thirty first may fifteen thirty three the procession through the crowded city sallied from the tower betimes in the morning englishmen and foreigners except spaniards only had been forced to pay heavily for the splendor of the day and the trade guilds and aldermen brave in furred gowns and gold chains stood from one device to another in the streets as the glittering show went by the french element did its best to add gaiety to the occasion and the merchants of france established in london rode at the head of the procession in purple velvet embroidered with anne's device then came the nobles and courtiers and all the squires and gentlemen whom the king had brought from their granges and manor houses to do honor to their new queen anne herself was seated in an open litter of white satin covered by a golden canopy she was dressed in a surcoat and mantle of white tissue trimmed with ermine and wore a robe of crimson brocade stiff with gems her hair which was very fine hung over her shoulders surmounted by a coif and a coronet of diamonds whilst around her neck was hung a necklace of great pearls and upon her breast reposed a splendid jewel of precious stones Quote, and as she passed through the city she kept turning her face from one side to the other to greet the people but strange to see as it was that there were hardly ten persons who greeted her with god save your grace as they used to do when the sainted queen catherine went by End quote. lowering brows and whispered curses of nan bullen from the citizens wives followed the new queen on her way for to them she stood for war against the emperor in the behoof of france for harassed trade and lean larders and above all for defiance of the religious principles that most of them held sacred and they hated the long fair face with which or with love filters she had bewitched the king the very pageants ostensibly raised in her honor contrived in several cases to embody a subtle insult at the grace church corner of fenchurch street where the haunts merchants had erected a marvelous conning pageant representing mount parnassus with the fountain of helicon spouting racked rhenish wine all day the queen's litter was stayed a space to listen to the muses playing sweet instruments and to read the epigrams in her praise that were hung around the mount but anne looked aloft to where apollo sat and saw that the imperial eagle was blazoned in the place of honor whilst the much derided bogus arms of the bolins lurked in humble guise below 
and for many a day thenceforward she was claiming vengeance against the easterlings for the slight put upon her as each triumphal device was passed children dressed as angels or muses were made to sing or recite conceited phrases of dithyrambic flattery to the heroine of the hour there was no grace or virtue of which she was not the true exemplar through leadenhall and cornhill and so to chepa between lines of liveried citizens and show progressed at the cross on cheapside the mayor and corporation awaited the queen and the recorder master baker with many courtly compliments handed her the city's gift of a thousand marks in a purse of gold quote, which she thankfully received end quote. that she did so was noted with sneering contempt by catherine's friends quote, as soon as she received the purse of money she placed it by her side in the litter and thus she showed that she was a person of low descent for there stood by her at the time the captain of the king's guard with his men and twelve lackeys and when the sainted queen had passed by for her coronation she handed the money to the captain of the guard to be divided amongst the halberdiers and lackeys and did not do so but kept them for herself st paul's and ludgate fleet street and temple bar all offered their official adulation whilst the staring people stood by dumb westminster hall into which anne's litter was borne for the feast was richly hung with arras and newly glazed a regal throne with a canopy was set on high for anne and a great sideboard of gold plate testified to the king's generosity to his new wife but after she had changed her garments and was welcomed with open arms by henry at his new palace of westminster her disappointment broke out how do you like the look of the city sweetheart asked the king sir she replied the city itself was well enow but i saw many caps on heads and heard but few tongues the next day sunday anne was crowned by cranmer with full ceremony in westminster abbey and for days thereafter banqueting tilting and the usual roistering went on and the great-granddaughter of alderman bolin felt that at last she was queen indeed henry too had had his way and again could hope that a son born in wedlock might perpetuate the name of tudor on the throne of england but he was in deadly fear for the prospect was black all around him public indignation in england grew apace at the religious changes and at the prospect of war but what most aroused henry's alarm was the sudden coldness of france and the probability of a great catholic coalition against him norfolk and lord rochford with a stately train had gone to join in the interview between francis and the pope and the hope that the joint presence of france and england might force clement to recognize accomplished facts in order to avoid the secession of england from the church although it suited francis to promote the antagonism between henry and the emperor by keeping the divorce proceedings dragging on in rome it did not suit him for england to defy the papacy by means of cranmer's sentence and so to change the balance of power in europe by driving henry into permanent union with german protestants whilst francis was forced to side with the emperor on religious grounds so long as henry remained undivorced and unmarried anything might happen he might sate of his mistress and tire of the struggle against rome or be driven by fear of war or take a conciliatory course and in any of these cases he must needs pay for france's aid but now that his divorce and remarriage were as valid as a duly authorized archbishop could make them 
the utility of anne as an aid to french foreign policy disappeared the actual marriage therefore deprived her of the sympathies of the french party in the english court which had hitherto sided with her and the effects were immediately seen in the attitude of francis end of section thirteen